Okay, at this time, sergeants, can we start our recordings? PC's rolling. Cloud recording, good. Backup is rolling. Okay, Sergeant Martinez. Good morning, and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing of the Committee on Women and Gender Equity, jointly with the Committee on Health and the Committee on Hospitals. At this time, would all panelists please turn on their video. To minimize disruption, please silence your electronic devices. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so via email at the following address, testimony at council.nyc.gov. Testimony at council, C-O-U-N-C-I-L, Dot NYC dot gov. Thank you for your cooperation. Chairs, we are ready to begin. Good morning, and thank you for joining today's committees on women and gender equity, health and hospitals virtual hearing on maternal mortality and morbidity in New York City. I am council member Helen Rosenthal, chair of the committee on women and gender equity. My pronouns are she, her, hers. And I wanna start by thanking everyone who came out here to testify today. Maternal mortality and morbidity is one of the greatest public health crises in the country. Yet as a city, we have been late to address black and brown, um, what black and brown communities and many community-based organizations have been sounding the alarm on for decades. So I want to start by saying that while there are dedicated people working in hospitals and the city's Department of Health, some of you here today are doing your best and we appreciate that. But as a whole, as a city, we are failing. And it is because of racism in all its forms, structural, environmental, direct, and implicit. Even after recent efforts to close the gap, the latest data still shows that black and brown giving birth in New York City are eight to 12 uh, times, that's at least 800% more likely to die than their white counterparts. And this is death exclusively not to mention the thousands of cases in which people almost die of, child, of childbirth-related causes. Moreover, Black infants in the city are also three times more likely to die than white newborns, a gap that is nearly 50% greater than the national average. This committee held uh, last held a hearing on maternal mortality in New York City in June 2018, when we heard two bills that have become law, both demand accountability. The first, Local Law 187 requires DOHMH to assess the needs of pregnant people and the availability of doulas to meet those needs, then produce a plan for increasing access to doulas. DOHMH must also release an annual report with known organizations that provide doula services and training and information on areas in the city that ex experience disproportionately high rates of maternal mortality, infant mortality, and other poor birth outcomes. And second, Local Law 188 of 2018, which requires DOHMH to expand the city's annual reporting on maternal mortality and morbidity with additional reporting and a five-year report. The law also codified the Maternal Mortality and Morbidity Review Committee, M3RC, and required DOHMH to post information on the disciplines represented by the members of the m RC with, a, with the indication that uh, more people with lived experiences should be on the committee like doulas, midwives, and those who've experienced near-death um, encounters. The 2019 report gave us information on the 2016 mortality rate. 
37 people died in childbirth in 2016. The 2020 report has not come in yet, and we look forward to that data. Because of delays in reporting, we won't know the number for 2020 for some time, which drives home a sobering point. We know very little about the experience people have had giving birth during COVID-19. The little we do know comes from the press, and it is terrifying. We know that several women have died in childbirth since COVID, including Amber Isaac, a 26-year-old Black woman who left us a chilling final message about her experience with healthcare while pregnant just four days before she died. We know that for a period of time, people giving birth in hospitals were without birthing partners. And so they didn't have anyone to advocate for them, to witness any mistreatment or just give support. Today, we would like to learn more about how rates of maternal mortality and morbidity have been impacted by COVID-19 and uh, as well, how the city is addressing, has addressed, and is addressing factors that threaten to further exacerbate racial in inequities among birthing people, and what steps the city plans to take to improve these outcomes. As we all know, statistics only tell part of the story. We desperately rely on your stories, the qualitative data that is your lived experiences. If you or a loved one have had inappropriate experience in the New York City medical system, we urge you to submit written testimony, which you can do on the record for this hearing until Thursday at 10 a.m. by sending it to testimony at council.nyc.gov. Finally, the committees will be hearing several pieces of legislation today that my colleagues will discuss, including intro number 2017, oh, intro number 2017 related to visitation policy guidelines for hospitals during public health emergencies like COVID-19. Intro number 2042 related to expanding access to resources by posting information about midwives online. Resolution 1239 related to making doulas more accessible to individuals with Medicaid and those without health insurance. And Resolution 1408, which I'm proud to be the prime sponsor on related to state legislation on the accreditation, approval, and operation of midwif midwifery birth centers. Thank you to my colleagues, Council Members Levine and Carlina Rivera for co-chairing this hearing and to all of the doulas, mothers, fathers, advocates of every stripe, thank you for your tireless work on this issue. Thank you for joining us and sharing your experience. As an advocate said this morning at this morning's rally, the goal is for us to get where we don't have to hear from broken hearted loved ones. Finally, I'd like to thank my team, Chief of Staff Sydney Cardinal, my Legislative Director Madhuri Shukla, as well as committee staff for their work in preparing this hearing. Brenda McKinney, Legislative Counsel, Chloe Rivera, Senior Policy Analyst, Monica Peppel, Financial Analyst, Elizabeth Arts, and John Blasco from Community Engagement. And I would now like to join to acknowledge my colleagues who have joined us, Council Members Levine, Rivera, Adams, uh, Council Member Amprey Samuels, Ayala, Barron, Cohen, Gibson, Kalos, Holden, Lewis, Powers, Mizell, Council Member Rose, and Council Member Eugene will announce more as they arrive. And now I'd like to invite Council Member Rivera, Chair of the Committee on Hospitals, to provide opening remarks. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Chair Rosenthal. Thank you, Chair Levine, uh, for co-chairing this hearing with me today. I am Councilmember Carlina Rivera, Chair of the Committee on Hospitals, and I want to start by thanking everyone present today. Maternal mortality and morbidity is a topic I care deeply about. We were just joined by almost 100 advocates, birth workers, elected officials, and individuals with very, very tragic experiences who all know that birth justice cannot wait. 
hundreds of years of race-based medicine coupled with systemic racism and other forms of oppression have led to stark, disparate health outcomes. To reiterate some of the figures already shared, maternal mortality disproportionately impacts Black women and birthing people, with Black people eight to 12 times more likely to die when giving birth than their white counterparts in New York City, and Latinas with three times the rate of maternal morbidity compared to white women. Studies have shown that regardless of educational attainment and income, Black women are still more likely to die from childbirth than white women. According to the most recently released city data, while about 25 people in New York City die each year of a pregnancy-related cause, approximately 2,800 people experience morbidity or almost die during childbirth. Morbidity disproportionately impacts Black, Latino, and other racial and ethnic minority women and birthing people. The fact that Black women and birthing people are not receiving the care and resources they need to survive childbirth is inexcusable. The field of gynecology itself is rooted in racism and was only advanced because of the abuse of enslaved Black women. A recent article from the Journal of Minimally Invasive Gynecology notes that after public outcry in response to the murders of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and others, over 18 organizations signed the collective action statement against racism in the field of obstetrics and gynecology. A portion of this statement acknowledged. Many examples of foundational advances in the specialty of obstetrics and gynecology are rooted in racism and oppression. For example, the mid 1800s surgical experimentation of James Marion Sims was performed on enslaved black women, including three women, Betsy, Lucy, and Anarka, who underwent repetitive gynecologic procedures without consent. This historical context further highlights how deeply these injustices run and how rooted healthcare is in race based medicine and racism. My committee, along with the committees at the Council, have heard from the city and other experts over the years about the numerous initiatives at the state and city levels aimed at addressing maternal mortality and morbidity. I look forward to hearing from the city and others today about these efforts, as well as our proposals for new legislation. COVID-19 has had an enormous impact on maternal health. There are renewed conversations and efforts around improving maternal care, such as ensuring access to midwife-led birth centers, something that is long overdue in New York City. Intro number 2017, legislation I am proud to sponsor, relates to visitation policy guidelines for hospitals during public health emergencies, such as COVID-19. During the COVID-19 pandemic, there were large gaps in information provided by hospitals to patients and birth workers regarding visitation policy certification barriers, and the possibility of being separated from one's baby. Even though the state has issued guidelines and guidance permitting a partner and or support person, including doulas to attend the birth of a patient, we are still hearing about barriers to visitation. This legislation aims at ensuring the city creates clear guidelines for such instances, which can help ensure access to meaningful care. We are also hearing Resolution 1239, which I am also proud to sponsor, calling on the New York State Legislature to pass and the governor to sign legislation making doulas more accessible to individuals with Medicaid and those without health insurance. We know that doulas improve maternal health outcomes. We know that they are critical in this fight for equity. The state should work alongside doulas as partners to see if we can improve access to doula care for those with Medicaid and other forms of insurance. This is a process that must be led by those on the ground. All of our actions are to prevent future and maternal deaths and near deaths. Today, we must center ourselves on the purpose of the work and we must honor and remember those we have lost. Amber Isaac, a 26 year old black woman died on April 21st, 2020, shortly after delivering her son at Montefiore Medical Center in the Bronx. Shaeja Washington, also a 26-year-old Black woman, died on July 3rd, 2020, 
during childbirth at Woodall Hospital. Hendel Lezer, a 33-year-old Orthodox Jewish woman, died on November 19, 2020 in Maimonides in Brooklyn from complications related to COVID-19 one day after delivering her fifth child. We remember them today, as well as those who have died before them and anyone who may have died and who was not covered in the news. We are mindful of all those still with us today who nearly died while giving birth. My thoughts are with the families and friends of those mentioned. I am also sincerely grateful for the advocates, doulas, midwives, and other birthing professionals who have been working to address maternal mortality and morbidity for years. I hope you feel heard and seen today. While we look for your guidance regarding birth workers, I know that we cannot task you with fixing this crisis alone. You have my commitment as a partner in this work, and I look forward to hearing from you and continuing to work together. I would like to thank the hospital committee staff, Council Harbani Ahuja, Policy Analyst Emily Balkin, Finance Analyst John Chang, and Data Analyst Rachel Alexandrov. I also want to thank my team, Alexis Richards, Isabel Chandler, Jeremy Unger, and a number of others, all who have been incredibly helpful in making sure we're hearing from as many people as possible. Thank you so much. Thank you all for being here. And I will now turn it over to Chair Levine for his opening remarks. Thank you so much, Chair Rivera. Thank you, Chair Rosenthal, for all that you have done to advance this issue, to ensure we've held this very important hearing today. And I also wanna thank the Chair of the City Council's BLAC, Adrian Adams, who has been such a champion for this important cause, and many other members of our Women's Caucus, including Council Members Lewis, Barron, Gibson, Rose, Amprey Samuel, and others. As Chair Rivera mentioned, I am City Council Member Mark Levine, and I chair the Health Committee in the City Council, pleased to be co-chairing this hearing today, in which we'll be focusing on maternal mortality and morbidity in New York City, as well as considering a package of legislation, including two bills and two resolutions relating to mental health. The morally outrageous disparity in, mental, in maternal mortality and morbidity in New York City between black women and other birthing people and white New Yorkers was well known before COVID. But we have reason to believe that this crisis has exacerbated this terrible disparity by disrupting the normal channels of care, which low income birthing people in particular rely on with decreased in-person appointments and reliance on telehealth services, decreases in prenatal care service overall and postpartum follow-up, persistent discrimination in healthcare, and a risk factor which I fear we have largely overlooked, isolation. As for example, hospitals have been forced to limit the number of people in delivery rooms, sometimes leaving mothers to deliver alone. So we need to double down now on the strategies that we know can help reverse this terrible disparity. Addressing explicit and implicit biases and discrimination in healthcare systems among providers. Collecting and utilizing more data to understand risk factors. Addressing health inequities that persist before and during pregnancy, such as access to comprehensive healthcare, including nutritious food. Educating and empowering birthing individuals to advocate for themselves within a medical setting, continuously reviewing and assessing medical practices to determine what improvements are needed and fostering collaboration among hospitals, providers, community based organizations and government entities to ensure that the best care is being properly resourced and delivered. Our hearing today will focus on the imperative of taking these steps strategies that have been documented to, to support women who are being in birthing process. I look forward to hearing from the administration and hospitals today on exactly what they are doing to achieve these goals. And I look forward to hearing from advocates on how New York City can bring justice for the women and birthing parents who are being left behind. 
As always, I thank the administration for your work and for being here today. And I wanna thank the staff of the health committee, including councils Harbani Ahuja and Sara Liss, policy analyst, Emily Balkin, finance analyst, Lauren Hunt, data team, Rachel Alexandrov, Rose Martinez, Melissa Nunez, Mesa Sarkissian, and Julie Friedenberg, and Amy Slattering, my legislative director. Thank you so much, and I'll pass it back to you. Thank you, Councilmember Levine. Before we turn it over to our uh, moderator, I now want to turn it to the co-chairs of the Council's Women's Caucus and BLAC Caucus, who will also provide remarks, starting with BLAC Caucus co-chair, Councilmember Adams, followed by uh, Councilmember Gip Gibson, and then Councilmember Lewis from the Women's Caucus. Councilmember Adams, please begin when you're ready. Thank you so much, Chair Rosenthal. And good morning, everyone. I'd like to once again thank all of the chairs, Council Members Rosenthal, Levine, and Rivera for convening this very, very critical hearing this morning. I am Council Member Adrian Adams, co-chair of the Black, Latino, and Asian Caucus of the New York City Council. Maternal mortality and morbidity has plagued us for far too long, and the problem is much more severe in Black women. Despite advances in the healthcare system, we continue to go through this crisis. Whether through personal experience or data, we all know that there are deep racial disparities in our healthcare system. We have the resources, we have the review boards, we have the data, we even have the protocols, but women and more prevalently black women continue to suffer disproportionately. If economic class, access to health care, education, and genetics could not explain this crisis, we must acknowledge several problems when it comes to maternal mortality. Ongoing systemic disparities, implicit bias, and listening, actually listening to the patient. We need solutions to address this. It is not just a women's issue. This is a human and civil rights issue. It is clear now more than ever that we need solutions to address these problems. And I look forward to hearing from everyone today to working with you on this very, very important issue. We must work holistically to ensure that no one dies a preventable death while bringing beautiful life into this world. Thank you again to our doulas, our midwives, our advocates and other dedicated parties for your unwavering commitment to ending this moral, disgraceful crisis. Thank you, Chairs, for this hearing. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Councilmember Adams. Uh, I stand with you as an ally. Uh, next, we're going to hear from Councilmember Gibson. Thank you so much, Chair Helen Rosenthal, and good morning, everyone. It's a great honor and privilege to join with all of you. I also want to recognize my fellow co-chair of the Women's Caucus, Chair Farrah Lewis, our BLAC co-chairs, uh, Chair Adrian Adams and Chair Donique Miller. I want to thank our committee chairs, the Committee on Women and Gender Equity. Thank you, Chair Rosenthal, the Committee on Hospitals, Chair Carlina Rivera, and our Committee Chair on Health, Chair Mark Levine. I also want to thank Majority Leader Lori Cumbo, all of the women in the Women's Caucus and all of my colleagues in the City Council. Uh, thank you so much. Today is a very important discussion on Black maternal mortality and morbidity and reproductive justice in our city. Um, earlier this morning, we had a virtual rally and I want to lift up our brother, Bruce McIntyre, the founder of Save a Rose Foundation, for being an advocate. Uh, he lost his queen and he has turned his pain into purpose with a plan. And we thank you so much for continuing to lift up the name of your queen and all of the work you're doing around advocacy. We lift up all of the names of our sisters, so many, African-American women and Latinas that we've lost uh, in this fight for birth justice. Uh, Councilmember Rivera 
call their names. And we wanna to continue to pray for those families who will never be the same again. There are too many, too many stories that we've heard. High rates of black maternal mortality and morbidity is really a result of years of systemic racism in our healthcare industry that continues to contribute to the mistreatment and mishandling of black women patients in this country. It is unacceptable in 2020. Too many women have died as a result of this public health crisis, and we cannot wait for yet another preventable death before we take action. Black women and Black birthing individuals deserve our support. They deserve our love, our compassion. They deserve access to quality, patient-centered, and comprehensive, holistic treatment, reproductive health care that is culturally sensitive. Policymakers, healthcare professionals, our CBOs, our doulas, our midwives, all of our communities can work together to improve Black women's maternal health by expanding access to health coverage and information on midwives and doulas. I am very proud of the package that is assembled today. And one of the bills I have is intro 2042, which will make public information on licensed midwives so expecting mothers can make informed decisions for their families as we work to dismantle medical oppression and undo the years of systemic inequality that has plagued our healthcare system. I wanna thank all of our advocates. I certainly wanna thank Bronx Health Link uh, Bronx Health Reach and so many of the partners I've had the honor of working with in the Bronx, but all of our citywide organizations. The city council has every year championed, championed a city council initiative on maternal health care because we recognize that we can't just talk about it. We have to be about it and put money where our commitment is. All of our advocates, those that have shared your stories that are very influential and powerful and meaningful. And I look forward to today's input and all of the advocates who are here. And I also wanna thank the administration for joining us today. Your partnership is critical in our overall work. Thank you so much, Chair Levine, Chair Rivera, and thank you, Chair Rosenthal for today's important hearing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now we're going to hear uh, Councilmember, sorry, Councilmember Lander has joined the hearing. And now we're going to hear from Councilmember Lewis. Uh, we're so glad you're here today with us, Councilmember Lewis. Thank you so much, Chair Rosenthal. And I want to thank my colleagues, you, Chair Ro Rosenthal, uh, Chair Rivera Levine, and my fellow co chair, uh, Vanessa Gibson, and the BLAC co chairs, Adams and Miller, for creating a space to hear untold stories from birth advocates, women, and their families affected by the maternal mortality and mortality issues here in our nation, but most importantly in our city. Today's oversight hearing is an opportunity to engage in thoughtful discussions about how the council as a legislative body can reform our healthcare system to better support expected mothers. I represent District 45 that includes East Flatbush and Flatbush in Brooklyn, a predominant black and immigrant community that is disproportionately at risk for maternal morbidity and mortality. As black women, we are experiencing poverty, economic and social pressures at alarming rates while coping with anxiety, isolation and pain before and during after childbirth are largely ignored. Economic housing and food insecurity would be stressful on many New Yorkers, but the consequences would be dire for expected mothers. The additional stress could endanger the physical and mental well being of both mother and child. Before the pandemic, we were still compiling data to give us clearer, a clearer picture of our city's healthcare systems and racial disparities amid a global health crisis and the increased use of telemedicine to limit the spread of COVID-19, I hear that the maternal health outcomes in Black communities will worsen because of the digital divide. It is already difficult for patients to communicate their symptoms to nurses and doctors in person and feel acknowledged. I've experienced it myself. Can you imagine how much harder it is to monitor high-risk patients remotely, let alone those who lack access to the devices or internet service to speak to their doctors. We are talking about actual people who reluctantly put 
their trust in, in a system where Black women are subjected to riskier procedures like cesarean section and denied medical treatment to address pregnancy complications until it is too late. We remember every day, especially today, Amber Isaac, Shaiza Washington, and countless other women deprived of the opportunity to celebrate their child's birthdays, the first day of school, and graduations. We owe their families answers and sweeping health care reforms. I look forward to hearing from the administration, affected families, birth advocates like the Caribbean Women's Health Association that is working very hard in my district to support pregnant and postpartum women as well as other families through support groups, parent workshops, and expanded services. Thank you, Chair Rosenthal, and to all the co-chairs for working on this today. I look forward to today's hearing. Thank you. Councilmember Lewis, thank you for stepping up for your community and engaging with those who are trying their best to make it better. I really appreciated your word reluctantly. Uh, you know, people, when you're a birthing person, you don't have choice. You have to give birth and yet the systems are not there to protect you. Just who you count on are not there. Thank you for your leadership, Council Member Lewis. Appreciate you. Um, now I'm gonna turn it over to our moderator, Committee Council, Brenda McKinney, who will review some procedural items relating to today's hearing and call on our first panel of witnesses. Thank you so much, Chair Rosenthal. Uh, my name is Brenda McKinney and I'm the Legislative Council of the Committee on Women and Gender Equity at the New York City Council. I will be moderating today's hearing and calling on panelists to testify. Before we begin, please remember that everyone will be on mute until I call on you to testify. After you are called on, you will be unmuted by the host. Note that there will be a few second delay before you are unmuted and we can hear you. You may also see a box pop up to click on um, to accept the unmute. Please listen for your name. I will periodically announce the next few panelists. Council member questions will be limited to five minutes. Council members, note that this includes both questions and witness responses. We will be allowing a second round of council member questions today. For public testimony, I will be calling up panelists in or in panels. I will be calling up individuals in panels. Council members, if you have questions for a particular panelist, please use the raise hand function in Zoom. You'll be called on in order after everyone on the panel has completed their testimony. For public panelists, once I call on your name, a member of our staff will unmute you and the Sergeant at Arms will set a timer and give you the go ahead to begin your testimony. All public testimony today will be limited to three minutes. After I call your name, please wait a couple of seconds for the Sergeant at Arms to announce that you may begin before starting your testimony. And again, you'll see a box pop up to accept the unmute request. With this, we will move to administration testimony. At today's hearing, the first panel will be the Commission on Gender Equity, the Department for Health and Mental Hygiene, DOHMH, and the Department of uh, Health and Hospitals for the Administration, h, h followed by council member questions, then public testimony. I will list the names of each member of the administration as a group, and then call on you individually to reply to the oath. So I will now call in members of the administration to testify. In order of speaking, we will have Jacqueline Ebanks, Executive Director from the Commission on Gender Equity, or CGE, Estelle Rabani, uh, MPH, MCHES, Acting Commissioner, as Acting Assistant Commissioner from the Bureau of Maternal, Infant, and Reproductive Health at the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, or DOHMH, and Dr. Wendy Wilcox, Clinical Service Line Lead for Maternal Mortality Reduction at the New York City Health and Hospitals, h, &H and the Women's Health uh, Chair of the OBGYN at h, h of Kings County. Additionally, we will have several members of the administration on hand for technical support, and I'll also be calling them um, to respond to the oath. This includes Maidel De La Cruz from h, &H Chelsea Cip Cipriano from DOHMH, please excuse any pronunciation error, Patricia Moncure from DOHMH, and Gail Black from CGE. I will now administer the oath to the administration. When you hear your name, please respond. 
Thank you. CG Director Jackie Ebanks. Yes. DOHMH Assistant Commissioner Estelle Rabani. Assistant yes. Thank you so much. Sorry. No, and there's a delay. So thank you so much. Apologies. Uh, Dr. Wendy Wilcox from H and H. I think you're still on uh, mute, Dr. Wilcox. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much. Just for the record, we need the, the sound. Thank you, uh, Miss Maidel De La Cruz. Yes. Thank you so much, Miss uh, Cipriano. Ms. Chelsea Cipriano, Cipriano from DOHMH. We'll, I'll come back. Ms. Moncure. Yeah. Right. Thank you so much. Uh, Ms. Black from CG. And we can come back if we need to and um, do the administer the oath later if we need to. Um, just one last check for Ms. Cipriano. Okay, um, we'll move on. And if we need if uh, we need to, we can administer the oath for those individuals on hand for technical support. Uh, so today we will be starting with uh, testimony for CGE followed by DOHMH followed by H and H. Um, so first we will hear from uh, Director Jackie Ebanks from CGE. You may begin your testimony once the Sergeant at Arms has given you the cue. Morning time. Thank you so much. Good morning, Chairs Rosenthal, Rivera and Levine and members of the committees. I'm Jacqueline Ebanks, Executive Director of the Commission on Gender Equity. I'm joined today by my colleagues, Estelle Raboni, Acting Assistant Commissioner for the Bureau of Maternal, Infant and Reproductive Health at New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, DOHMH, and Dr. Wendy Wilcox, Chairperson of, of Obstetrics and Gynecology from New York City Health and Hospitals, h, &H. As executive director of the Commission on Gender Equity, I also serve as an advisor to the mayor and first lady on policies and issues impacting gender equity in New York City. For all girls, women, transgender, and gender non-binary and non-conforming New Yorkers, regardless of their ability, age, race, faith, gender expression, immigrant status, sexual orientation, and socioeconomic status. CGE works to create deep and lasting institutional commitment to tearing down ba equity barriers across New York City. And we carry out our activities in three areas of focus within a human rights framework and using an intersectional lens. These areas of focus are first, economic mobility and opportunity, where we strive to create a city with where people of all gender identities and gender expressions live economically secure lives and have access to opportunities to thrive. Second, our health and reproductive justice focus area has a goal to foster a city free from gender and race-based health disparities. And thirdly, our safety focus area has a goal to, focus, to foster a city free from gender and race-based violence. Within our health and reproductive justice portfolio, CGE recognizes the importance of ensuring access to and affordability of comprehensive, culturally competent sexual and reproductive health care services for all New Yorkers, regardless of gender identity and gender expression. With this in mind, in, 2000, in our 2018 to 2021 strategic plan, CGE identified reducing infant and more maternal mortality in Black and Latinx communities as one of our lead initiatives. As a result, we maintain key partnership with health advocates and our colleagues at DOHMH and health and hospitals. 
In doing so, we are able to ensure responsiveness to the needs of pregnant and childbearing women and gender non-conforming and non-binary New Yorkers. We are pleased to count health advocates as members of the commission. With their involvement, we have numerous direct opportunities to learn about issues of sexual and reproductive health that face New Yorkers where they live and work. At this moment, I'd also like to thank I'm Chair inspired. Rosenthal, Chair Rosenthal and, and Chair um, Rivera for their leadership on our commission as members and really their involvement also in our health and reproductive justice work group. Uh, Meg, may I proceed or? Please, go ahead. Our partnership with the colleagues at DOHMH has included serving as a member of the Maternal Mor Morbidity and Mortality Steering Committee, which it participated in the lodge of the uh, M3RC. As members of the steering committee, we worked with a multidisciplinary team to explore policy and programs recommendations to reduce maternal mortality and severe maternal morbidity in New York City with an equity focus. We advised and supported DOHMH and its partners on ways to implement the recommendations and participated in communicating the findings and the recommendations to key stakeholders and constituencies and advocates and advocating for their uh, support. In, 2000, in our 2019 annual report, CGE was proud to highlight Health and Hospitals comprehensive offering of blended training programs to build competency in providing affirming services for members of the LGBTQ community. This work has significant positive implications for the provision of supportive sexual and reproductive health care services for LGBTQ New Yorkers. In fact, also in 2019, for the fourth year in a row, 23 patient care locations within the health and hospital network received the designation leader in LGBTQ healthcare equality by the human rights campaign. Through our partnerships with health advocates, the DOHMH and h, &H CGE strives to develop and maintain a comprehensive solution-oriented approach to New York City's high maternal mortality and morbidity rates in Black and Latinx communities. In so doing, CGE is able to amplify and support various programmatic policy and public education initiatives launched and managed by our colleagues at DOHMH and Health and Hospitals. This helps us better connect to pregnant and childbearing New Yorkers at critical, in a critical, at critical times and in a timely manner. Um, responsive to their pregnancy-related medical care needs. We look forward to deepening our work with these partners in New York City in the next year. I think it is essential to create the shifts that we so desperately seek in improving conditions for Black improving outcomes for Black and Latinx pregnant and childbearing communities. Regarding the bills under considerations today, I want to turn to my colleagues, Estelle Raboni at DOHMH and Dr. Wendy Wilcox to provide comments. CGE stands in support of their recommendations. Again, thank you for this opportunity to testify on this critical issue. I look forward to continuing our partnership in improving outcomes for Black and Latinx uh, pregnant and childbearing communities. Thank you. Uh, Director Ebanks, I just want to thank you for coming today and your leadership in this in many areas. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, we will now hear from Assistant Commissioner Rabani from DOHMH. You may begin once the Sergeant at Arms uh, gives the cue. Thank you. You may begin. Good morning, Chairs Rosenthal, Rivera, and Levine, and members of the committees. I am Estelle Raboni, Acting Assistant Commissioner for the Bureau of Maternal, Infant, and Reproductive Health at the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. I am joined by my colleagues, Jacqueline E. Banks, Executive Director of the Commission for Gender Equity, and Dr. Wendy Wilcox, Chairperson of Obstetrics and Gynecology from New York City Health and Hospitals. On behalf of Commissioner Shokshi, I want to thank you for the opportunity to testify today on this important topic and for your commitment to improving maternal health outcomes for New Yorkers. 
I want to say here loud and clear, racism is a public health crisis. And one of the, one of the most startling statistics we have in New York City to demonstrate this crisis pertains to maternal health and mortality. Black women in New York City are eight times more likely to die from pregnancy related causes than white non-Latina women. In fact, white non-Latina women without a high school diploma have better maternal health outcomes than black women with a college degree. This is the unacceptable and unjust reality in New York City. Decades of structural racism and pervasive historical disinvestment of black and brown communities have led to these avoidable disparities. Despite improvements in reducing deaths related to pregnancy and childbirth, more needs to be done. Reducing maternal deaths and life-threatening complications is a priority for this administration. Access to quality family planning services, maternal health care, and sexual and reproductive health care services are foundational components of our work to eliminate disparities in black and brown communities. The health department's five-year plan has been pivotal in our efforts to change the narrative and achieve health equity and justice for black New Yorkers. In 2017, the health department established the New York City Maternal Mortality and Morbidity Review Committee, referred to as the M3RC. The goal of the M3RC is to reduce preventable maternal deaths by gaining a holistic understanding of each maternal death to determine cause, assess preventability, and identify contributory factors and actionable recommendations to prevent future tragedies. More recently, in 2018, the health department, in partnership with H plus H, worked together to bolster the city's, oh, sorry, I just lost my place, efforts to reduce racial and ethnic disparities in maternal health. This work includes enhanced public health surveillance through M3RC and deploying a three-pronged strategy to improve the quality of maternity care at hospitals. This strategy includes, one, developing a pilot project with three hospitals to conduct in-hospital quality improvement reviews of severe maternal morbidity SMM cases. These are life-threatening events that occur after childbirth and include heavy bleeding, blood clots, kidney failure, stroke, and heart attack. Two, implementing a qualitative research study to explore the perceptions and experiences of pregnant and parenting people who experienced a severe maternal morbidity while giving birth and the consequences of the severe complication on their lives. And lastly, three, informing and supporting mobilization around maternal health by sharing findings, engaging community stakeholders and hospital partners to change the systems and structures in which people give birth with a focus on SMM. Additionally, the health department works directly with communities facing the most significant social and economic challenges by engaging birth justice defenders to conduct community outreach and education about the New York City standards for respectful care at birth. These standards were created to inform, educate, and support people giving birth. These standards encourage pregnant people to know their basic human rights and be active decision makers in their birthing experience and are also helpful for providers to remind them to respect and be aware of their patients human rights during pregnancy, labor, and childbirth. We are currently implementing the New York City standards for respectful care through virtual trainings with 14 maternity hospitals who serve the majority of pregnant black and brown people in the city. I will now share more detail on, my, on some of the work led by the health department, beginning with the M3RC. The health department formed and convened its first ever M3RC review committee in 2017 using methods, guidance, and tools from the Centers for Disease Control's Maternal Mortality Review Information Application. The Health Department reviews all maternal deaths through this multidisciplinary, multi-ethnic, and racially diverse M3RC. Membership of this committee is drawn from clinical and non-clinical providers across all specialties and includes law enforcement, community partners, the New York City Medical Examiner's Office, and key leaders within American College of College Midwives and New York Medical College. The M3RC contributes to the larger repository of data and literature in this field. Most recently, the M3RC made recommendations based on in-depth review of all pregnancy-associated deaths that occurred in 2016 and 2017. These recommendations address improvements in systems and facilities in which pregnant people give birth, improving provider care, and raising public awareness among community stakeholders and pregnant people of postpartum warning signs and their basic human right to respectful care. Since the start of the pandemic, the committee has been working, sorry, the committee has been meeting virtually and has continued this important work. This committee meets every two to three months to conduct a multidisciplinary expert review of each maternal death in New York City from both clinical and social determinants of health perspectives. 
At the end of every calendar year, the committee proposes key recommendations to improve the care of pregnant persons. With respect to the department's work on SMM, we are convening a virtual New York City Maternal Health Summit called Improving Care and Supporting Healthy Childbirth Experiences on Wednesday, uh, sorry, Tuesday, tomorrow, December 8th. To date, there are over 300 people registered for this event, reflecting interest to hear from experts from clinical and community settings to discuss findings from the Severe Maternal Morbidity Project. The virtual summit will also include web-based panels that will explore the various components of the project and offer participants an opportunity to learn about SMM's uh, efforts, project's efforts to address maternal health inequities. Another significant component in our work to improve maternal outcomes is the Maternal Hospital Quality Improvement Network, or MHQIN. Spearheaded by the Health Department and in partnership with H plus H, MHQIN is a comprehensive strategy with the New York City public and private maternity hospitals to address the root causes of persistent racial and ethnic disparities in maternal mortality and severe morbidity with an emphasis on establishing an in-house quality improvement process. Specific efforts taken include implicit bias training for clinical and non-clinical staff at the city's maternity hospitals to improve equity in childbirth and training on trauma and resilience informed systems, which provides a shared language and understanding of how stress and trauma affect individuals, institutions, and communities, along with practical tools to address implicit bias in clinical decision-making. We have supported clinical training and medical simulation for leading causes of SMM and improved hospital doula collaboration by focusing on capacity building. At the start of the pandemic, public health emergency, we faced some challenges in this work. For example, case abstractors were not allowed on site as hospital facilities due to infection control measure, measures and virtual meetings with hospitals were temporarily paused as staff were entirely dedicated to immediate COVID-19 response. Since May, we have reinstated monthly calls with most of the MHQAN hospitals and case abstraction has resumed at most sites. Both our doula capacity building and implicit bias trainings have moved from in-person to virtual modalities. Furthermore, under MHQAN, the birth justice defenders continued their engagement efforts in communities impacted by maternal health disparities and worse health outcomes. Virtual webinars were viewed 7,000 times by community members. In order to meet emerging health needs resulting from the public health emergency, we also developed tailored resources, including a specific web page dedicated to addressing the needs of pregnant persons during the pandemic. In addition to these resources, the health department has developed a series of public awareness campaigns to complement our community-based work. To gain community input on these campaigns, we conducted listening sessions with community members consisting of persons of reproductive and parenting age representing the five boroughs, as well as focus groups with healthcare providers. These campaigns include safe and respectful care aimed at community residents and healthcare providers to educate New Yorkers about their rights and options before, during, and after pregnancy, and to promote the standards for respectful care, a public health detailing campaign for health providers, centering on having a healthy pregnancy and educating patients on chronic disease prevention and management, as well as providing tools and resources to support diabetes and hypertension self-management. And finally, the M3RC toolkit for health providers, healthcare providers, community organizations, and local health departments summarizing our work on this topic and making the knowledgeable accessible for others. We are fiercely committed to changing the culture around birthing care in New York City and are proud of the work of this administration has led to take significant steps toward reducing disparities in care. I will now speak to the bills being heard today before handing it over to my colleague, Dr. Wilcox from H plus H. Uh, intro 2017 would require the health department to develop voluntary guidelines for hospital visitation policies in the event of the public health emergency and to distribute such guidelines to every hospital in New York City. Post such guidelines on the agency's website and submit such guidelines to the mayor and speaker of the council. The health department understands council's interest in ensuring there is clear guidance during an emergency and that public health considerations are incorporated into any emergency measures taken by the healthcare facility. However, the health department does not have regulatory authority over hospitals. That authority sits with the state health department and as such, it would be problematic and confusing to the public to issue voluntary guidance that could conflict with state guidance and regulations. With regard to intro 2042, uh, intro uh, 2042 would require the health department to post information about midwives, including the services they offer and how to find them on our website in English and in each of the citywide designated languages. We support this legislation and council's interest in making more information on midwives available and accessible to New Yorkers we are open to discussing what would be most useful to share on our web pages. 
I do wanna thank the council for their dedication to this topic and for holding this hearing today. We are proud to be partners in this work and I am happy to answer any questions. At this point, I will like to pass it to my colleague, Dr. Wendy Wilcox of H plus H. And Dr. Wilcox, um, we should be unmuting you as soon as the sergeant calls the clock, you may begin. Actually, apologies, we don't have a clock. You may begin when you're ready. Thank you, can you hear me? And we can hear you, thank you, doctor. Thank you. Good morning, Chairperson Rivera, Chairperson Rosenthal, Chairperson Levine, and members of the Committee on Hospitals, Women and Gender Equity and Health. My name is Dr. Wendy Wilcox. I'm Chair of the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at New York City Health and Hospitals, Kings County, and Clinical Service Line Lead for the Maternal Mortality Reduction and Women's Health for New York City Health and Hospitals. I am also the co-chair for the New York State Task Force on Maternal Mortality and Disparate Racial Outcomes. I've been a practicing clinician for over 20 years and have worked for New York City Health and Hospitals since 2008. I'm joined by my colleagues, Jacqueline Ebanks, Executive Director from the Commission on Gender Equity, and Estelle Raboni, Acting Director of the Bureau of Maternal, Infant, and Reproductive Health for DOHMH. Thank you for the opportunity to discuss maternal mortality and morbidity in New York City today. New York City Health and Hospitals has a long history of working to improve the health of women and children and pregnant persons in this city. As you are aware, our patients are often un or underinsured and may come from underserved neighborhoods, thereby necessitating a more urgent need for attention. For over 10 years, Bellevue Hospital has served as the New York State Department of Health Regional Perinatal Center for New York City Health and Hospitals. As a regional perinatal center, Bellevue's responsibilities include monitoring quality metrics from across our system, holding educational events for health and hospital perinatal staff, accepting transfers for complex and higher acuity patients from the other 10 health and hospital facilities, and providing 24-hour specialty and subspecialty consultation services, as well as patient transport. The Regional Perinatal Center conducts on-site visits to the other facilities within health and hospitals to review cases and conduct quality reviews. In 2013, health and hospitals joined the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology's Safe Motherhood Initiative, which implemented standardized interventions to reduce adverse events related to severe hypertension in pregnancy, prevention of thromboembolic events of pregnancy, meaning prevention of life-threatening uh, clots, uh, which can be caused by deep vein thrombosis or pulmonary emboli, and managing severe life-threatening maternal blood loss or uh, maternal hemorrhage. The three leading causes of maternal mortality at the time, and still among the top causes of maternal mortality. In fact, at the time, New York City Health and Hospitals was recognized by ACOG District 2 as the only health system in New York State which had every hospital in its system participating in the Safe Motherhood Initiative. In 2014, New York City Health and Hospitals established the Institute for Medical Simulation and Learning, also known as IMSEL, where we prepare for real life-threatening events. We developed simulated scenarios in obstetrics and other clinical areas so that our provider and nursing teams can practice the skills necessary to respond to these rare events. Those rare events where a quick and correct response can make the difference between life and death. For obstetrics, we have simulations in shoulder dystocia, a revised and improved maternal hemorrhage simulation course, and one to respond to cardiac arrest in pregnancy. Our simulation course to manage severe hypertension in pregnancy will begin once our hemorrhage simulation has been completed. We anticipate this will be late 2021. Since implementing obstetric simulations, we have seen an improved response in these occurrences and a reduction in medical malpractice indemnities paid. In 2015, all 11 hospitals in the health and hospital system joined the Greater New York Hospital Association 
Depression Collaborative, which was part of New York City Thrive, and implemented perinatal depression screening as part of the prenatal, postpartum, and newborn visit. 85% of people who screened positive for depression were connected directly to care. In 2018, New York City Health and Hospitals invented in Reliance, an online educational course that provides assessment-based personalized learning and is accepted by the American Board of Obstetrics and Gynecology for maintenance of licensure certification. Health and Hospitals invested in Reliance to increase the clinical knowledge and judgment of our provider teams, adopt best practices, improve teamwork and communication, decrease variation among clinicians, and reduce clinical errors, thereby reducing the number of obstetrical adverse events. Relias is now required for, all, for attaining and maintaining privileges in our perinatal services. Also in 2018, Health and Hospitals partnered with City Hall and DOHMH to begin implementing a comprehensive quality improvement program to improve the care of pregnant persons and focus on reducing pregnancy-related morbidity and mortality for, for persons of color. In our maternal medical home, also known as MMH, care coordinators and social workers provide enhanced support and wraparound services for pregnant persons who are at risk for undesired pregnancy outcomes due to medical, behavioral health, or social determinants of health factors. The maternal medical home provides health education and encourages self-efficacy. It helps build trusting and lasting relationships between the patients and the MMH team, as well as between hospitals and community-based organizations. It helps standardize obstetric screening and assessment across the New York City Health and Hospital system, and it connects patients with needed resources and services. The maternal medical home also encourages and facilitates, facilitates patient autonomy for patients in their prenatal care and birthing experiences. Um, as I previously mentioned in the simulation program, it trains the OBEAR healthcare team to manage the top three causes of maternal mortality, cardiovascular collapse, acute life-threatening blood loss, also hemorrhage, and severe hypertension. The interval pregnancy optimization program helps to improve maternal health by training primary care providers to ask patients specifically about pregnancy intention. The patient is asked whether they are planning to become pregnant in the next year. If yes, they are referred for preconception counseling. If not, they are referred for effective contraception of their choice. Our mother-baby coordinated visit program aims to increase adherence to the postpartum visit by having the, patient, uh, the patient's postpartum visit scheduled with the baby's pediatric visit. In terms of addressing implicit bias, this is a priority at New York City Health and Hospitals. Health and Hospitals has conducted implicit bias training for our board of directors and for medical and operational leaders in all 11 of our facilities plus our Gotham sites with Perceptions Institute. We've also worked hand in hand with DOHMH to provide training sessions to the Maternal Hospital Quality Improvement Network, or MHQIN, which you heard my colleague, uh, Ms. Ravoni, discuss. The MHQIN is a comprehensive partnership between DOHMH and 14 New York City maternity hospitals to address the root causes of persistent racial and ethnic uh, disparities in maternal mortality and severe maternal morbidity with emphasis on the importance and the how-to of setting up quality improvement process in their departments. With DOHMH support, the MHQIN integrates reviews of all cases of obstetrical hemorrhages and ICU admissions into OB department quality improvement processes. MHQIN hospitals also provide data back to DHMH to inform future population-based strategies to address these conditions. New York City's Health and Hospitals Community Care Program ensures that pregnant women have access to the highest quality care in a home setting. This includes, but, not as exclusive, but is not exclusive for antepartum assessment and instruction, teaching and support for breastfeeding, and supporting care of infants who are at high risk for neonatal morbidity or mortality. As part of the New York City's Birth Equity Initiative, Health and Hospitals partnered with DOHMH and the Centering Healthcare Institute to launch Centering Pregnancy, an evidence-based group prenatal program at New York City Health and Hospitals Elmhurst Hospital. 
Although further research, research is needed, there is evidence that centering pregnancy can improve maternal and infant health outcomes, including preterm birth reduction in certain populations. Centering encourages greater patient engagement during the prenatal experience. The program features group pregnancy visits with the provider, networking with other pregnant women, group discussions, and prenatal wellness and education classes on nutrition, stress management, and breastfeeding. All pregnant women are eligible to participate in the group care sessions and are asked to join the group during their initial prenatal visit unless the pregnancy shows signs of being already or becoming very high risk. The sessions begin at about 16 to 20 weeks gestation and occur with the same frequency as routine prenatal care visits. Midwifery services are offered throughout New York City Health and Hospitals to improve patients' experiences. New York City Health and Hospitals employs over 70 midwives across the system and is thus the largest employer of midwives in New York City. Patients may access doula services through our relationship with community-based organizations. Patients who request doula services are referred to community providers, including Brooklyn Perinatal Network, By My Side, Caribbean Women's Health Association, Bronx Rebirth, and Ancient Song. Over the last three years, we have made many referrals for doula support for patients and are looking to expand these referral services. In conclusion, we would like to thank the Council for its support of health and hospitals to improve the care and outcomes for the women we serve. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. At this point, uh, we will be moving to council member question and answer. Great. Oh, Chair Rosenthal. Great, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, and thank you all for your testimony and obviously all your care and your dedication uh, to addressing uh, this crisis. Um, I'm going to start with uh, the maternal, the DOH MH Maternal Hospital Quality Improvement Network. Um, I am wondering if you can tell us a little bit about um, uh, the impact of that and whether or not the mayor has committed to continue the funding for it in the coming fiscal year and beyond. Thank you so much, Chair Rosenthal, for your question. Um, the, the impact is uh, being measured in terms of, it's fairly early in this process. Um, we are conducting these trainings. Most recently we conducted um, with 13 hospitals. Um, and what we have seen is qualitative research, qualitative information, which suggests that um, First, acknowledging that there is implicit bias in the hospital uh, institution or the facility. There is, there is bias among providers and recognizing what those biases are, recognizing that um, a white presenting physician may have a bias towards someone who does not look like that person um, and acknowledging that that needs to change and that the interaction that that uh, patient has with the hospital um, is likely to be uh, compromised in some way. Um, the, some of the qualitative research has shown that there is overwhelming support to integrating a lot of the changes and the, and the perspectives found in the implicit bias training and that has been uh, operationalized um, and we're starting to roll that out. Up to this point, we've trained 700 um, both clinical and non-clinical staff on all levels from leadership to uh, administrative staff and midwives as well as others. Um, and with regard to funding, we're committed to this work. We know that this is important work. This is what we need to do in order to change uh, bias that is being performed in all the spaces in which black and brown pregnant people are in. And, um, and we are moving forward with that. Are you saying that the mayor is committed to the funding for this? I'm sorry, the beginning of your question dropped out. Sure, sure. So my understanding is the funding ends this year. The money is not in the budget for fiscal year it would be 22. Has the mayor committed to keeping the money in the budget or adding now money to the budget for the continuation of this program? Or do you feel that the work that you've done 
that you've completed so far has taken care of this issue? No, I think uh, the work needs to continue and certainly the Department of Health has that commitment. It's a core value of the, of the Department of Health um, to improve maternal health citywide. Um, I can't- Confirm that they will continue the funding. Have you put in a request to the mayor's office for funding for the network program? And have they already said yes? Was the money put in the November plan? Is it expected? to be put in the January plan. It's just yes or no and no shade, whatever the answer is on you. Uh, we have put forward that we want to continue this work. Uh, I don't have any other information whether or not- It's it not in the budget though, right? It's not in the budget. Can you confirm it's not in, the funding is not in the budget for fiscal year 2022? I don't have the answer to that, Chair Rosenthal. I apologize. Do you think you can text somebody and ask them to get the answer to that before the end of your time as a panelist? I will certainly do that. Great, thank you. I'll come back for the answer to that. Um, second question is, can you tell us one or two, you said you, you the M3RC was instituted uh, formally in 2017. Can you tell us one or two findings from the most recent M3RC meeting that has led to, and, and what the tangible changes uh, that you have made in the way care is provided for black pregnant people? Much of the findings are actually being operationalized in the programs that we have now. Um, so uh, in terms of uh, MHQIN, changing hospital cultures, changing providers, um, making sure that both uh, providers and community stakeholders are aware of the-, the Right, uh, just, uh, forgive me for interrupting. We just have so many people who wanna testify. I think I didn't articulate the question in the right way. Um, in the M3RC committee meetings, it's my understanding that you take a specific case. In other words, you go through the example of a situation where a physician uh, who was caring for, in this case, a black pregnant person and the black pregnant person died. And you go through exactly what happened and you learn from that to change something for the better. Can you tell us about, not with the names or it, no, privacy, you know, indicating information, but something you learned, one thing that was learned from the most recent M3RC committee meeting. Um, the, it the, could I, be hospital specific, it could be physician specific, it's fine, but I just want to hear what it is. I, I would say um, with regard to that, I think it was mentioned uh, by one of the council members. Um, one of the, the largest issues is listening to uh, black and brown pregnant people when they air concerns and taking those concerns very seriously. Um, that initial interaction between provider and uh, pregnant person is very important because if, they, if their concerns are dismissed, they're unlikely to go back to that provider or to raise additional concerns. So, I mean, I mean, sure. that's a hell of a finding. It's a hell of a finding. And you said you've trained now 700 uh, medical professionals. How many more need to be trained? Our goal for this year was 1,000. Um, we did have a little bit of um, loss in momentum when the pandemic uh, hit because originally our, all of our trainings were in right, person. But how many medical professionals are there in total? It's the majority. I don't have a number off the top of my head, but it's uh, overwhelmingly, it's, it's the majority of those trained are clinical people. We're trying and to make so the big impact on those. You seen, do you do follow-ups in the M3RC to learn whether or not in fact behavior has changed? Yes, the relationship is long-term. We don't just provide a training and then leave those uh, people trained, we follow up and then we operationalize a plan on how can we make changes within the system to change outcomes. 
All right. Uh, local law 914 of 2018 codified the M3RC and expanded on maternal mortality reporting requirements. Would it make sense for the M3RC to share an annual report? Why or why not? Uh, thank you, um, Chair Rosenthal. Uh, I, I understand the, the question. The, the fact is that the timeline from maternal death to M3RC review uh, actually meets the gold standard for timeliness according to the CDC guidelines for maternal mortality review. Um, and it's the result of the time required for case ascertainment, collection of medical and other relevant records and case abstraction and case review. I recognize that every maternal death is a tragedy and we agree. Um, however, it is a, a very rare event um, and unfortunately require, requires time for us to see changes. So last year, uh, I think it was 26 women died in childbirth. Um, the ratio of eight to one, eight black women died for every one white woman. How many of the cases of black women who died went through a quality review, whether or not it has it rises to the level of an M3RC or just a basic quality review. How many of those cases for the black women? I would have to take a look. Um, I don't have the answers to that. I know that we are we receive um, information of maternal deaths and, and we look into those and we have and that becomes part of the conversations with the M3RC, um, but I don't have uh, that information. Um, I'd like to ask my colleague, Dr. Wilcox, who does sit on the M3RC, if she could answer that question. Thank you. Sure, um, thank you, Ms. Raboni and Chair Rosenthal. Um, so the, all of the maternal deaths are reviewed as a group. And um, a death um, is any death um, with um, temporal proximity to a pregnancy um, of a year. So for uh, 2018, not just the women who died in the hospital, but women who died at, at home um, or in other locations, um, within a year of a pregnancy, no matter how far along, are all um, put in a cohort and then reviewed. Um, this year, we are reviewing deaths from 2018 um, we, because it takes that long to, um, you know, have someone abstract the charts so that um, things are de-identified and um, no personal information is known to any member of the group. Um, only the person who abstracts the chart knows um, the actual details of um, the non-clinical and non-circumstantial um, details of the death. So that everything is de-identified. The group then comes up with recommendations. Um, um, and I would say that um, as we go through the review of, of the death, the recommendations are um, are collected, and what you find is similar recommendations being made um, being made along the way. Um, the way that um, the CDC has set it up, and the M3RC follows those CDC guide that the, those, those guidelines, um, is to um, come up with recommendations whether it is on um, a hospital level, a provider level, a patient level, a city level, um, and then the how-to is kind of sorted out um, and, um, and, 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 then, and then people have to work on that. I would say okay. um, the deaths are often incredibly complex. We find, I would say, you know how the CDC says communication 
um, is the number one cause for adverse events um, in the clinical realm. Um, communication, whether it's from where someone received prenatal care to the hospital and then from the hospital to other specialties or from the hospital to other entities, we frequently are coming up with recommendations that involve um, improving communication between all of the different entities. That all right. Got it. Thank you. Um, you know, I think one of the things that everyone is talking about is the fact that, um, is the fact that, you know, these deaths are preventable. According to the CDC, it's three out of five are preventable. Um, when we look at New York City, it's clear we have a segregated hospital system, right, where, um, uh, the big network hospitals, New York Presbyterian, Mount Sinai, et cetera, um, you know, are not uh, um, taking the patients who they should take. Um, would it be possible for the city, have you considered uh, requiring these hospitals um, as part of your affiliate contract? for example, to take more prenatal, uh, make more uh, black uh, pregnant people for prenatal and postpartum care? I would have to uh, ask- It's my understanding that the city can order hospitals to care for more black and brown patients or take away some privileges. Thank you, Chair Rosenthal, for your question. Um, I, I think we would certainly take that under consideration. Uh, currently, being part of the discussion in any meetings that you've been in, I would I would like to defer to Dr. Wilcox if that has been part of any discussion. Wow, I mean, I I really have to say that's heartbreaking. New York City. I mean, I I've been working. Um, thinking about those affiliate contracts since I worked under the Koch administration, you have so much leverage under those affiliate contracts. Your hospitals provide the patients for these medical students. So the fact that the city, according to what your knowledge is, has never used this opportunity to require I would have the private hospitals take the affiliate hospitals do more prenatal and postnatal care never I'll move on I would have to uh, chair Rosenthal thank you I would have to go back to my colleagues uh, as this is not work that falls under uh, yeah my bureau, um, but I can take this question to my colleagues and- Yeah, I'd love to hear from the legal uh, team on this. And I see you taking notes, Director Ebanks. I appreciate you. It's a perfect sort of uh, overview question. I appreciate your following up on this. I really do. Last set of questions. Given that black women are eight times more likely to die from pregnancy related cases than white women, and three times more likely to have a life-threatening complication. I am interested to know if you plan to extend um, the pilot project you mentioned with three hospitals to conduct the uh, quality improvement reviews, have, whether or not you plan to extend that to all hos 11 hospitals now. Yes, uh, thank you, Chair Rosenthal. We do. Uh, this uh, cohort is just the first cohort. The plan was always to expand to all the maternity hospitals. Um, our initial uh, attempt was to use the limited resources that we have to impact those hospitals that um, are responsible for 50% among uh, black and brown pregnant people. Should I ask you which those three hospitals are? Is that public information? Um, 
I would have to get back to you on that. I'm sure I have it here. If it's public information by the end of your time as panelists, I'd love to hear the answer to that. Um, I'm, I'm gonna turn it back to my colleagues uh, or to the moderator. Thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chair Rosenthal. Uh, we will now move to Chair Rivera, if she and Chair Levine, if they have questions before moving to other council members. Sure, thank you so much for your testimony. Just, just a few questions, because I do realize the time and we have many people waiting to testify whose I think experiences, stories and testimony are important to get on the record uh, I guess I'll start with um, health and hospitals or anyone can really um, answer this question. And I wanna ask a little bit about kind of where we are right now during this pandemic. So how do health and hospitals currently admit birth workers such as doulas to pre and postnatal visits during deliveries? Uh, thank you, Chairperson Rivera. So um, during the first surge, all patient visitation at New York City um, Health and Hospitals was suspended, with a few exceptions, including for a visitor of a woman in labor, an infant in the neonatal ICU, or a pediatric patient. Um, doula services during this time became very innovative um, and provided services um, virtually. Our current policy um, follows New York State guidance, which is that um, patients may have uh, one support person during labor and a doula uh, when the patient has a doula. I'll ask you about those guidelines in a second. What certification and testing requirements are in place for birth workers during the pandemic? I'm so sorry, I'm not understanding. What, what, please, please rephrase. Um, for sure. For birth workers and during the pandemic, how are you offering um, services certification to make sure that they can continue to their work, do their work, to make sure that we can get people continuously certified during the pandemic so that they can continue to provide these services? To my knowledge, there is no certification for doulas. We certainly, as I said in my testimony, refer to our community-based organizations we refer patients to them for doula services, um, and um, our patients obtain doula services through the community-based organizations. We do not employ doulas. What I mean is certification requirements to enter the hospital. Um, so again, a patient may enter with a support person. Our admitting um, procedures are made aware to the people at the front desk as well um, as um, our patients, they're available on our website. So patients are aware, aware that they are allowed a support person when they come in uh, for their birthing experience um, and the doula may come with the patient. I understood, I, I asked because laying the groundwork for consistently positive relationships between hospitals and birth workers is critical as you've mentioned in your testimony. So many doulas have shared with us that they have been turned away or been told that hospitals would only accept certification from certain organizations. So how can we work with hospitals to ensure that birthing persons are not in a position where their chosen and often paid out of pocket doula will not be turned away when they need them the most? Um, so as you're aware, our say, patients sometimes um, do not have means, and so certainly our expectations when we refer is that patients without means will be provided with, um, you know, doula services that are compensated by in other ways, um, and we refer, like I said, patients to these organizations that will help provide these services for our patients. I will ask about uh, the organizations in a second as well. Um, it's just that some hospitals require some certifications, others don't. It's been very unclear, and I realize these are unprecedented circumstances. But in regards to what you mentioned on, on, on state policy, how can, maybe this is for the Department of Health, how can pregnant people and birth workers currently find hospitals visitation policies, both for support family members, familial support, and birth workers, 
how do New York City hospitals communicate state guidance on visitation policies? And can you clarify why the state guidance on visitation policies has resulted in different policies in different facilities? I'll just answer for New York City Health and Hospitals. Our visitation policies are on our website. And also during uh, the care that we give our prenatal patients, the providers um, and nursing staff will let the patient know what our policies are. Does the Department of Health have anything to add? I just want to be clear. So you're saying it's in person to the patient and it's online? That's correct. Um, and I believe it was also on the New York State website as well when the executive orders were, were um, established. And, you know, I just want to emphasize a council member, uh, Thara Lewis, co-chair of the Women's Caucus, mentioned how there is a digital divide. Not everyone has access to internet. And so having those conversations in different ways is really important. And mentioning specifically uh, Brooklyn, and I know there are amazing organizations that have been doing this work for a very long time. Brooklyn Perinatal Network um, is certainly, I know, a partner of yours. So despite all the efforts made by uh, DOHMH and h, &H and other hospitals, we're still seeing the disparate uh, maternal health outcomes. And there are those longstanding CBOs working to address these outcomes and they're pillars of our community, as we all know. How has the Department of Health partnered with these CBOs and actively engaged with them to continue to improve our efforts to save lives? Uh, we engage with um, many community stakeholders because we recognize the expertise in the community. So um, to Dr. Wilcox's point, um, we do work um, with, you know, um, community-based doula programs in New York City, such as By My Side, um, birth support program. Um, we do work with other, um, you know, uh, community stakeholders to improve the quality of, of service to uh, pregnant people. Um, okay, do you believe that there are enough resources for pregnant women in, in New York City? I think uh, there could be more services, certainly. Um, as I mentioned, we are trying to concentrate the resources that we do have on those hospitals that manage the highest number of births among uh, black and brown pregnant people. Um, but of course there could always be more and there could be more coordinated um, communication and, and information sharing um, so that more people are aware of what their, um, what services are available to them. And, you know, during the pandemic, I, I feel like with the strain on our hospital system, patient advocacy is very, very important. And that's why I was so committed to making sure that the visitation guidelines were changed or, or really amended to make sure that people felt like they had that support. I, I'm, a little torn on whether we have enough resources. I, I don't think that they're there. I, I just feel like the evidence is clear whether qualitative or quantitative and, and I, it's systemic and it's been going on for a long time. What resources does a pregnant person have if they do not feel like they know how to navigate the medical system or they experience complications and they do not feel like they are being heard? I, uh... Chair Rivera, I, I, I understand the passion behind your question. Um, there, there are services uh, within the city. We also have other programs that advocate on behalf of uh, pregnant people. Um, for instance, uh, the health department, regardless of the pandemic, um, continues to um, support uh, vulnerable families and new families through our newborn home visiting programs, as well as the nurse family partnership program. Um, and serving thousands of families every year to make sure that um, pregnant people and uh, postpartum people have all the services that they need to raise healthy uh, and happy children as well as to maintain maternal health. Um, we, there are other programs throughout the city that support people. Can, can we have more serv you know, uh, services? Absolutely. 
um, and more coordinated services and more coordinated communication of services. Um, but to your point, it takes time to change hospital culture and, um, and that's what we're trying to do. So we need long-term investment to change uh, what's going on. And, and speaking of, of those services, uh, doulas and midwives, I think we can all agree, improve maternal health outcomes, full stop. Can health and hospitals just give an update about, I know there was some in the testimony and I appreciate the, the length of your testimony. Can you provide an update about uh, on how you're working to improve access to midwives within the hospital system? Um, so uh, midwives are at all of our facilities um, except for three. Um, certainly, um, during the initial prenatal visit, um, a patient, um, uh, a lot of screening is done, some of which is clinical, um, and um, certainly um, if someone uh, from a clinical standpoint can, uh, can have, you know, is eligible for midwifery services, then they are referred um, um, at that site, uh, as well as um, if a patient would like midwifery services and does not have it at that particular facility, um, they can certainly um, access it at, a, at another health and hospital facility. I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't understand the last part. They can go to a different hospital if, if it's- if Within it's health and hospitals. We can, we can help facilitate that. There are three of them that do not have the services. Can you t tell me why? Where are those hospitals? Is no um, it really is just um, a way that uh, the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology just evolved over time. Okay, so you're saying that there are reasons for why there are no midwifery programs in these hospitals. What are the factors that would lead to that decision ultimately? I don't necessarily think it was um, an intentional decision. Oh, just over time, there were some departments, um, three of, out of 11, um, that just do not have uh, midwifery services. But be, you're not sure why? Uh, I'm sorry, I'm just wanting to really clear that I'm not up. sure that there was actually a, a definite plan. Um, we certainly have, uh, I think, just the way that the departments evolved. Throughout health and hospitals, there are more than 70 midwives, inclusive of full-time, part-time, and per diem employment status. And again, health and hospitals is the largest employer of midwives in New York City. Are there expectations to expand that program given the crisis? Expand what program, excuse me, mm -hmm. sorry. To expand those services. Midwifery services? Yes. So in a lot of uh, our facilities, uh, midwifery services complement the uh, full breadth and depth of obstetrical services that are offered at the facility. And I ask because also at a, a January 2020 hearing that I uh, chaired, Dr. Katz shared that Health and Hospitals partnered with Department of Health at the mayor's office to begin implementing a comprehensive maternal care program. Yeah. And that would have a focus, right, on identifying and responding to pregnancy related morbidity and mortality for women of color. Yeah. And well, I, I want to just say, I know we bring up comorbidities and high risk pregnancies. I, I think it's important to note that we know most people who give birth are healthy, but we need to focus on systemic failures rather than an individual's health status. So having said all that, can you please provide an update on those efforts that Dr. Katz mentioned? I would be happy to. Um, thank you. Um, so the maternal medical home staff, as you know, we uh, embedded a maternal medical home um, within our facilities. And the purpose of this maternal medical home Staff is to really um, provide wrap around and enhanced services for individuals and to also provide um, screening 
standardized screening so that we can identify those women who may be at risk for having an um, adverse outcome due to medical complications, behavioral health, or social determinants of health factors. Since that time, our maternal medical home staff have seen more than 2,500 clients and made over 1,800 referrals to services such as doula services, nutrition counseling, behavioral health services and counseling, WIC, Nurse Family Partnership, SNAP, Substance Use, just to name a few. Um, and our maternal home medical home members have also made over 650 referrals to community-based organizations. We've trained over 1,100 clinical staff um, in our um, OB life support simulation course. Our OB hemorrhage course is launching. The didactic sessions are now underway, and we intend to train the same number of clinical providers to reach a, um, a saturation of about 90% trained. Um, for our pregnancy intention, um, our, um, that was embedded in our EPIC um, electronic medical record, um, and so um, patients are being asked about pregnancy intention. Um, and our newborn um, and postpartum coordinated um, visit program um, did, did have to halt um, a little bit during um, you know, for infection control reasons um, during the height of, um, of COVID, the COVID surge, um, but those are starting to get off the ground again. What does patient monitoring and care look like from when a person first expresses interest in becoming pregnant to when they are postpartum? Thank you for asking that question. So from the moment a patient expresses interest in becoming pregnant, She's referred for preconception counseling. This may include her taking folic acid supplementation, general health screening, and possibly changing the patient's medication regimen if she is on any. Once she becomes pregnant, um, she may access midwifery services, as previously discussed, if health allows, um, and if she's at uh, one of those other facilities. And um, once in care, the patient receives the highest evidence-based standards of prenatal care, this includes genetic screening, ultrasound services, other fetal testing, as well as standardized screening and referrals when necessary. And I wanted to um, ask, because uh, Health and Hospitals provided an update about a maternal depression screening initiative through Thrive NYC. And so yeah. what is the status of this work? And I just want to add, in terms of depression, mental health, um, we want to do this work, you know, trauma-informed. And so I, I'd like to know the status of, of that work uh, for maternal uh, depression, but also through entire kind of gynecological services, whether pregnant or not. I think asking questions about trauma to really make sure the work is holistic and comprehensive is incredibly important. Um, so can you give us the status of that work? Sure. So um, the Maternal Depression Collaborative with Thrive ended on December 31st, 2019, but really our depression screening has become hardwired um, into our normal and regular processes. Um, so patients are routinely screened during prenatal, postpartum, and newborn baby visits. Um, 48 clinic sites and 25 New York City hospitals were involved. Um, over 36,800 prenatal women were screened, over 23,100 postpartum uh, women were screened, and 85% of patients who screened positive were directly connected to care. It really is part of just standardized processes um, in how we do business. No, I, I understand, and I realize that I think all, all all of you wake up in the morning to do your very, very best and to take care of people. and hope that they feel seen and heard, just that the stories and the experiences are just, they're showing otherwise. And it is leading to tragic, tragic outcomes and families devastated. 
So I want to just thank you for answering my questions. We have many people here, um, including uh, Mr. Bruce McIntyre, who's been here for the duration of the day um, with his own story to share. And I want to thank you for your testimony. I'm going to turn it over to, to Chair Levine to ask questions, because like I said, for sake of time, thank you for being here. Thank you for answering our questions. Thank you so much, Chair Rivera. And thank you, Chair Rosenthal, for what's already been an important and impactful hearing. I want to ask a few brief questions, and I will be brief, about data. Because there's no way we can measure our progress in solving this crisis unless we have clear, transparent, and regularly reported data. In fact, it is one piece of data, the, the horrifying disparity of 12 to 1 in maternal mortality between white and black mothers, which has really led to uh, unprecedented and long overdue attention to this issue in the last two years with more media coverage. It's, um, it has finally belatedly focused attention of the public on uh, this reprehensible disparity. And uh, so the first, first I'd like to ask about um, news that I think you have broken in the last day or two about what appears to be a new figure you're using for the disparity in mortality between black and white mothers in New York City, which uh, you're now saying is, is eight to one. Uh, I, I wonder whether um, this perhaps could be a question for Assistant Commissioner Raboni, whether um, that number has, or the data behind it has been yet made public. Uh, and if not, when we can expect that and uh, whether we can expect regular updates on this critical statistic going forward. Thank you, Chair Levine, for your question. Um, yes, uh, the data that says that uh, Black women are 12 times more likely to die from a pregnancy-related uh, death is actually from the five-year report that spans 2006 to 2010. The most recent report um, that spans between 2011 and 2015 actually shows eight times more likely. Um, still concerning in terms of the disparity, but um, heading in the right direction. Our next report is scheduled to be released in, I believe it's 2021. Um, and uh, we're looking forward to seeing if there is a downward trend um, to see if, if there's an improvement in that respect. But Commissioner, how is it that we are operating on five-year-old data, even, even with your update? It, do, it does take uh, time to collect information. Um, as I mentioned previously, it takes time to abstract the cases, assess the cases, evaluate them. It is a CDC uh, best practice um, in terms of timeline. And because uh, as, as tragic as maternal deaths are, it is a very rare occurrence. Um, and so we, we require having to get more information and more data in order to make any kind of uh, determinations. But we have all sorts of health data in the city, which is updated yearly, quarterly, monthly, in some cases, even daily. Uh, sh surely we can have an annual update on, on data, which is just so critical. I, I have to say again, it really is based on the science and what the best practices are. And the best practices suggest that in terms of uh, maternal mortality and severe maternal morbidity, um, it, it requires a, some amount of time. I'd love for Dr. Wilcox to opine um, as she's also uh, part of these conversations as well. Um, thank you, Ms. Raboni. Again, um, the, the, you know, the data that we're looking at um, is for an entire year. Um, it is suggested that you look at them not as they come in, but as an entire cohort. Um, and um, I think it has been getting faster. Um, when we first started, uh, we were reviewing, I don't know, 2015-2016 data, and so far it's been 2018. The addition of the pregnancy checkbox um, on death certificates, which is an unfortunate and morbid topic, but has enabled um, easier identification um, 
uh, of, of, of persons for review. So, um, you know, it, it would be nice if it would uh, be an easier thing to do, but it is, it is, it is it's a lot and it, it, it is complicated. Right, but you know, the Surgeon General, the American Medical Association, Society for Maternal Fetal Medicine, they all talk about the importance of regular data. Uh, and, and they really are the science authorities that we need to be listening to. Uh, I, but I, I do wanna move on for time and ask what the data that we have is telling us about the trend uh, to the extent to which the data you believe is indicating progress or, or heaven forbid that we might be stalling or backsliding? I hesitate to, to suggest that we're making progress uh, because again, I feel that we need to see the next uh, cohort of data to make that determination if it's a downward trend or not. Um, it could fluctuate so, so much within a particular year um, that I think it would be irresponsible for me to suggest uh, that there's a trend at this point. I'm sorry, Council Member uh, Levine, can I just follow Please. up with really Please. nailing it questions? Are you saying what I, I think I just heard you say is that you don't know the information about whether or not the death was related to pregnancy until the death certificate comes out and so you're waiting for that uh, until you have the data. But even if that's true, which is mind numbing, because I would imagine given that the number is so little that every death would send a red flag immediately up the chain uh, to tracking. Uh, so, so, but even if you're waiting to review death certificates, surely you can review the death certificate. You have the data from calendar year 2019 now, you have the data from calendar year 18, 17, 16. So, so given the, count, the data that you have for that four year period, because I understand the necessary, you know, it's important for privacy to, you know, not use specific figures or names in a current year, what, what were the numbers for each of those four years? And, and then let other people think about patterns or whatever, but what were the exact, what was the number of people who died in 2017, 18, and 19? May I just, would it be okay if I just added something? I think um, it might've been helpful to have an overview of um, pregnancy associated versus pregnancy related death. Look, That's I'm the... done with you on all of this nuance and specifics. So you can report it the way that's accurate. I'm not going into the details and I know you're, you have the medical specifics on this. I, I just, and I understand every nuance. So if you want to have those two different categories, you know, whatever the right way is to show it, but surely you have the numbers now for each of the last four years, no? We, we, we do, do have, have data, 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 which we, which we are, are looking, looking at, at and, and currently doing, doing data, data analysis on. Uh, right, no, I'm not asking for the analysis. I'm not asking for the review. I'm asking for the raw numbers. I don't, I don't have that information being made at this point. Point. Okay. Uh, gosh. I mean, Dr. Dr. Wilcox, Wilcox, would you like, would you like to, to align on that? that? I, just, I just think that it's a little difficult because there are some deaths that are incidental to a pregnancy that really have nothing to do. Of course, and the CDC says Three right. out of five are related to preventable uh, issues. Obviously, that means two are not preventable. Mm -hmm. But I just am interested in the raw numbers. Give you that, that information, information Chair Wilson. Wilson. I mean, that would be great. Maybe even by the end of, if, if staff are watching now, if they could send that over to you and put a big old footnote on it with the nuance that's important to put on. 
Um, but it, I would imagine you could have that information from your staff by, by the, before this panel closes. Chair Levine, I'm so sorry to have interrupted you. Not, not at all, Chair, those excellent follow-ups. Uh, I wanna ask similarly about data on underlying conditions, which we know contribute to um, mortality and morbidity in birth and childbirth. Here again, there are enormous racial disparities driven by a variety of environmental factors uh, from lack of uh, equal access to healthy food to, uh, to broader uh, stress arising from racism in society. Um, do you have data on the prevalence of such conditions and people giving birth in New York City? For example, uh, rates of diabetes uh, that we could compare across various racial and ethnic groups. Thank you for your, for your question. Um, it is uh, safe, safe to say, say that the neighborhoods that we are concentrating a lot of our work in, 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 um, in the health department, is the same, same neighborhoods that, that have multiple, multiple um, health, health indicators that are fairly negative, whether, negative, whether, whether uh, it's diabetes or hypertension or maternal health outcomes or pregnancy. pregnancy. Um, these, these are neighborhoods neighbor neighbor that have been historically disinfested. Um, that, that had been, been impacted by structural racism, racism. Um, and they were doing everything, everything possible to, to mitigate the effects of that, that racism and and, and, um, and then this assessment. Uh, I'm so I'm so sorry to interrupt. We're getting a bad audio feed from you. It's um it's almost skewed. So we're gonna try to mute you and unmute you again. Uh, it did it wasn't happening earlier, but it started now. Can you hear me? We can. There's some feedback. It sounds like you're underwater with a microphone. Um, Should I log out and log back in? Yes, and, and while you are perhaps, uh, while you're um, dealing with that technical issue, issue, Commissioner, perhaps I could just follow up with Dr. Wilcox. Uh, the Commissioner very uh, accurately stated the broad conditions which are leading to these inequalities, but my question is whether we're collecting data if we knew, for example, that um, uh, certain groups of people coming in to give birth had higher rates of diabetes, uh, that would indicate a real problem related to um, medical risk at birth. And uh, we could track that over time. Uh, it would be one indicator of progress uh, that perhaps we could have real time because uh, it doesn't uh, have the complexity that um, tracking birth certificates does. Uh, are, are we collecting data on underlying conditions and people giving birth in New York City and what is it telling us over time? Um, I, I do think Ms. Raboni would be better to answer that. However, I will let you know from being a member of the committee what I've seen and also um, from being one of the authors of um, the maternal mortality report um, from um, 2006 to 2006 and one of the authors of the New York City Department of Health report. And what that showed um, was over 50% of um, the women who died um, had one and or more, it was greater than 50%, one and or more pre-existing and uh, conditions, um, inclusive of hypertension, diabetes, asthma, obesity, et cetera. I think it was actually upwards of two thirds. And so we do know that these chronic conditions um, uh, do predispose to poorer outcomes um, at delivery. Um, certainly these are all examined um, in the process of, re of, of the review. Um, and these also appear in the report. So in the last report and in the upcoming report, as Ms. Raboni stated, that data should be in there. Right, I understand. But uh, can you tell us, for example, so far in 2020, whether there have disparate, been disparate rates of such underlying conditions in, in all women giving birth uh, across various racial and ethnic and demographic groups? Is that I'm the kind not of thing able to? to give that data. Right, so that, that would be the kind of close to real time data that we could look at that I think would be a marker of our progress. 
And if we did see that we were closing the disparity in those underlying factors, even independent of the tragic incidents of mortality, uh, that would show that we're, we're making progress, at least on one front. Uh, and, and I do want to move on, but just lastly, along those lines, do we have data on, um, on, on, on methods that we know help solve this problem? For example, can we track our, our progress in increasing the number of, of, of mothers birthing people who have doula or other birthing assistants? And again, track whether that the gap is closing amongst different groups? Um, again, I would have to uh, refer that to um, my colleague, Ms. Raboni, to talk about um, citywide data. However, to tie back your question um, as to why we thought um, the maternal medical home was so crucial, it's because, um, and that model was based off of um, the medical home that was created in internal medicine for for chronic disease patients, such as HIV care or um, diabetic care. So the maternal medical home really was fashioned over that model, which said that if we have patients who we realize may be a little bit more complex to care for, let's put an extra layer of support in there, um, both for the patient's sake to make sure that that patient has someone to reach out to and to talk to, and to make sure that she gets tied into doula care, um, but also to all the other services she may need, such as enhanced nutrition, whether it's through SNAP or WIC, um, you know, housing, legal services, nutrition counseling, other, other forms of support. Um, and so that model of the, of the medical home um, can be applied and is being applied currently to our prenatal patients specifically for that reason. Okay, I'm going to wrap up because we have um, so many colleagues and advocates asking for questions. But, you know, the adage is that if you don't measure it, you can't fix it. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to get transparent as close to real time data on not just mortality and morbidity rates, but underlying conditions and the methods that we know can help solve this. Mm -hmm. uh, we need that as a city and uh, we will certainly continue to advocate for that. Uh, thank you, and I'll pass it back to you, uh, Chair Rosenthal. Thank you. thank you so much, Chair Levine. I'll now ask the moderator to call on my colleagues with questions for the administration. Thank you so much, Chair Rosenthal. Uh, the next council member with questions will be Chair, excuse me, Council Member Barron. Starting time. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Good. How are you? I'm well, thank you. Um, just a few questions. We talked about most recently in the questioning here um, about the, the the lag, the delay in the time that we have when we get the data. Why is that? Uh, most recently, Councilmember Levine asked, "Why can't we get it sooner?" Well, as I've mentioned before, um, there is a standard uh, protocol that we're following um, from the CDC um, that suggests that it, there is a two-year delay uh, in order to um, track this data and to report on it uh, responsibly. Um, it takes time. It, it, as, as I mentioned before, as tragic as maternal deaths are, and they are tragic, um, they are rare. And so um, it is a relatively small sample size to be assessing. Of course, you know, um, okay. we, so we're trying to follow a, a particular protocol in order to assess accurately. Thank you. I have lots of questions, but I'm going to be quick. Uh, I think I heard testimony that there were three out of 11 hospitals that have no midwifery services. Is that is that what you said? Is that what was reported on the record? That three did that have none? Health and hospitals facilities that do not have midwives. And can you tell us what area these three hospitals are located in? Um, I do not have um, 
those three hospitals listed right now. I'm sorry, this, this doesn't need to take eat, eat into Council Member Barron's time. Then can you read the names of the hospitals that do have the delivery service and we'll, we'll figure it out from there. Um, I'm so sorry. I regret to say I do not have the specific hospitals that do or do not. Perhaps we could provide that um, to you after. I, I don't have it in, okay, in my if you information. Could add, uh, Sergeant, a minute to Council Member Barron's time. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And I did want to uh, follow protocols and thank the chairs for having this very important hearing, Levine, Rosenthal, and Rivera. Um, I'm suspect, and it's not paranoia, but I'm suspect as to what the three hospitals are, why they don't have it, because I don't believe that it just evolved. I think that there were factors at play in determining whether or not a particular hospital would have these kinds of services. Uh, it has been said that the problems are systemic and not necessarily individual. And I think that as we try to address these issues, we've got to make it systemic. When HIV became a real crisis, when the opioid crisis became uh, touching other communities other than black communities, the city put millions and millions of dollars into solving that problem. I understand that uh, every life is valuable, every life is important, and I accept that. And I've heard it said, well, there were only a few there aren't a large number, but the percentages by which Black and Latino women are, are disparately impacted in a negative way still needs to have the money put in to address solving this issue. I think that the social determinant factors in these issues talk to the systemic racism that is prevalent and persistent to this day. And I think we've got to make sure that the city puts money in and not puts a cap on what we do based on what the feds and what the state does, but based on what we see the areas are that need attention. We're talking about a massive campaign to have people understand, well, yes, historically, we know we were given the guts of the hog for our sustenance, but now we've got to help people understand that we can evolve and do better. We also understand that we have these so-called deserts that don't have good nutrition. We've got to make sure that we provide those kinds of uh, forces and put the money in it. I think it's about money. I think it's also about social consciousness. And this is the time for us to make sure that we do that. Uh, we talk about pre-existing conditions. Those conditions are a reflection of this society uh, underplaying, undermining, undervaluing black and brown lives. Until we make investments large scale about social programs, about health, about education, and about providing jobs to people, we're not gonna get the results that we are looking at. Someone else earlier in the testimony said that um, the health outcomes for black women with higher degrees was worse than it was for white women uh, basic high school degrees. That's a reflection of racism. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't matter that you continue to go on and get higher degrees and uh, advanced education. It's determined by your skin color. And until we face that and say, listen, we're going to bombard the media, we're going to bombard uh, public announcements, public service announcements, and help elevate people's understanding of what they themselves. Um, expire. Thank you. Until we can understand that that is what we have to do to really make sure this, and until we understand that this is so important that we must have real-time data. We can't get data four or five years later and say, oh, well, you know, five years ago, this was happening and we should have done such and such, and we didn't do that. So we've got to make that commitment. We've got to put money into this. We've got to make sure that all of these issues get the financial underpinning to make them successful uh, and get the results that we need to let black and brown women know that they're that this society, because they already know it in much in most, most degrees, but that this society has got to address that and reflect that. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you so much, Councilmember Barron. Uh, Councilmember Cohen has his hand raised. Starting time. 
Oh, now I'm unmuted. Uh, thank you, chairs. Uh, thank you for the testimony. This has been uh, really a fascinating hearing um, and highlighting a, a, you know, such a serious and tragic problem. Uh, I, I, this may have been discussed and maybe I missed it, uh, but uh, doula and midwife services, are, are, are they Medicaid eligible? Anybody? Would you like for me to take that one? Um, I'm gonna, yeah. sorry, I'm looking at my notes. Um, I would like to uh, defer to Dr. Wilcox, yes. Uh, midwives are um, uh, Medicaid eligible, I believe. They're, they're part of our, of our clinical healthcare team. They're actually employees uh, of many hospitals and they have, there are private practices of midwives as well. Um, I believe doula services, there uh, were um, two state, um, uh, trial uh, trials going on um, to try to work out reimbursement uh, for midwives, one in, one in Buffalo and one here in Brooklyn. Um, and so um, I, I'm not sure that we can answer that, but there was a program through New York State Medicaid that was uh, trying to pay for doula services. Those are two pilot, pilot programs is the word I was looking for. But you don't know of health and hospitals bills for doula services? Oh, we do not. They're not employees of our hospital. We refer to CBOs and they handle the doula employment. And you, and you don't know, so you don't know if they get paid by, or those expenses are reimbursable by? There were two pilot programs where New York State Medicaid was trying to work out how that could happen. I am not aware of the update on those programs. Uh, I know this is an old fashioned notion, but it, it, this problem seems maybe particularly well suited for um, uh, in home visits. Like, is there any program where, could you, and could you, I, I see some of you, you nodding, doctor, could you talk about what's available? Thank you for asking that question. <laughs> yeah. uh, so, we have uh, through our community care um, provided um, at home services. Um, for our, and I'm looking for the information uh, right now, um, uh, um, Community Care was able to provide um, at-home uh, prenatal support, um, doula services, and also care for um, neonates or newborns who were at high risk. I'm looking for the actual numbers that um, through health and hospitals. Um, oh, here it is. So prenatal home visits since 2018, the grand total was 602 newborn visits, uh, 13,433 and postpartum visits, 12,981 for a total of 27,016. The, the, the prenatal number is pretty low. Yes, we, um, I believe we send it to complement our uh, existing um, structures. We also, I don't have the numbers here, but we also enlisted some televisits, but I'm sure you realize that, um, you know, the, the gold standard is really- I, I, yeah, but, but COVID aside, it seems like, uh, you know, prenatal visits are an ideal way to identify people in need of early intervention who might need um, some handholding to get the services that they ultimately require. And, I mean, that seems like that's got to be that. That seems an easy way to expand and maybe make sure people who need care get it. So, uh, Council Member uh, Cohen, we do have the Nurse Family Partnership at the Department of Health, uh, which does work with thousands of families at 26 weeks of uh, pregnancy. Um, to up to two years, uh, the, the uh, birthday, the two-year-old birthday of the, of the infant. So um, there is uh, that program and uh, has been continuing even despite the pandemic. Um, and so it who actually- Who makes the visits for the health department? Excuse me? Who makes the visits for the health department? Nurses, qualified nurses. So we actually have nurses within the health department that conducts those visits. We also contract with other organizations um, like Public Health Solutions, Visiting Nurse, nurse Service, um, and others to do that work as well. Do, do you know how many prenatal visits by nurses the health department made? Um, 
I mean, considering that we visit thousands of uh, women and families, um, it, I would say it's in the thousands. I don't have that number. I'm expired. I think that I think that would be helpful and and maybe tracking in, you know outcomes for people who've gotten those visits versus people who didn't get those visits might be very very helpful too. Well, we have that information. It, it actually is a very positive outcome to have a, a nurse family partnership or a newborn home visiting type of visit home visit in support of uh, pregnant and parenting uh, people. Uh, thank you very much, Cheers. Thank you for your testimony. This concludes council member questions. Are there any other council members that have questions for the administration or would the chairs like to ask additional questions? Chairs Rosenthal, Rivera and Levine. Thank you. I'd like to jump in uh, with a few more and first start by thanking council member Cohen for his um, interest in, and asking questions at this hearing. I wanna reiterate that the point of this hearing is accountability. The administration is in a position to address the disparity of mortality and morbidity between people of color and white women. And I understand that the numbers may be small. I understand that reimbursement is challenging, but the impact of prevention, the impact of better communication is so clearly uh, huge that uh, it explains the reason why we're, you know, we've had a hearing on this topic in the city council at least one a year. Um, I asked a couple of questions that I just want to see um, if you were able to get some information on. What are the hospitals that do not have midwifery services? I'm sorry, Chairperson Rosenthal, I do not have that information. Is it on the website of each of the hospitals? So if I did some detective work and went to, where, where could I find this information uh, online? Um, we should be able to get this to you um, soon. I just, I'm, I don't have it handy. Can you public access this information? I believe so. I believe on each hospital website, it does describe the types of services each department has. So they would be able to see that midwife is not listed. Is there, would, uh, if, if h and h is not planning on bringing midwifery services to those hospitals, would it consider uh, making a note on the websites where there are not midwifery services that explicitly they do not exist? Or do you plan on bringing midwifery services to all the hospitals? I'm, I'm not able to answer that at the time. However, I will, we will get a response to you. Okay, thank you. I heard uh, over and over you say that the lack of communication seems to be the main reason for uh, maternal mortality and morbidity. Did I hear you right? Yes, that, that is a major factor. Yeah, can you repeat the list that you identified, I just didn't get it in my notes, of communication between who and who is problematic? Well, predominantly communication between providers and the patient, uh, as well as uh, institutions and patients uh, are problematic. And so- um, Or can be problematic. Yeah, sure. Why not institute a simple checklist um, like the ones that surgeons use in the operating room? For example, at the beginning of a surgery, they check to make sure certain tools, equipment is there, or people are in the room, why not have a checklist like that that could be part of a medical record in your database? I'm sorry, Chair Rosenthal, is the question that there should be a checklist in no. providers' databases or? Yeah, I mean, why can't you have a checklist so that when anyone is in contact with the woman with the pregnant person, um, 
there's a checklist of what needs to be communicated or? When we do implicit bias training, um, we don't necessarily provide a checklist, but we do uh, because it's a very nuanced conversation. Uh, each person is unique. We do have uh, guidance and guidelines on how to assess one's own implicit bias or personal bias and how to counteract that and to, to recognize that prior to the conversation. So it's not so much of a, a checklist to ensure, um, you know, uh, a particular equipment is there, but rather to and to those biases and, and ensure that whatever the conversation, that there's a really keen um, sense of listening to what the patient is asking about, responding respectfully, um, communicating to the patient that they have rights and and uh, and that they should, you know, be active decision makers in their care. Okay, uh, there's a kernel of something in my question, but I'm not. Don't quite have it yet. I'm hearing what you're saying though, and I appreciate it. Um, let's see, is the funding for the Maternal Hospital Quality Improvement Network in next year's budget? It's still in discussion. Um, the, uh, unfortunately, I don't have additional information. I did ask my staff, um, but the discussions are ongoing regarding uh, future funds. And just to be clear, on the fact that it's an ongoing discussion, great. I'm glad you guys are pushing for it, but that means definitionally it's not in the budget for the next fiscal year. Is that accurate? I don't have that information, unfortunately. I don't know for certain. For the record, it's not in the budget for next year. Um, you mentioned that you would give me the names of the three hospitals that were in the pilot program. Can you do that publicly? I was not able to get that information as well, but I can get it to you. Okay. Is that information something you can share publicly or that I can share publicly after you send it over? You can say no, or you can say you're going to tell me yes or no when you share it with me, but I'm just wanting to know. Let me, uh, let me uh, share it with you either yes or no, once I know for certain. Gotcha. Um, you mentioned, I think, two categories of pregnancy, um, of maternal uh, deaths, uh, pregnancy related, and then pregnancy associated. Were you able to pull out those numbers for any of the prior years? No, that, I would have to follow up with you on that. That requires some, some uh, work. Uh, all right, thank you. I'm turning it back to uh, the moderator. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Rosenthal. Uh, Chair Rivera, or any other council members, do you have any questions? Chair Rivera? Oh, I'd like to move on to hear from participants. Thank you. Thank you so much. So I'll do one last call for council member questions. If there are any other council members that have questions, if you can please use the raise hand function. We are not seeing any other council member questions. So uh, Chair Rosenthal, we have concluded the administration's testimony and we will turn to public testimony and Chairs Rivera and Levine. If I could just jump in, if I could ask the administration to stay uh, on the Zoom, uh, you can turn off your videos if you want and just have it as background, uh, something to listen to. Uh, I think the stories we're about to hear are, are, are riveting uh, and, I, I, and important. Uh, so I would ask you to stay on. Thank you. Okay, thank you chairs. Uh, so with this, we will now move to the public testimony portion of our hearing. So thank you very much to the administration. First, I would like to remind everyone that individuals will be called up in panels. 
Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the raise hand function in Zoom to be called on. Um, and they will be called on in that order uh, that they have raised their hands after everyone on the panel has completed their testimony. For panelists, uh, please do not use the raise hand function. Uh, you will be called up in panels. Uh, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and you may begin your testimony. Once the Sergeant at Arms sets the clock and gives you the cue, all testimony will be limited to three minutes. Please note that there is a, uh, there is a few second delay when you are unmuted before we can hear you. And there is also a box that pops up and you need to accept the unmute option. Please wait for the Sergeant to announce that you may begin and start the clock before starting your testimony. The first panel today in order of speaking will be two individuals, Bruce McIntyre III and Nan Kululeko Tiahembu. Uh, we will start with Mr. McIntyre. So Mr. McIntyre, uh, if you are ready to begin, you may begin once the sergeant calls the clock. Thank you so much. Starting time. Thank you for having me. It's not gonna be a pleasant conversation. Um, so I just wanted to start off a little bit about Amber. So Amber had actually received her bachelor's degree in psychology in May, 2018. She wanted to introduce art therapy to the youth as a way uh, as the youth to express themselves. Um, also while pregnant, she was in a master's program um, for business development. She wanted to start an early life childhood program. Um, she would be walking here and receiving her master's this month. So my spouse and the mother of my, my son, Amber Rose Isaac, passed away on April 21st at 1236 a.m. at Montefiore Hospital in the Bronx. She received the same treatment from two different Montefiore facilities. Um, on, on, September 7, on September 21st, I'm sorry, 27th, we found out that we were having a baby at 7.44 in the morning, exactly. We were excited and ready to become a family and we planned this for months in advance. Um, we were excited to have this baby, but all of this excitement went out the window during our very first appointment with our OBGYN um, at Montefiore Moses. And it was just, it was really unsettling and it, and it drained the excitement out of the pregnancy I remember feeling judged after um, after our first visit because we were two black parents who were unmarried, um, but we had plans for marriage. Um, but yeah, I just remember feeling judged and um, by the OBGYN and she was just being mistreated by not only the doctor, not only the OBGYNs, but the staff of the facilities. Amber complained of the lack of communication between doctor's offices from the beginning of her pregnancy. Amber had uh, actually to get her mother involved on numerous occasions because her mother had been a long-term uh, employee with Montefiore for 25 years, 25 years. Amber's 26 years old. Amber's mother had called the, uh, the, the doctor's office more than once um, to speak on you know, the mistreatment of her daughter um, you know, luckily my job was lenient enough for me to take Amber to her appointments. Um, whenever I would take her to some of her appointments and we would get there, um, some of the appointments that she had scheduled were not appointments at all. Um, we would go and, and say that, oh, we have an appointment and they would tell us, oh, you have no appointment set for today. And then they would have to reschedule. Um, Amber was also an early life teacher. She taught in Harlem. She taught young, a group of young kids in Harlem. Uh, whenever the pandemic started to um, arise, right? You know, uh, some of these schools were some of the last facilities to shut down because they were trying to soak up as much Time money. Expired. Oh. Yeah, uh, this, uh, this panelist uh, can have as much time as he needs. Thank you, Sergeant. Thank you. Um, but yes, these schools were shutting down because of COVID. This was the last facility to shut down. Um, Amber, who is pregnant, right? And she's feeling these changes in her body. Her, her, she knows that her health is deteriorating. She's having troubles breathing um, as her platelet levels are, are deteriorating. But we don't know this at this time. She's constantly having to 
carry children up and down stairs in this condition. She's, she has to travel up and down stairs. She has to deal with children whom are coming to school sick with no doctor's note and the school is allowing this, right? So there are sick children who are rubbing their saliva on Amber, sneezing on Amber, coughing on Amber. Um, She voiced all of her concerns to her OBGYN because she felt like her safety and her health was at risk. She would express these to her OBGYN because she was trying to get early leave. She was due May 30th. May 30th was her due date. She wanted to leave in April. She wanted to have early dismissal for April because of her conditioning. She expressed these concerns to her OBGYN. She didn't feel safe. She couldn't breathe. It was really hard for her to breathe whenever she, she walked for a while. Um, she would have these pains in her legs. And instead of the OBGYN being attentive to Amber, she tells Amber, well, there are pregnant women who are squatting and lifting in this office. Why can't you do that at work? So on Amber's FMLA forms, the OBGYN stated that Amber wanted to leave for personal reasons. Personal reasons. Amber was denied, F was denied FMLA by HR at her job. We had to redo the whole process. We had to resubmit. This time we got Amber's mother involved yet again. And instead of the OBGYN then being attentive to her needs, she's more or less worried about who Amber's mother was and what her relationship is to Montefiore, right? And she tells Amber, well, the only way that you are going to get early leave from FMLA is if you see a high-risk doctor. That was the only time we were appointed to a high-risk doctor, not because her platelet levels were, were decreasing, not because her health was deteriorating, just to get the FMLA forms filled out. We um, also were trying to find her a new doctor as well. Um, we had to seek a high-risk doctor to fill out the FMLA forms that she wanted to, you know, she wanted to leave early. Um, and back in, in March, Right when, you know, the, the end of February, beginning of, I mean, end of March, I mean, uh, I'm sorry, the end of February coming into March, right? Telehealth was being introduced when Amber needed to be seen clearly. Telehealth was being introduced. And before, before her last appointment, um, we, we spoke to another OBGYN at the same facility, and she told Amber that um, that Amber's, uh, her, her iron was really low. So they prescribed her iron pills, right? They prescribed her iron pills, a blood pressure monitor, and told her to monitor herself. That they will follow up her follow up with her um, uh, every two weeks um, during the zoom meetings right and after facing so much neglect and so much incompetence through the telehealth program we decided that we wanted to hire midwives and doulas instead people that were going to be more attentive to amber's needs um, and we found a group right we sent over all of the information. We sent over all of Amber's health records, which took forever um, to get back because it wasn't on the um, my chart. It wasn't on my chart. It wasn't showing up. We finally get the records over to our midwife, right? And on April 3rd is when our midwife views it. And she is so confused to why Amber had not been receiving treatment 
and why she is being ignored and not being seen. We were denied a home birth due to Amber becoming high risk. We try to go get into a birthing center because we don't want to go to a hospital now because we've, we've dealt with the negligence. And these, these hospitals are being overwhelmed with COVID patients. So we're thinking, okay, maybe we can get into a birthing center. We were also denied into a birthing center. Even with Amber having exceptional insurance through the hospital, right? We were still gonna have to pay about four grand out of pocket for a, a home birth. And we were willing to do it. We were willing to spend our hard earned money to get the care that Amber needed. After previous visits, right? The OBGYN, the Amber's um, visits with the OBGYN Amber's platelets were dropping without her knowledge since December of 2019, since before COVID, since before COVID was announced. Then we had to find another high-risk doctor. We, this time we went through Amber's mother's job. We went to the facility that she worked at because they had everything set up for us. They knew about our situation. They were going to take good care of, of Amber. They assured her mother they were gonna take good care of her. That was a lie. Amber never even got to meet her high-risk OBGYN due to the first appointment being canceled. The doctor was, uh, the, there was a subsequent appointment by phone and orders for blood were not given until April 10th. After receiving those results, right? The doctor calls Amber and they tell her your platelet levels are dropping and that she was concerned about her liver enzymes as well. And the doctor told Amber to go to the following um, appointment on April 17th, right? We went in on April 17th to get blood work drawn for Amber. The orders weren't in the system from April 10th. Amber had to call the doctor's office to let them know that the staff tried to locate the OBGYN or another physician to call to input the order. Amber waited for over two hours and nothing was done. I took her back home, brought her back once they got everything collected. And yet again, Amber's mother had to reach out to somebody to reach out to somebody to reach out to us. The OBGYN's neglect, as well as the high-risk doctor. A few minutes after Amber had received the call from the high-risk doctor apologizing um, said that she didn't know why that the orders why the orders weren't in the system and doesn't know why the lab staff didn't call her. Um, she gave her Amber's personal cell phone number and instructed her to go back, right? That's when Amber left her last tweet that gained national attention on April 17th when she stated that she wanted to write a tell-all about the incompetence and the negligence that she was facing from both Montefiore facilities, Montefiore Moses and Montefiore Einstein. They called us the very next day, April 18th, told us that we have to go in immediately for treatment. We're thinking that we're gonna be in there for treatment um, and that they were gonna raise her platelets. That couple of hour visit turned into, okay, she needs to be here for a day. Okay, she needs to be here all weekend. On April 20th, Amber calls me after being in the hospital all weekend. She's telling me that they're going to induce her labor. Knowing that her platelet levels are at a dangerous level. They were going to induce her labor. 
She called me to the hospital. I was allowed to come up finally after taking my COVID test. She was tested for, for COVID twice, came back negative. They didn't, they didn't understand what was going on with her and why her platelets were deteriorating. They later found out that it was HELP syndrome, H-E-L-L-P syndrome, which is a series of high blood pressure during pregnancy, hemolysis, elevated liver enzymes, low platelet count, HELP syndrome. And HELP syndrome usually develops in the, the third trimester, but many women are diagnosed with preeclampsia beforehand, right? One out of two women are developed um, to have HELP syndrome out of 1,000 pregnancies. Mortality rate on that is 100% preventable. If treated early, they had plenty of time to treat this. They had plenty of time to catch this and they didn't until the day that they decided to induce her labor, right? With her platelets being dangerously low, they came back to us with the options for a cesarean. Said that they needed to perform a C-section on her immediately. That the baby was not handling the contractions well and she was only dilated by two centimeters. They didn't give her enough time. I was supposed to be there for a day or two. I was with Amber in that room for maybe a couple of hours before they made that decision. With her platelet levels being so low, they still decided that they wanted to do, perform a cesarean on her. Her blood at this point was like water. Her blood was unable to clot. We're asking these doctors, do you have everything? Are you guys prepared? Are you guys ready for her? They're assuring us they have everything prepared for her in that room. That was a lie. They're telling, the nurses are telling me not to come too close to Amber because of COVID. They don't know who has COVID at this point. They don't even know if the nurses have COVID because the nurses weren't being tested. That was very unsettling for Amber and I. The last thing that Amber says to me is all three of us are going home. We're all three going home after this. That was the last time I seen Amber alive. As soon as they cut her open, her heart stopped immediately and she started to bleed out. I'm asking nurses what's going on because I'm supposed to be waiting. They told me it's gonna be quick. I'll be waiting in the room for 20 minutes. She'll be right back. I was waiting for hours. No doctor was telling me what was going on. I asked numerous of times. It took a black nurse, a black head nurse to answer some of my questions and she didn't, she didn't even want to. I'm asking them, well, you guys just, she has low platelets and you guys cut her open. Did you guys at least sew, sew her back up after the C-section? No, they didn't. They had to cut open her chest and massage her heart manually. So they cut her open twice with low platelets. I asked them, well, did you sew her back up after that? No, they didn't. They didn't know or understand where the bleeding was coming from. So they performed a hysterectomy on Amber and they took out her uterus, which was very disheartening to me because Amber and I had plans to have another child in a year or two. After everything said and done, the doctors are leaving the room. Black doctors are, are, are standing in the hallway with this look on their face with this disgust on their face that they can't believe what just happened. And they're staring at me in the hallway and they look like they have to tell me something, but they can't. Meanwhile, there are white, there are white doctors who are coming out 
and they're patting me on my back. You're going to be fine. You're going to be okay. You're going to be fine. And if I can just double back to when Amber was trying to get her FMLA in early, early leave. Amber was due May 30th. They induced her labor April, April 21st. She wanted to leave in April. There were white women who were due after Amber who were getting early FMLA, but Amber was not. And that's something that I cannot understand. They didn't know Amber had help syndrome this whole time since December. They had plenty of time to treat her condition, which they did not. And you would think, you would think my trauma is going to stop there, but no. My trauma doesn't stop there. As a COVID response, these hospitals were leaving death certificates blank. Blank. As a COVID response, they tell me. Under the section of the death certificate where Amber's mother's name is supposed to be, who had been a long-term employee for 25 years, they left Amber's mother's name blank. For the father of the child, which they knew who I was, which was the only reason why they let me upstairs during COVID times. They left my name blank. They left the location for Amber to go to Heart Island to be dumped with the rest of the COVID patients. If I wouldn't have took affirmative action then, Amber's body would have been thrown in the back of an ice truck and she would have been buried with COVID patients, even though she did not have COVID. You think my, you think my trauma ends there and it doesn't, unfortunately. Because also during these times, funeral homes aren't accepting patients for the next four to five months. I had to figure that out. Do you think that this hospital that killed Amber paid a penny, a penny towards funeral expenses? I had to come up with funeral expenses. During COVID times, I had to come up with funeral expenses through crowdfunding. Then you would think my trauma is gonna end there. <laughs> no, no. The hospital was not trying to allow me to check my own son out because Amber and I were unmarried And by law, they could not release my son to me because Amber was no longer alive to contest that I was the father of my child, even though she was before she was alive. The hospital then told me to fill out these forms, send it to this address, You'll be fine. You'll be taken care of. Your name will be on the birth certificate. I did, yet again, exactly what the hospital had asked me to do. I had received a letter two months ago denying my request, saying that I have to take it to family court, which was closed due to COVID. And that's what I'm still fighting for till this day. Till this day, I'm still fighting for that. <sighs> Sorry, y'all. In, in, in less than eight months, this happened less than eight months ago. I've had to become a, a doctor. I've had to become a birth worker, a maternal health activist, 
a community leader, a politician, all while fathering a son whom will never get to see his mother. Why is it that I have to do all of this research? I don't even have time to grieve. Why, do, why is it that I have to do all of this research, right, to help create bills on how our government should already be treating us? Why do we have to pass a bill for this? From the collections of studying that I've done, around the US, right? Every year in the US, 700 to 900 women are dying due to pregnancy-related complications. Our maternal mortality rate is higher than any higher income country, but yet we are paying the most in healthcare today. The maternal mortality rate has increased in the past decade, while other countries have managed to reduce their rates but yeah, like I said, yet again, we're still paying the most in healthcare. And I'm pretty sure that a good majority of you doctors in this room know what's killing these mothers. And if you don't, it's cardiovascular disease, high blood pressure causing seizures or strokes, blood clots or infections, preeclampsia, help, help syndrome. These are some of the, the leading causes in maternal mortality, including incompetence, negligence, insubordination, and lack of moral value, right? So that means for every death, for every death, right? 100 women suffer from severe complications related to, to pregnancy and, and childbirth resulting in over 60,000 women every year developing one of these conditions. Maternal mortality is still on the rise here in the US and these are life altering changes. It's estimated that between 1.5 to 2% of 4, of 4 million deliveries that occur every single year in this country are associated with one of these events. So that's five to six women every hour having a blood clot, a seizure, a stroke, receiving blood transfusion or end organ damage such as kidney failure, right? The most unforgivable part about this, right, is over 60% of these complications are deemed to be preventable. That's more than half we're talking about. I keep hearing all these, these talks about budgets and you don't need that. There are concrete steps and standard procedures that can be implemented that could prevent these outcomes and save lives. You don't need new fancy machines or budget cuts to prevent these outcomes from happening. You just have to ensure equal standard of care between hospitals. You have to value the quality of care for pregnant women before, during, and after pregnancy, which is what some of the, which is what midwifery and doula associations are about. That's what they do. The Insurers should have more payout options for home births. They should have more payout options for home births, um, just like they do for these hospitals. We need to make midwifery and doula services more accessible and more affordable to the people of our communities. And since that hasn't happened, we took the initiative ourselves, right? And we created the Amber Rose Isaac Access to Home Birth Scholarship Program, which, off, which offsets the cost of insurance premiums and covers what insurance does not. We've been able to help 16 families thus far with this program. And most of these women do have government assisted insurance. These women are scared to go into these institutionalized hospitals with these doctors. So why not put them in the hands of the people who are going to be more attentive to our family's needs? I've been working with a collective on bringing a freestanding midwifery led birthing center to the Bronx as well. I'm a part of that efforts. 
the reason why I jumped into that, right, is because the Bronx has the highest C-section rate in New York City. Mind you, over these over 60% of these women don't need cesareans. They don't need it. And I think it's no secret that these hospitals within these underprivileged families, within these other underprivileged communities are being underfunded, right? Giving me the reason to insinuate that these hospitals are putting profit over people, securing an extra, let's say, I, I believe it's around $8,000 for a C-section versus a natural birth. Over 60% of these women are getting C-sections. They are securing an extra $8,000 per C-section to, I guess, substitute for these, these, these budget cuts, right? So this crisis has actually been going on long before me, but I do, I do believe that midwifery and doula associations are key solutions to better birthing outcomes as they provide care before, during, and after pregnancy, meeting mothers and family tailored needs. We need to redirect the course of birthing equity by passing the New York Health Act as the start of this change, right? After advocating and, and gaining national attention, Am, uh, Andrew Cuomo was very much aware of Amber's situation. He actually mentioned her situation um, without having to mention her name and said that his maternal task force was on it. Where are they at? We've seen nothing. In fact, Mr. Cuomo's father was dealing with the same accusations when it came to turning a blind eye to maternal health. This, if this matter is going to continue being ignored further, then there needs to be a public service announcement stating while black, brown and indigenous families within our communities cannot be prioritized by our government elected officials whom we are paying for their chair to protect us. This is a clear biased agenda that's infiltrating our civil and human rights and it needs to be addressed not sooner than later, but it needs to be addressed now. And that's all I have for you. Thank you guys so much. Mr. McIntyre. I have no words. <sighs> this committee sees you, we hear you, respect you. And we want to be with you. It is very difficult to move on, but I fear we have to. You have answered every single question. You have hit on every single point that is worth talking about. You have become an expert when you shouldn't have to be, but you have. Thank you, thank you. We're honored that you testified today. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, and of course I offer my condolences and I'm so, so sorry for your loss. Um, my guess is that for litigious reasons, the system doesn't apologize to you. It's ridiculous. I'm so, so sorry for your loss. Thank you, thank you. But I have started the Saber Rose Foundation yeah. in, in honor of Amber, and we have been dismantling the systemic flaws within the healthcare system, and we've been redirecting the way um, birthing equity should be directed as well. I've worked with 
numerous offices, including Kamala Harris's office, um, mm -hmm. Underwood's office, and plenty, plenty more politicians, and been helping com uh, families within our communities, all in her honor because she deserved, mm -hmm. it. and she was an excellent woman who didn't deserve this at all. She mm -hmm. had so much to offer the world. And she was cut short. You have carried on her memory so respectfully and beautifully. I see Council Member Barron has her hand raised. I, I want to recognize her. If the pan if the moderator could thank you. Chair Barron. Barron. Council Member yeah. Barron. Council Member Barron. Starting time. Thank you. And I'm going to be brief. I just want to say um, we extend our condolences. You should not have had to endure what happened. We have our prayers for you and your family and for your beautiful child. And I just want to commend you for the strength during this time of grieving to step forward and to step up and to say, I'm going to take action so that others don't suffer what it is that I've suffered. And that's all that I'm going to be able to say, but just to commend you and to support you as you go forward. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm going to turn it back to the moderator. Thank you so much, Chair Rosenthal. Uh, we have one other person on this panel and I'll read that person's name now. It's Nan Kululeko Tiahembe. Ms. Tiahembe, please apologize, uh, accept my apologies for any pronunciation. Um, when the sergeant calls the clock, you may begin your testimony. Starting time. The, wit the witness is still muted. It might take just a minute. It, okay, you should be unmuted. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Good afternoon uh, to all. My name is Nun Kululaiko Kayahemba and I'm a certified nurse midwife who lives and works in the Harlem community. Um, I'm also a laid off midwife who worked at one of the hospitals in, of the New York City Health and Hospital Corporation who no longer have midwives to service the women in our community. Uh, from my written statement, I would like to state uh, but I was one of the founders of the Harlem Birth Action Committee, an organization that seeks to empower women uh, and their families through education and information. In 1989, our organization was founded because of our concern with the high infant mortality rates that existed in our community um, at, at that particular time. In the 1990s, we became an intimate part of the pre perinatal networks that led to Healthy, Healthy Start programs and other uh, groups, which vigorously fought to reduce the health crisis uh, to some success. In the last 20 years though, the rate of maternal mortality and maternal, maternal morbidity have reached, as we know, pronounced and egregious uh, levels in our community, our city, and our nation. This year, for example, the at least four to five known healthy black mothers have died before birth or shortly after birth um, due to pregnancy, pregnancy childbirth related complications. We can only guess though the number of unknown mothers who have died or developed some preventable complication. When the tennis champion, uh, Serena Williams spoke out about the, the medical emergency she endured after the birth of her child in 2017, that could have led to her death. Uh, and she suffered the psychological trauma as she stated uh, as a result. Um, and that led to a a continued long overdue debate on the dismal rate of maternal death and injury 
in our country, as well as the ways of, of that women and people of color bear the brunt of subpar care. Studies have indicated that over 60% of these tragedies did not have to occur. Many investigators are stating that some of these extremely harmful results happen because birthing mothers and their That's companions right. are not being listened to. Um, we need, and at the same time, I wanted to say, and I'll try to uh, finish very quickly, at the same time, the rates of defensive obstetrical interventions that lead to a cascade of operative events have increased astronomically. For example, one out of every three women uh, are having unnecessary C-sections, despite the guidelines by the World Health Organization that the rate should be no more than 15%. Nationwide, we were at 35%, over 90% of first time mothers have episiotomies that a large number do not need to have. Don't even mention the number of women who are having epidurals, uh, unnecessary, sometimes inductions um, uh, that far exceed the, 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 the need. We, we need a revolution, not, not of guns, but of minds. Um, we need a new paradigm of reproductive justice healthcare. We need it right now. We need to increase the number of midwives attending um, our, 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 our mothers, our families. We need, we need to demand more midwives in our hospitals, particularly those three hospitals that do not have any midwives at all. Because I, I, I work for one of them, so I, I, I do, have an understanding of, 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 of the situation. We need to emphasize, prioritize, and educate more midwives in our communities, um, particularly in hospital and community settings. We need to adopt a model of care where midwives are prioritized for low-risk mothers and parents. Uh, midwives tend to focus on the physiological management of birthing. And if midwives are good for the royal family of England, they are good for us in, 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 our, in, our, in our community. Despite the government's tax force on internal health care and this organization and that organization and the time that's necessary to um, change, uh, the tragedies are continuing. Women are they're, women are dying. They're dying or they're, they're having these pregnancy complications that are overlooked because they're not listening for some reason. Is it racism? Is it bias? And how many trainings are we gonna have to have to change the system? We're in the year 2021 now. And you know, back in 1920, uh, more than a hundred years ago, which is even further than that, there was a, 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 a definite campaign to get rid of midwives. They, they, were called, they were called ignorant, they were called illiterate, they were called dirty. They, 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 it was a, a, a structural campaign to get rid of them. And, and, and they have, they blame midwives for everything. We need more midwives in, in, in our communities. And until we do get them, this, it's gonna continue. We're gonna to continue to have these tragedies over and over again. And I feel for you, brother, brother Bruce McIntyre. You, you, I, 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 I'm in tears because I see it and I hear it. Not only that, the mothers, the, they're, they're fearful of going to the hospitals. Some of them just the other day told me they're thinking that they're having free births. They're gonna have their own uh, uh, unassisted burst at home because they're afraid to go to these hospitals. They are isolated and, and they're in fear. They have to submit to all types of unnatural physiological ways of giving birth. They're in bed, they have, they, they're not giving their, their IVs, go on the bed left and right and they're 
made to give birth in positions that are totally, totally not right. We need a change. We need a revolution. And until we get it, this is going to have hearing after hearing, death after death. The women, the, the people, we're, we're, we're scared to death. So uh, with that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end. But um, I, thank, I thank the committee. I thank the chair. I thank all of you. And I'm, I'm, I'm so impressed with the, um, the, the passion that I'm, that I'm listening to. But we have to be honest. We have to really be honest and not say, oh, my job, oh, I can't say this. Oh, I don't know that. Just say it. Let's, let's, make, a, let's make a change now. Thank you so much for listening to me. You know, Ms. Tayemba, thank you for your passion. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to say something explicitly that you alluded to. Uh, so my guess is it's the uh, as, uh, association of uh, abstract, ab, ab, obstetrical, gosh, I'm so like blown away, my brain is dead, uh, physicians, obstetricians, that it's their association that has led to the demise of midwifery. Yes, exactly so. With and that James, I'm sorry. Excuse no, me. no, you go. With that uh, James Marion Sims. Yeah. Uh, who uh, be even became the first president of the American Medical Association. I mean, come on, please. Uh, we, you know, for our, for our parents, our families, our communities are being separated. They're, they, someone don't, some don't have a, a, a mother's to take care of their their their, their babies uh, and so forth, we need we need a change. Uh, uh, I see it, and that women. I I I'm in the community a lot more, um, and women come to me and we talk about. They are scared. They are scared to death. And furthermore, uh, studies have indicated too that some of these deaths that could be be prevented are due to lack of information. Yeah. Uh, lack of education. They don't know. They're not told. They don't know what their rights are. What the reason, what, what, they don't know what their options are as well. Right. You can't ask the question if you don't know that there are options, that there is information out there. And to that point, at our 2018 hearing, it, we were uh, led to understand that there was a new uh, pamphlet that was going to be distributed to every uh, incoming um, pregnant person, you know, know your rights as yes. a pregnant person. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm guessing that Mr. McIntyre did not receive that pamphlet, nor did his girlfriend. Am I right? Yeah. And that was supposed to go to everyone. So the pamphlets even exist and they're not distributed. We need a new paradigm of not only birthing, we need a new paradigm of prenatal care. We yeah. need, yes, we do need centering. We need when people come to the to the to the clinical so have have food for them, provide nourishment for the mothers, provide yeah. a provide a block by block a B6 birth, better birth block by block reproductive health model to directly reach our community block by block. If there's additional information you'd like to submit for your testimony, please feel free to do so. Information Thank about you. programs, et cetera. Um, you know, it is definitely the case that the medical institutions led by males intentionally uh, want birth to happen at their convenience. And you're right to mention, even the royals get a midwife, it's because in England they have the history 
and the confidence in midwives. Yes. And of course, there's the wonderful TV show called Midwives that everyone should watch about uh, um, women who, who are midwives in England and know and have the passion for their, uh, I'm not even gonna say patience, for their pregnant people that they take care of. I wanna honor you for your work. Um, and, and I guess turn it back to the moderator, but thank you so much for being here, for testifying, for your expertise and your passion for what you do for the community. Really bless you. Thank you, thank you, Chairman Rosenthal. Thank you so much, Chair Rosenthal, and to the panel. Um, before we move to our second panel, I just wanted to check if there are any council members that have additional questions for this panel. Not seeing any council members at this time. The raised hands, we will move to the next panel. Uh, so the next panel, panel two, I will read the names of the panelists and then call you individually. The first panelist is Lorraine Ryan followed by Emily Frankel, followed by Miriam Mohammed Miller. Lorraine Ryan, when you are ready, um, you may begin once the sergeant starts the clock. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, good afternoon, Teres Rivera, Levine and Rosenthal and members of the Committee on Hospitals, the Committee on Health and the Committee on Women and Gender Equity. Um, as you heard, my name is Lorraine Ryan. I'm a um, senior vice president at the Greater New York Hospital Association. And for more than a decade and a half, in my responsibilities of hospital and healthcare quality improvement, I have focused very deliberatively on maternal health and equity <laughs> um, and improvement efforts, if you will. I have comprehensive prepared remarks that you, you have in hand, but I'm gonna go off script because I can't possibly be considered um, credible without responding to some of what I've heard today. And I would also like to offer my sincere condolences to Mr. McIntyre. He's very courageous and I can't imagine what it took for you to speak to us today. And also more importantly, to endure what you've endured in terms of the tremendous loss. And you'll be an amazing parent because you have such compassion and wisdom and you're channeling your grief in all the right directions. So I can't say enough about what I think about you <laughs> and we've just met <laughs> and virtually. Um, I think I could best use my time and I'm sorry, but there's noise outside of my home. I hope you're not hearing that. <laughs> Is that coming through a little bit? No worries, keep going. I'll try my best. Um, to address some of the questions that were raised that I don't think were answered um, adequately. Um, I'm gonna start with doulas because there's been outreach to Greater New York and to me personally several times um, since the beginning of the pandemic. And I appreciate that outreach because it gives me as a representative of the hospitals an opportunity to address challenging issues and issues that might not be communicated effectively um, or totally or um, in a way that is leading to a constructive end. Um, but we know that there's been challenges to um, doula's access to patients. And uh, through Melissa DeRosa, the governor's task force on COVID um, maternal well being and care and disparities in care, back in April, doulas were added to the list of those who could visit um, and be present as a support person, in addition to a significant other in the hospital throughout labor, delivery, and postpartum. Um, apparently, there are still some issues with that that we're trying to tackle, and Greater New York has agreed to host a forum with all the New York City hospitals um, and the doula community to discuss those challenges. There are things we can't fix. Two bedded rooms are two bedded rooms. Social distancing is not something that we can create overnight, but we're working to find adequate space so that a patient who chooses to have a doula present as an important support through one of life's most challenging and yet rewarding and, and gives you an amazing feeling to become a parent experience. So we're working on that. Um, There's a uh, as a representative of the Greater New York Hospital Association, I'd like you to continue on. Um, okay, I will. Thank I will. You. 
Um, related to the, to the doula issues are testing and visitation. And the New York State Department of Health um, has been iterative in a very positive way about visitation policies. I can't believe I've been here all morning and now they decide to make noise outside. I'm sorry, can you hear me okay? I don't wanna be disruptive, okay. So with regard to visitation in the very early stages in March when COVID was presenting itself, all visitation was shut down. Within days, it was opened up to obstetrical patients because of the realization that you can't take away that once in a lifetime experience um, of becoming a parent for a significant other. Um, shortly thereafter that, in April, um, after deliberations of the task force on COVID related um, obstetrical care, visitation was expanded to allow not only the significant other or partner, but a doula as well. So I think we have been responsive, maybe not always in the time that uh, certain patients could have benefited from that presence, but the state has been responsive and I think we'll believe the hospital community has followed suit. Another recommendation out of the task force on COVID and obstetrical care was testing. And just last week, the Department of Health issued testing guidance for all pregnant persons. In fact, they're very specific that universal testing of all pregnant individuals during pregnancy and within one week prior to the estimated due date or upon admission, if a second test is not conducted one week prior, is to be undertaken. There's a second recommendation um, as increasing testing availability presents itself, support persons may also be tested. This could potentially also include a doula. So we are responding and you know it probably takes more to move an entire state in the direction of public policy than any one of us would like, but I think we're getting there. The other issue um, is visitation. And as I mentioned, I actually I've already covered that. And even with visitation shutting down for all the other patients except four categories of patients with obstetrics, visitation has always been permitted. Um, there are a myriad of quality improvement initiatives that you've heard referenced today that Greater New York and its hospitals, um, along with the Department, State Department of Health and the city as well, have been engaged in with our hospitals. Anything from reducing through the Safe Motherhood Initiative, complications from hemorrhage, hypertension, venous thromboembolism, a new focus on opiate use disorder and neonatal abstinence syndrome. Um, there are a number of initiatives, but none of them are getting where we wanna go as fast as we wanna get there, but it takes time. And I think we have to recognize the challenge of the day. We're still in a pandemic. We have hospitals that are shutting down visitation in high infectivity zones across the state, except for obstetrics, pediatrics, and two other categories of patients. So we are sensitive where the need is the greatest to ensure that someone has a support person. With regard to doulas, I just wanna mention that there was a state pilot in Erie County, as well as Brooklyn, New York. The Erie County pilot, and this was started um, as part of the governor's task force recommendations from 2018. There haven't been enough doulas signing up for the pilot in Brooklyn. A lot of it could have to do with reimbursement, is not adequate. Um, we are pushing for Medicaid reimbursement for doulas. We're also looking at how doulas through a managed care plan can be onboarded and become part of that insurance plan. So these are not solutions that are here today, but there are solutions that are being contemplated and pushed forward. Um, health equity. We're all learning the difference between equality and equity. Ms. Ryan, could you, I, someone just uh, flag something just real quickly. What did you just say about doulas? As part of the governor's um, task force from 2018, one of the many recommendations was to expand doula programs. Yes. There was a doula pilot program in both Erie County and Brooklyn. Yes. To the best of my knowledge, the one in Brooklyn has not been as well subscribed, if you will, by doulas. I don't know why. I You're don't know if it's- doulas didn't sign up. Not enough have signed up. Yes, exactly. And it could be because of the reimbursement rate, which I know in the early deliberations was not considered adequate by the doulas, but it was a pilot and I see heads that are nodding. Um, so we're looking or this, a way to sort of potentially address that is through Medicaid managed care plans. I can't say that 
it's going to be adequate, but it could be something that could promote more doula interest, um, at least in that pilot. Um, as you know, most doulas come to patients on their own. They're paid out of pocket by the patient. They don't come through insurance plans, but that's something that potentially we need to contemplate um, as a state in terms of getting appropriate reimbursement. I just wanted to clarify that, make sure for the record that you weren't blaming doulas for not signing up, that you- I'm not blaming anybody for anything. I'm trying to just give you what I've been told are the facts. Yeah, I guess, listen, I hear your passion. I mean, if there's more that you want to share, I, but I'd like to get to the heart of this. Um, I hear your passion, Ms. Ryan, but uh, obviously we're nowhere. Uh, and so what I want to know is in your 15 years at the Greater New York Hospital Association, what have been the challenges you faced? Because I'm sure you have pushed for this, but what are the actual barriers to getting this done? I will tell you, I mean, I have a couple of answers to that. Um, the science of quality improvement needs to be applied um, in all facets. You can't just, you know, look at a problem and look at the outcomes you're getting without understanding the root causes. And what are the root causes of those challenges that are leading to negative outcomes? So we've tried to do that. And I mentioned earlier working with the State Department of Health, with the city, um, with ACOG. You, the clinicians need to be involved. We've looked at how do we identify the root causes. And you've heard earlier in the maternal mortality review process, it's a long protracted process. It doesn't happen overnight. I'm getting there. I'm getting there. Communication. Communication is huge. We've heard it on this uh, hearing several from several different places. So you places. knew that 15 years ago. So what's the problem with uh, fixing the communication problem? You can't tell me that you're just learning from this hearing communication. No, no, I'm not saying that at all. Please, I, you know, I'm trying to be as, as from the Greater New York uh, Hospital Association. Yeah. I think we learned a lot. A year and a hospitals throughout New York City, which you know, if we want to hold people accountable, I want to hear about your association holding the hospitals accountable. So what what you've learned, and I want to know from you with your passion, what are the hurdles to getting this done? We're not talking about rocket science. I, I actually beg to differ. It's very complicated. And I think you've heard about structural racism being a component. It, we, as a hospital, provide care in the outpatient setting and the inpatient setting. But there are other aspects of someone's so, life so and, the and how they live their lives. Hospital, that, that, the president of any hospital sets the tone, right, for the hospital. The head of any institution does that. The guiding philosophy of the president of a hospital sets the tone. So, so what kind of uh, implicit and explicit bias training have we been doing for hospital presidents? This is an agenda item on our board. Almost every meeting, we discuss this. Greater New York is supporting implicit bias training for hundreds of staff, upwards of I don't want to say how many because I, I don't know the exact number on its own to bring, the, I, I started with communication and I got a little bit sidetracked. We heard from a listening tour that the state commissioner of health took about a year and a half ago, pre COVID around the state, listening to women in minority communities voice what they felt were the problems and the issues of not being heard. And implicit bias was clearly one that came through. Through that, there are many different avenues now of implicit bias training, health equity conferences um, that are taking place. It doesn't happen overnight. It doesn't mean a CEO is not committed, but one person can't change societal challenges. This is more than what's happening in a hospital. This is what's happening with regard to food insecurity with insecure housing I, options. I, I just, I need you to know that my blood is boiling my blood is boiling. Well, I'm sorry. That I, I, I just can't imagine the people over the last 
decade who, who has had somebody in their life died because talking about and training hospital presidents on implicit and explicit bias is hard. That is not what I said. Oh, that oh, is not okay, what I said. Let me clarify, because I got to tell you, uh, it's not going well. I, I've, I'm very upset. So sorry, now I will control my feelings. But to hear that, <sighs> please continue. What I said to you was, it's an agenda item because it's important for hospitals to address the needs and the challenges that implicit bias can present. I did not say that we are training hospital CEOs on implicit bias. We're training oh, caregivers. You know, I, I feel like I, <laughs> whether I, I, I wanted to share the positives of what hospitals are trying to do and our great concern, our gravest concern with any morbidity and mortality related to obstetrical care and really, maternity services. I, I'm, uh, well, I just wanna share with you that it's not enough. It's not even close to being enough. The fact that it's an agenda item for years. So it's an, if it's an agenda item- I think you're using, you know, I, I kind of wish you wouldn't take such offense to maybe language that isn't communicating effectively on my part, that this is a very serious issue. It's taken very seriously. We have presidents of hospitals who are minorities themselves, who are a big part of us attempting to dissect in a meaningful way what we can do as a healthcare community. But we are part of the healthcare community. The hospital isn't the, solo, the sole provider of services or can't impact all of the other life events, if you will, or as I mentioned earlier, societal issues. We believe healthcare is a human right, that everyone should benefit from all that that can bring in a positive way. And we need to do better. I agreed with that from the get-go. Every death is a tragedy. Every preventable death is, is, hard, is just unspeakable. And hospitals are working to get us to a better place that we all need to go to as a society. So and we also have to fund the care appropriately. Is to lower your cesarean rates, to intentionally yep. bring in midwives and doulas. And we're just from this hearing, we're seeing that's not happening, you know? And then to blame it on reimbursement rates is, is uh, a reflection of racism. You, you, you either believe in doulas and midwives changing outcomes or you don't. You either, you know, want, as, as Mr. McIntyre said, you know, a reimbursement rate, I understand about hospitals and, and, and living on the edge. I mean, my goodness, you know, how, why not, you know, if I, gosh. I, I, I mean, I, I, you know, I wish you wouldn't take everything doula, I said as, as an attack. The cost of a doula is, is spitting money compared to what hospital presidents are paid. You know, if, if, hospital, if the hospital presidents across the city would agree to reduce their salaries by $50,000 and put that money to having doulas attend births or a midwife at every hospital to attend a birth, they need, the obstetricians need to step out of the room. If we believe in this, if we believe that every death is a problem, show it, show it personally. I want to see a hospital president announce that they are reducing their own salary and putting that money toward midwives and doulas because we know the cost of midwives and doulas in the context of a hospital is spitting money. And the impact it'll have on all the future Mr. McIntyres is life and death. 
Yeah, I would like to sort of end, and I'm sure you want to move on with on a positive note that we look forward to working with the doulas and bringing them together with the city hospitals and um, midwives as well. When you we say have, city hospitals, you don't just mean H those in New York City, those in New York all City, New York all city. hospitals in New York like City, including Mount Sinai that just closed. All its hospitals, all hospitals, in, all hospitals in New York City. They're all our members. They will all be invited to participate and have a dialogue and get to a more constructive relationship that promotes what a patient might choose. Um, for their birth experience. As a hospital association, did you put out a statement when Mount Sinai closed the Mount Sinai West Birthing Center? We did not. And uh, you have to, <laughs> no, we did not. I'm gonna turn it back to the moderator. Thank you, Chair Rosenthal. Uh, we'll move to the next panelist at this time. We have Emily Frankel. Ms. Frankel, you may begin once the once the sergeant sets the clock. Time begins now. Before I begin my testimony, I would just like to say that my heart goes out to Bruce McIntyre and his entire family for the loss of Amber Rose Isaac. I'm so sorry for your loss. I was personally moved um, by your words and um, thank you for your advocacy, and I look forward to potentially working with you in the best way I can. My name is Emily Frankel, and I'm the Government Affairs Manager for Nurse Family Partnership. Thank you for this opportunity. Since I have a limited amount of time, I'm just going to try to summarize my testimony as best I can. Our nurses are on the front lines of prevention efforts aimed at reducing maternal mortality and achieving better pregnancy and birth outcomes. Nurse Family Partnership is an evidence-based community health program that helps transform the lives of low-income mothers who are pregnant with their first child. Each first-time mother is partnered with a specially trained registered nurse early in her pregnancy and receives regular ongoing nurse home visits that continue through her child's second birthday. Our nurses help clients achieve healthier pregnancies and births, stronger child development, and a path towards economic self-sufficiency. This is accomplished through the provision of health education and guidance, care coordinate, care coordinate, excuse me, care coordinate, coordinateization, as well as preventive services to NFP moms and their children. Families served by NFP experienced the following improvements in maternal health: 35% fewer cases of pregnancy-induced hypertension and 31% reduction in very close, closely spaced subsequent pregnancies, as well as a reduction in preterm births. Since 2003, NFP has served over 16,400 families across all five boroughs through its five network partners, the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, Montefiore Home Care, Public Health Solutions, SEO Family of Services, and the Visiting Nurse Service of New York. New York City NFP is currently funded to serve 2,985 families annually. A portion of this funding is baseline to the New York City budget. We thank the city council, the office of the mayor and DOHMH for their support. NFP plays a vital role in identifying and mitigating the risk factors that can lead to maternal mortality and morbidity. NFP nurses use their clinical ex expertise and assessment skills to understand the strengths and risks that mothers have experienced in their lifetime that may impact their health and their children's health. NFP nurses identify early warning signs of health problems during pregnancy, postpartum, infancy, and early childhood that can lead to adverse outcomes, even death. For example, during her last in-person home visit prior to the pandemic, a 17-year-old Bronx mom was complaining of some preeclamptic symptoms. The NFP nurse took her blood pressure and noted that it was in the severe range. The nurse urged the mom to go to the hospital to be evaluated and consulted her obstetrician who agreed. The mom went to the hospital and was found Atlantic. May I continue? Another minute, sure. Thank you. Was found to be preeclamptic and her labor was induced. Following her discharge from the hospital, the mom received a telehealth visit from the NFP nurse. While conducting her assessment, the nurse identified symptoms consistent with postpartum preeclampsia. The nurse encouraged the mom to contact her obstetrician. As a result, the mom was able to get a blood pressure machine that same day. 
Once the machine was delivered, the NFP nurse conducted a telehealth visit to teach the mom how to use the device and educated her about the signs and warning symptoms associated with elevated blood pressure. When the mom found that her blood pressure was too high, she was reluctant to return to the hospital for treatment due to fear of COVID-19 exposure. So the nurse encouraged the mom to see her doctor and she did. The NFP nurse was with the mom every step of the way. The life of this mom and her baby were saved because she had an NFP nurse with the experience, clinical reasoning, and specialized training to assist her at critical moments during her pregnancy and in the postpartum period. Our nurses provide guidance and support to the mother as, the, as she learns how to navigate the healthcare system for herself and her child. This is really important considering what we've discussed today and the institutional institutional racism and structural racism we all have seen in our healthcare system. NFP nurses empower mothers to advocate for themselves to be seen and heard by the health, their healthcare providers and to have their health assessed when they know that something isn't right. A 20 year follow up study of the program shows that NFP is effective at reducing all cause mortality among mothers living in highly disadvantaged settings. The study showed that mothers who did not receive nurse home visits were three times more likely to die from all causes of death than nurse visited moms. We need our partners in government to invest in evidence-based programs like NFP. Bringing nurse family partnership to scale in New York City could do a lot to prevent adverse pregnancy outcomes and maternal mortality. With existing state and city funding, NFP can only serve 5% of the eligible population in the city. Every dollar invested in NFP saves New York City $8.30 in future costs for high-risk families served. With that, I will end just saying we urge that the New York City Council expands its funding for NFP as well as, well as invest in other policies that deal with social determinants of health. Um, we support doulas as well as midwives at, uh, in conjunction with working with our NFP nurses. And thank you so much for allowing us um, to present testimony today. Thank you so much. The final panelist for this panel before we go to council member questions will be Miriam Mohammed Miller. You may begin. Sorry, go ahead. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, I also want to start by sending uh, my condolences and uh, positive vibes to Mr. McIntyre and your family. Thank you so much for sharing Amber's story and your story today. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Miriam Mohammed Miller and I'm the Government Relations Manager at Planned Parenthood of Greater New York. I want to thank the chairs of the Health, Hospitals and Women and Gender Equity Committees for holding this important hearing on maternal mortality and morbidity and advancing legislation that moves us closer to achieving reproductive justice. Planned Parenthood has been a trusted provider of sexual and reproductive health services for over 100 years and provides care to all New Yorkers, no matter their background. We also recognize the important role doulas and birth support workers play um, in ensuring safe births for all people, specific, but specifically Black women, um, and stand alongside them and in their work. Um, the COVID-19 pandemic revealed that there are many inequities in our public health system. However, this has been the reality for marginalized communities um, that communities continue to face. For black and brown people, specifically black women, the compounded identities of race, gender, and often economic status make seeking maternal health care increasingly difficult. Studies show the, racial, the major racial disparities in maternal health care with black women being four times as likely to die in childbirth than white women in New York State. And in New York City, women, black women are 12 times more likely to die from pregnancy related causes than white women. These outcomes are a result of institutionalized medical racism and implicit bias within our health healthcare system that leads to the unique needs of black women being ignored. Studies show that black women are more likely to have their health issues ignored by their doctor and are treated differently than white patients when they present the same symptoms. Studies also indicate the presence of support individuals, including doulas, midwives, and other birth support workers when black women are giving birth lead to positive health outcomes for both mother and baby. Doulas and midwifery care, doula and midwifery care is a right that should be afforded to all pregnant people to ensure safe births. 
And today, PBGNY uh, supports the legislation that moves us further to a goal of providing holistic care for those most in need. We support resolution 1408 that calls on the state to pass A10440 and state bill, uh, the Senate bill S8307 that works to remove the, the barriers to create independent birthing centers in New York state. We have seen a steady decline in birthing centers. This legislation will move us closer to the creation of more birthing centers and provide alternative places for individuals to, uh, to give birth safely. We also support introduction in 2017. Sorry, can I continue? Yep, yep, uh, yes. for just a bit longer. Thank you, thank you, Ms. Miller. Uh, we support uh, introduction 2017 that clarifies visitation policies um, within our hospital systems. We saw that um, inconsistent policies led to a lot of confusion for patients, a lot of confusion for families, doulas, and other birth support um, individuals. Uh, this uh, introduction will allow folks to have more clarity on who they, they can have in their room while they're giving birth. Uh, we also support all legislative measures that grows accessibility to doula care and support uh, legislation that will provide more information publicly on how individuals can access midwifery care. We applaud uh, le the legislation today that meaningfully addresses the issue of maternal mortality in New York City. Um, and we look forward to working with the council to making maternal mortality a thing of the past. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I will now move to Chair Rosenthal. Great, thank you so much. Um, thank you all for being here today and for testifying. We really appreciate your time and your passion. I, I'm very familiar um, with uh, the work, the amazing work of, of the nurses and of Planned Parenthood and uh, really am, am uh, grateful to your taking the time to testify and of course all your hard work. Ms. Ryan, um, I wanna start by apologizing to you um, for losing my temper. It's, um, and, and maybe I didn't give you really a chance to answer this question. It's hard to hear about something that, um, uh, hear when someone says that there's a lot of talk on a topic um, at a board meeting, uh, that it's on the agenda at meetings, but not hear about tangible actions that are taken. Um, can we start there, please? I think we're gonna have to unmute Ms. Ryan. Or does she have to unmute herself? We, we're sending the request. It should just take a second. Apologies, there's a delay. Got it. One moment, apologies. We're having a technical difficulty. No problems. I wanna thank, I see many other panelists who are waiting to testify. I wanna thank you for your patience. And I appreciate your being here. Um, Ms. Ryan, a box might pop up that asks you to accept the unmute. The there unmute. you go. Yep. OK, I didn't quite take the time to focus on the improvement projects that we've been engaged with. Maybe that would help strike a better tone to understand that there's a lot going on where it's more than talk. Um, in addition to promoting health equity through a couple of different channels, one is we've worked with the uh, New York Academy of Medicine before, we'll be hosting our second summit um, in January. We're not hosting, we're just contributing to the summit. Um, and it's there will be doulas and midwives and physicians and um, those that study the data and understand the root causes um, of um, outcomes that are skewed very negatively towards minority communities. So we look forward to that. We're also working, as I mentioned, with the State Health Department on a um, 
improvement collaborative because we find that if we can change processes, uh, those that are not working, and we can hardwire what is working, that we see improvement and we see the data that reflects that. Uh, we have collaborated in our hospitals in the city. When I say city, I don't mean NYC, H&H, &H, I mean all the hospitals in the city, um, participated in a maternal depression screening program um, that is continuing to identify depression, typically postpartum, um, in pregnant persons and getting them um, into treatment earlier on. We're also working on a statewide improvement collaborative to reduce opioid use disorder in pregnancy and neonatal abstinence syndrome, which is a syndrome where the infant is demonstrating exposure to illicit substances. Ms. Ryan, hang on one second. Is it, uh, I just want to make sure we can hear you. Is it the background noise? It that is. I, they're they're no problem, decided. No problem. An earlier panelist just had to re-call in, I but can. keep going. No you problem. know what? It could probably change rooms. Hold on, and I'll do that. All right. Thank you I'll very much. Take you with me, and I'll go to the room. We're all coming to realize how much construction work happens during the work day now that uh, we're home. Right. How's this? Is this better? Yes. Okay. Sitting on the floor of my daughter's room. So. Thank you. Um, we are engaged in an opioid, I mentioned opioid use disorder, neonatal abstinence syndrome program. This is something that with the Department of Health was piloted in about 20 hospitals across the state and we're hoping to engage and recruit all birthing centers that have any um, issues with this condition, which are all of them. And um, the goal is again to identify, treat and to reduce stigma with regard to drug substance use disorders. Um, I quickly mentioned um, that with ACOG and the Department of Health, we're focused on an obstetric, obstetric hemorrhage project where we've seen improvement um, in outcomes by preparing for a potential hemorrhage situation. Avoiding it, of course, at all costs, but it should arise to be able to respond appropriately. Similarly, there have been in programs with um, ACOG, the State Department of Health, and others on um, hyper reducing hypertension in pregnancy um, and venous thromboembolism. And lastly, uh, what we call the fourth trimester, looking at postpartum care to ensure that the pregnant person has the necessary follow-up. There's also a Medicaid component to this. We'd like to see Medicaid reimbursement extend beyond that which it does now so that birthing people can get treatment well after the delivery of the child. Um, but clearly, and based on all that we've heard today, we must do more. And what I was trying to say earlier is the hospital certainly has its responsibilities, but as a society, we all have responsibilities because of food insecurity, housing insecurity, um, lack of appropriate childcare, education, et cetera. You're shaking your head, um, but I will finish my remarks by saying that you know we have a fraying social safety net that has been further imperiled by the pandemic, um, and we're fighting in Washington for substantial relief um, for New York State in particular in this case, um, but a, that will benefit minority communities, Black and Latina women, who rely heavily on um, social service programs. Um, I thank you for the opportunity to participate today. Um, and I hope that my remarks um, were instructive and not insightful. <laughs> so thank you very much for the opportunity to complete. And you should know that the reason I was shaking my head is because, you know, it's, uh, we've already, we know about the societal problems. It's not for the Greater New York Hospital Association to remind us of that. I mean, you're here as a representative of an association and we want to hear what the association has done about this. Um, I have two, two more questions for you. Uh, one is, uh, do you know which hospitals in which health and hospitals, uh, hospitals don't have midwifery services? Um, I do not know that. I believe that health and hospitals was asked that question. So I, I don't know that. Do you know which uh, of the private hospitals do not have midwifery? services? Not off the top of my head. I, I have surveyed hospitals on that. Um, I probably have that information, um, but Would I can't tell you. Pardon me? 
If you were hazarding a guess, what percentage of the private hospitals in New York City do you think- I'm not gonna guess. I'm not gonna hazard a guess. Would Greater New York Hospital Association consider funding the DOH Maternal Hospital Quality Improvement Network? I don't know enough about it or what that would entail. I think you mentioned earlier, you asked a couple of times of the city administrative staff if that was in the next city budget. Is that what you're talking about? So you're not, you don't, you're not familiar with the Maternal Hospital Quality Improvement Network? Is, are the affiliate hospitals just not involved? I am familiar with many of the initiatives that the city is undertaking. I am not familiar with the details of this, the one that you're referencing right now. I have no further questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. Chair Rosenthal, uh, at this point, we do not have any other council members who have raised their hands, including from the other uh, chair. I did, have a, I did have a question. Oh, sorry, Chair Rivera. Go Thank ahead. You. Thank you so much. Um, Ms. Ryan, just, just wanted to ask about uh, just one thing in your testimony. I, I am very surprised that no one seems to know where there are, where there are, where there is a lack of midwifery programs considering there are only 11 acute facilities. I, I think I know which ones they are. I think it's Lincoln, Harlem, and Queens. I don't know why no one else seems to know those answers besides I got that information from fellow midwives and doulas. And what concerns me, and I'm trying not to make a connection, is that those hospitals exist in historically underserved black and brown, low income immigrant communities where these rates, these statistics have hit disproportionately with COVID on top. But we're going, we're, we're, I, that wasn't my question. My question is on something that you mentioned in your testimony, which was, let me make sure I get it right here. When discussing the state pilot program in Brooklyn, you stated you don't know why it was not well received. And in the steps, you mentioned that uh, Greater New York is taking to address implicit bias. And how is doula feedback and expertise included in that? I'm confused by the first part of what you said. You referenced the pilot in Brooklyn and then you went to a comment. I, I'm not sure I'm connecting. When this, I'll repeat it, it's not a problem. When discussing the state pilot program in Brooklyn, you stated you don't know why it was not well received. And I know we mentioned the- I, I didn't use the term well received. What I said is that there were two counties in New York State, approximately a year and a half, it could have been slightly longer when the governor's recommendations came out, right. that were awarded um, as pilot test sites for doula programs. I understood. I, I and, and the quotes weren't around well received. It was you said you don't know why. I'm my question no, is uh, no. What I no I, I did well. If I could just finish the one upstate in Erie County. I don't want to finish my question and then okay. you your answer. In the steps you mentioned that Greater New York is taking to address implicit bias, and I want to know as you are addressing implicit bias, how is doula feedback and expertise included in addressing that issue? And I believe that the doula community in New York City has been extremely clear about many specific concerns is why I ask. How are you incorporating doula expertise and feedback as you address implicit bias within your Greater New York Hospital Association facilities? What I did mention that Greater New York was supporting was an implicit bias training program. We're working with an outside organization that is focused purely on obstetrics and how patients are communicated with, um, whether or not the workforce is sensitive to the needs of their patients, if they're different than the patients that they're serving. Um, doulas wouldn't necessarily be excluded from that, but I don't know that that has a particular focus on doulas. What I did mention is that the doula community through its advocates and community-based organizations has approached Greater New York about having a forum with hospitals so that they could speak for themselves in expressing the benefits of the doula's presence 
and how they could work more cooperatively, hospitals and doulas together in welcoming doulas and ensuring that doulas have access and in understanding some of the limitations that might be because of space considerations in the era of COVID. That's what, that was my reference to hospitals and doulas having a forum. It starts with communication and I'm happy to bring the parties together so that they can have a direct one-on-one -on -one with one another to understand, for the hospitals to understand the role of the doula as a non-clinician support person and for the doulas to understand what some of the restrictions might be because we are in the middle of a pandemic and the numbers are just going up again. They're not, unfortunately, leveling off. Understood, and, and considering the pandemic, the state has provided guidance indicating that doulas and other support persons are able to accompany a person giving birth. However, we've heard from advocates that different hospitals are interpreting this guidance differently, leading to access issues. So can you please restate the policy for allowing doulas to be present at births during the pandemic? I read it the way you read it, that if a patient chooses to have a doula as a support person, they can be present pre in the, uh, during labor, delivery and in the postpartum phase. One thing I, I mean, they, the hospitals may have some specific need to restrict because of, I mentioned earlier, we don't have private rooms in all of our safety net hospitals. So that is you have a doula and a significant other and a patient times two, six feet of distancing isn't going to work. So there might be some situations that have presented challenges, but by and large, you and I understand the state policy the same way, that doulas are permitted at the request of the patient as a non-clinical support person. Does a doula have to show paperwork in order to enter the facility? You know, that's come up a lot. I don't know that they've been asked for paperwork. I'm, the noise is moving, so I'm moving. But what I have heard is that doulas have been asked if they're certified. They don't have to be certified. I think some hospitals have asked what their training is. I don't know if there's a hesitation to speak to the training, um, but as far as the state's policy, they should not be required to be certified. Well, I mean, it, it's just concerning because the doulas need to know ahead of time if they need to show any sort of paperwork and this needs to be across the board the same. Yeah. So One of the things that on, on our conversation with the doula community last week, I recommended that it would be useful to communicate previously to the hospitalization. On the patient can communicate it or if the doula attends prenatal visits, that they plan on being present in the hospital for the delivery. So, and they actually embrace that concept that information is, is you know, knowledge is helpful. So that it, the expectation that there will be a doula present with the patient and potentially another support person is useful information for a hospital for planning. Uh, well, but these are the kinds of things that I think would come out when we host this conference call forum, Zoom meeting, whatever it turns out to be. I think bringing the parties together seems like a very needed and simple first step. When is that forum scheduled? It isn't scheduled yet. Okay, but you, there is a forum in the- We work. spoke last week. Yeah, um, I'm working on it. Okay, well, we'd be thrilled to know when that happens and to be able to make sure as many people are participating as possible, relevant stakeholders. Well, thank you very much. Um, I just want to be clear is, you know, the last thing that someone needs to worry about in the pandemic is showing up and being told they can't access or can't help or can't support. That's why we've been so consistent about having some sort of standards, um, considering there is no standard certification for doulas right now. So the lack of consistency around requirements is troubling. Um, but I, I thank you for your answers and for being here and for testifying and, and thank you, Chair, for, for allowing the questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chair Rivera. Um, I'm going to check if there's any other council members uh, that would like to ask a question or if Chair Rosenthal or another chair would like to ask any other questions. 
Okay, um, thank you. We'll move to the next panel. So panel three, I'll read the names and then call on you individually. The next panel will be Danielle Castaldi Mika, Denise Bolds, and Deborah Lassane. So the next panelist will be Danielle Castaldi Mika. You may begin when the sergeant calls the clock. Thank you. Starting time. Hi. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Thank you to all the chairs. And um, in particular, I wanna thank council members Rivera and Rosenthal for staying. Um, I know that that's not like visible on the live stream, but I think for all of the presenters, it's really valuable <laughs> to see you um, and to know that you're here. So thank you very much. Um, it's hard to, to speak into the void. <laughs> um, so uh, again, my name is Danielle Castaldi Mika. I'm the Vice President of Political and Government Affairs at the National Institute for Reproductive Health. At NIRH, we work to secure access to reproductive health care, protect reproductive freedom, and ensure reproductive justice at the state and local level across the country. We are based here in New York. While NIRH is a reproductive rights organization that most frequently would be speaking with the council about abortion or contraceptive access, uh, it was important for us to be here today because the ability to have safe and healthy births is the other side of that same coin. The principle of reproductive justice, which is a, a phrase we've used a lot here today, um, is most frequently, I think people use the sister song definition, which is the human right to maintain personal bodily autonomy, have children, not have children, and parent the children we have in safe and sustainable communities. And it feels very clear uh, before this, but certainly from the testimony we've heard here today, that uh, we're failing on nearly every piece of that definition in New York City. And the racial disparity component of that is so stark and, and shameful. I'm really happy the council is taking up this issue and given the bills and resolutions that are being considered, taking a broad view of ways to address it. We cannot accept that maternal deaths are just a part of birthing. Um, I don't think I need to say this to the members who are here, but to the rest of the council, um, I hope that uh, our elected officials are listening closely to the birth workers and providers and parents testifying here today and that we use every tool at our disposal as a city um, to help address this. As someone who lobbies on reproductive right issues a lot, the one thing I often say is there are a lot of structural things that we, change, we can change. It's much harder to legislate racism out of healthcare. If we could pass a law, that would be amazing. So um, I'm not gonna go through the statistics. We've had plenty of public health experts do that. We know what is at stake here. Um, what I am gonna say is that I urge the city council um, and the administrative um, agencies that are here today to work together to shape a city where childbirth does not have to be a high risk activity. Um, that is a city where everyone has access to a range of birthing I'm options. Fired. I'll be quick. Thank you, um, where uh, everyone has access to a range of birthing options that includes not just hospitals, but also home births, midwifery led birthing centers and everything in between, regardless of their income or neighborhood. Um, it is a city where the health and safety of those giving birth and their children is of the utmost priority over convenience, procedure or profit. It is a city where those giving birth have access to affordable prenatal, midwifery, doula, and postpartum care in their own communities and where those providers are fairly compensated. And it has to be a city where our healthcare providers are held responsible for rooting out their own biases and racism and our institutions are required to do the same. Um, and I appreciate the vigor with which um, Chairs Rosenthal and Rivera are, are trying to do that today. Um, so NIRH supports intro um, 2017, 2042, and resos 1239 and 1408, but we emphatically urge you to continue to do more. While 2020 has been a year defined in New York City by uh, a singular public health crisis of COVID, um, maternal mortality and morbidity has been a crisis for decades. Um, and we owe it to uh, the families of all who have lost been lost uh, to keep 
keep doing this work. Um, and I want to add, I think, to everyone's uh, condolences and thanks to you, Bruce. I know, again, on the live feed, you can't see it, but I know you're here watching and I'm exhausted uh, and heartbroken. And so I can only imagine what this day is like for you. <laughs> and thank you for um, being so, so brave and so open. And the last thing I'll say, which I also said at the rally in the morning, my job, I get paid full time to be a government affairs professional that talks about reproductive health. We all need to be working towards a day when I can do that for my full-time job, but you don't have to be out here doing it as not your job. Um, and that all of the parents get to just be parents and all of the birth workers get to just be birth workers and usher in healthy, happy families. So thank you so much for having me. And again, to the council members who are, who are here and who have stayed, thank you for uh, showing your faces. It's really important. Thank you so much for your testimony. We'll move to the next panelist now, Denise Bolds. Starting time. Hi, um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Denise Bolds and I'm a native New Yorker. I was born in Harlem Hospital where my mom had an unassisted birth because as a black woman who was ill at the time during her pregnancy, the clinical staff did not wanna come in and help her deliver me. So she basically had an unassisted birth in the hospital. That's how black birth starts. That's how my birth started back in 1964. I just wanna say also too, that I am a donor certified birth doula past six years, uh, over 173 family supported. I am a hospital doula. I am known for high risk births because of my prior careers where I was a trauma technologist at Bellevue Hospital, um, where I learned a lot uh, in the ER and the OR. That was two of my favorite places in the world to be back in the early eighties. And I also then became, later on, I became one of the first medical social workers with a master's degree in social work to be hired here in New York State to do case management for managed care organizations um, back in the 90s. So uh, I did medical case management for insurance companies and I did it for high-risk pregnancies. And I can tell you that the one entity that we're all trying to get around here in this room is money. Money controls just about everything when it comes to healthcare. And it is the money that we have to look at. For these for-profit hospitals that are complaining about they don't know what to do, um, if they put on their budget line uh, a budget for doula care, for doula support services, I can promise you that their, uh, their statistics and customer satisfaction, as well as their birth outcomes will change. Um, insurance companies, as well as hospitals, they have to answer to quality assurance regulations. And we all know that doulas, make a difference, okay? Um, for Lorraine Ryan, um, please, if you can think consciously to stop using the word minority, it makes me flinch. It's an outdated term. It's up there with Negro and I can't stand it. At this point, we are, when we are people of color or we're BIPOC, but I am no one's minority. Thank you. Um, the way I feel about this is very, very uh, personal, near and dear to me because of the work that I've been called to do. As a doula, I've been called to do this work. And as a high risk doula who's in the hospitals a lot, I see many, many, many things that are happening here when it comes to birth that can be avoided. I see a lot of fear. I see a lot of intimidation. I see a lot of lack of communication. I see a lot of miseducation that's happening to families, good people, good hardworking degree earning tax paying law abiding people. And they are pushed into this, this, this vacuum and treated like, in, it, like it's an assembly line where you, there, you don't know that, that patient's name. You didn't look at their chart. You don't know their background. You don't know what it took for them to get here. You don't know anything other than the diagnosis code because that's the way the medical model has shifted now. I'm we, have, we, have, we have begun to treat uh, uh, pregnancy like it is more of a clinical situation, more of a disease, more of a code, more of a reimbursement. And what we have to understand here is that this is a three-legged stool that we have to hold hospitals accountable as well as the insurance company and the community. I have written doula proposals for major hospitals. As, as a medical case manager for Emblem, NVP and Oxford Health, I know the intricacies of what insurance companies do and how they impact hospitals and how that impacts the care of a community. I've written doula proposals for hospitals 
where as Chair Rosenthal said, just a couple thousand dollars to start a doula program, you will see a difference. But the resistance that you've seen here today in the way Lorraine Ryan has communicated, that is the same bureaucratic communication that the upper echelon of the medical model, the CFOs and the CEOs, that's exactly the way they speak and that's exactly the way they think, okay? They are on the defensive, they don't wanna be corrected, they are putting something on an agenda for 10 years and you better like it because that's the way it's gotta be. And I'm saying that that's, that's, that's no longer acceptable anymore. It is just not acceptable. This is a crisis against humanity. When black and brown women are dying, I can go and have a triple bypass, a quadruple bypass and come out faster than I would have given birth. Think about that. I can come out very, very well in cardiology, but I'm taking a huge risk when it comes to labor and delivery. And these women are coming to me and they are asking me to do something that puts them at more risk. Unassisted birth, they don't wanna to go to a hospital, they're afraid. And not every woman is a candidate for a birth center birth. We have many, many moms who do need the support of the hospitals and it is the hospital's responsibility to do that well. The last thing I'd like to say here also is that we need to look at the midwives who are here in New York practicing at hospitals. What do they look like? They're white. They don't even have enough representation of diversity for midwives who are allowed to practice here in New York hospitals. Because the white, there's, a, there's an influx of white midwives, but it's very, very hard to get a Spanish speaking or a, a, a black midwife into these hospitals to serve in, for people that look like me. So I'm really, really keen, Lorraine, um, and whoever else is possible, please, this doula forum, I would love to speak there because of my prior history, because of my prior career, and because of the work that I'm doing. I am taking COVID tests on, like you wouldn't believe because I'm trying to appease every single hospital and each hospital is a personal silo. I went to Montefiore, the two Montefiores up, up in the Bronx, Einstein and the other one. Einstein said, you gotta have, you gotta have the COVID test and you gotta walk in with the COVID test. You can't come in here and support this birth unless you have a COVID test. My client went to Einstein to give birth. It was too crowded. They sent her over to the other Montefiore hospital, okay? She went there, went into labor and labored in the triage room for eight hours because there wasn't a room for her. I couldn't come and support her until they got her into a room, right? I understand that, I understand, no problem. I went and showed the nurse my donor doula certification, my medical malpractice insurance and my negative COVID test. You know what that nurse told me? Oh, you don't need to have that here. Do you know what I went through to, na to navigate getting the COVID test within the 72, you know, the two day, the 72 hour period to make sure that, that I'm not reinfecting or what? Do you know the stress and strain of this family? This poor mom is huffing and puffing. Denise, did you get a COVID test? Is it, can, you, can you come? The stress and strain that we're putting on our families and the essential workers who are on the front line? Why? A lot of this is avoidable. But I do wanna say, I would love to participate in this doula forum that's coming up because I do have a lot of exposure being a hospital doula. That's what I do. I work as a hospital doula. And I've seen all of these hospitals, including the one out on North, Long Island, Manhasset, Northwell, where they don't want doulas, even with an executive order. They are allowed to exclude themselves from the executive order and ban doulas from their hospitals. Okay, so let's let's talk about what the, the amount of autonomy and the amount of power that these hospitals give. And it's not benefiting the communities. It is not. It is not helping communities at all. When you can you can you can override an executive order from the governor of the state of New York, that's a lot of power. That's a lot of power and that's a lot of money. And we have to call it as we see it. These for-profit hospitals can no longer call broke. Oh, we don't have money for a dual support, but if you wanna come in and do it for free, no. And to answer Lorraine Ryan, yes, we had a doula pilot program here in Brooklyn. I was one of the first doulas to get my NPI and do everything to sign up to be a Medicaid doula because that's what I was called to do. But you know what happened? The reimbursement rate. There's no way I can live on $600 before taxes. And there's no way that I can do six prenatal visits and six postpartum visits and support a birth on average that lasts about 27 hours. 
It's punitive what New York State did when it came to the Medicaid reimbursement for doula programs. It was punitive what you did. Other states, they're paying $800, $900, $1,200, $1,500 $1, up in Massachusetts for a doula reimbursement program. But here in New York, all we could negate was $600 and told you better like it because that's all you're going to get. And then you're going to sit there and say, well, gee, I don't know why the doulas in Brooklyn didn't sign up because you can't survive off of that. And it doesn't make sense. Six prenatal visits and six postpartum visits. How are you going to fit all of that in? It's almost virtually impossible, especially being on call to support the birth as well. So that's why the medical model failed when it came to Medicaid for, for doulas in Brooklyn because you did not set this up. You did not listen to the doulas. You picked one doula to speak for all doulas. And that's a big mistake. We have very intelligent doulas here in New York State. And you cannot just pick one doula and one doula organization to speak for all doulas. That's plantation mentality. That's racist. And it's gotta stop. That's all I have to say because I'm losing my temper. Thank you very much. I, I, I want to continue with the panel, but I, I really want to thank you. Yeah. Next in the panel. It, it absolutely breaks my heart. Black women were treated better as slaves when they were pregnant because it was somebody else's property. When we were no longer slaves, then we had a problem here called maternal health disparities. This model was never for us. The AMA banned black doctors when we were emancipated. This medical model was never for black people. It was never for people of color. So you're trying to build something on a very unstable foundation. Thank you for your anger and expressing it. Really appreciate you very, very much. Um, we still have the rest of the panel, is that right? Uh, here, Rosenthal. So we have one more panelist um, on the panel, and that panelist is Deborah Lassane. Thank you. I, uh, yeah. Ms. Lassane, you may begin when the sergeant calls the clock. Thank you so much. Starting time. I think uh, Ms. Lassane needs to be on mute here. There you go. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chair Rosenthal, Chair Rivera, Chair Levine. Um, thank you for the opportunity. My name is Deborah Lassane. I am the Director of Programs at Caribbean Women's Health Association, and we provide a range of services for our community. Um, but I'm, I guess I'm here today because we coordinate a doula program. Uh, we provide doula services in three boroughs, actually four boroughs, Brooklyn, Manhattan, Bronx, and Queens. And I just submit written testimony, but I want to use my time to get into so many issues that came up and I wanted to speak before, but I wasn't able to. So I wanna respond um, first to an issue brought up by Chairperson Rivera. Um, I want to say that our doula program, Healthy Women, Healthy Futures is funded by New York City Council. So we thank you very much for the opportunity to serve our community. This is our seventh year funding. And the funding for our doula program um, allows us to provide doula support to the women from the four boroughs at no cost to the women, but it also allows us to recruit and train people from the community to become doulas. So that's something um, in response to Chairperson Rivera, that's something that we do every year is we recruit a cohort of train um, upwards of 75 new doulas across all five boroughs. Okay, and that's something we've been doing every year for the last seven years. Um, in response to Chairperson Rosenthal, um, your suggestion of Greater New York Hospital Association supporting the MHQIM project, that is an excellent idea. Implementing um, some components of the MHQIN. One component that I have worked very closely with them is promoting dual access. And um, specifically, I've worked very closely with promoting doula access at Montefiore Hospital and Metropolitan Hospitals. 
And um, in promoting doula access, there are a number of steps that we, we've taken in working with those hospitals. And one of the steps is to help the hospital develop a doula policy for that hospital. So that everyone at the hospital is clear on what the doula policy is and people outside, including doulas, can know before they come to the hospital, what is that hospital, the hospital's policy in terms of doula access. And so far we have um, developed a really nice um, policy and procedure um, with Metropolitan Hospital. I believe they're the first hospital to complete the doula policy. And we're working with Montefiore Hospital at this time for them to complete their doula policy. So even though, um, as Chairperson Rivera noted, even though we have a mandate from the governor on doula access. I'm expired. Even though we have a mandate from the governor's office, every hospital was developing their own policy and procedure. And it was oftentimes individual, depending on who was meeting the doula at the door. I have had to, uh, on a personal note, I had to actually go to my office at 9 p.m. one night and write a letter for doula to be able to have access, to be able to support her client. Mount Sinai Hospital would not allow the doula to come. Hence, women don't deliver on any schedule. So this was an emergency unless I was able to provide a letter on letterhead at 9 p.m. Okay, so these are things that are happening, but with the development of each hospital having a doula policy, hopefully we'll be able to um, get rid of these issues. So what Miss um, the lady from Greater New York mentioned about working with individual hospitals is something that MHQIN is already doing, and they already have a, a template and a format. Okay, so you know, uh, as much as they can um, contribute to that process, I think it would be helpful, and that process should continue. Um, uh, I want to. Um, what Ms. Bolsh has said about the Medicaid doula pilot for Brooklyn is, is correct. It's not that the doulas didn't want to sign up. The doulas were not able to participate because of the reimbursement. It was prohibitive. So um, what that means is that women on Medicaid in Brooklyn did not have the ability to have a doula paid for by Medicaid. And I think that's a travesty at this point. It's just really a travesty. Um, Early on communication was mentioned as an issue that basically lack of communication contribute is contributing to our ongoing problem with maternal mortality and morbidity. And that communication. So it's not just spill client and the providers are important, but we are women from the time they know they're pregnant, actually before they know they're pregnant, throughout their pregnancy, up until a year after they give birth. Because maternal mortality is defined as any pregnancy or um, delivery related death up until a year after the child is born. So during that time, um, communication with community-based providers is very important and needs to be supported. Hospitals have to be open and recognize that community-based providers provide support to women before they go to the hospital and after they get out the hospital. So yes, we should be working with hospitals, but we should also provide adequate resources to community-based organizations so that we can provide the necessary level of services that are required. And the last thing I want to say is uh, we know that the COVID pandemic has heightened the disparities that exist. Um, we serve um, upwards of 600 women per year pregnant and postpartum, and we've seen a real increase in women who need housing um, we have many women who are now in shelters who are pregnant um, and going through pregnancy in shelters. Um, we have women who also have um, food insecurity and women who have heightened mental health needs. So I would recommend that New York City develop some system so that pregnant women have priority and should just have to go through the shelter system 
while she's pregnant or with a newborn baby, that there has to be some priority given to serving pregnant people in New York City. And that concludes my testimony. Thank you very much. And I just want to give my condolences to Mr. McIntyre. Um, as much as we do, it's not enough. As long as women are dying, it's, it, it's just not enough and we have to do more. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Uh, Chairs Rosenthal and Rivera. Yep. Um, well, first of all, uh, Ms. Lussain, thank you for everything that you do. Um, it's pretty remarkable and really appreciate your comments. Um, you know, uh, Ms. Folds, halfway through your testimony or about a quarter of the way through, interestingly, Greater New York Hospital Association representative hopped off. So Greater New York was not able to hear, their representative was not able to hear both your and Ms. Lusane's really good suggestions for them. Predictable. And that was noteworthy. Predictable. Yeah. Um, and uh, let's see, so I have a question for both of you. Are either of you on the city's uh, M3RC? I was a member um, for the first two years. So my um, position expired in December, 2019. No, I'm not on, but I, I would certainly make every effort to, to contribute any way that I can. Do you work, do you, uh, Ms. Bolds, are you in touch? Is DOHMH in touch with you on your work? <clears throat> no, no, this is uh, my work. I have a full-time doula business, full-time doula practice. Um, this is what I do for a living. That and. I'm a CLC, so I also work with breastfeeding uh, women. And no, uh, I have not heard from the Department of Health with that. So they're required to do an analysis of the doula services that are provided in New York City now and come up with a plan of action to increase the number, increase access to doulas. You're telling me they've never reached out, you've never heard from anyone at the Department of Health? No. That's concerning. It is. I mean, I have an LLC. Um, I'm, I'm an MWBE. Um, I've done everything the right way when it comes to my business. So my information is out there. I also have an NPI number. Um, they, they, I'm out there. I'm, I'm, I'm accessible. Clearly. Thank you. Ms. Lusane, you talked about a doula access plan that you provide, you uh, came up with for Metropolitan. You're working on one now for, what was it, Montefiore or Mount Sinai? Yes, Montefiore. And again, do you work in collaboration with the city on that, Department of Health? Right, that's part of, um, that's one aspect of the MHQIM project um, is to improve dual access at the MHQIM member hospitals. So we have gone to both Montefiore and Metropolitan um, many times to speak with their staff, to engage their staff around dual access, educate their staff, stand or appreciate the role of the doula. Um, so, um, and also to get them, as I mentioned, policy that is a, an official hospital policy on doula access so that all of the hospital staff is following the same policy and that policy can also be um, publicized to the public and to the doula community. And doulas, doulas are involved in the development of the doula policies at the hospitals. That's great, that's great. Uh, two quick questions. Um, how much money does your organization receive uh, from the network project? In other words, if the project is not funded for next year, how much money will your organization lose? We don't receive any funding to participate on the MHQIN. <laughs> so we, um, you know, we receive funding to provide our doula program and coordinate our doula program in four boroughs. But, but we, you're doing we, work. Yes. Uh, it's bill requires on coming up with doula access plans. You're doing that work uh -huh. and not getting reimbursed by the city. No. Your city can minimize the amount of city council funding. No. 
our city council funding is only to coordinate Healthy Women, Healthy Futures doula program. Yeah. So we, we take it as health and mental hygiene because doula access is important for us to be able to do what we do, but we don't get funded for that specifically. Would you have liked to have continued on the M3RC? And I know your screen is occasionally frozen, so. Um. And once again, that's the mentality when it comes to community doula work, when it comes to serving your community. It is the BIPOC, it is the women of color who step I, up and do this work. I miss your question, They don't Chair Rosenthal. Yep, got you, one second, one second, please. Um, please continue, Ms. Bolt. Yeah, so you know, you 100%. don't get reimbursed. Deborah Lassane and Healthy Women, Healthy Futures, along with several other organizations have been working very hard. And look at all this wonderful work that she's talking about and she's not being reimbursed in any way. This, this is gonna impact a lot of families and a lot of the community. And that's, what that's the pattern when it comes for community doula work when it comes to black women. You will do the work but you will not be you will not be adequately compensated for your expertise and for your intellect. That's intellectual property. That's theft. I didn't hear your question, Chair Rosenthal. I was wondering. Uh, thank you, Ms. Boltz, for for that comment, um, Ms. Lassane, I was asking uh, whether or not you would have liked to have continued on the M3RC, and if you know the name of the. Um, doula organization that, that continued the work after you left? Um, I'm not sure. I just received a letter stating that my, my term was over. So I don't, I'm not sure that. <clears throat> just decision, I was not informed. I was just informed that my, my two year term was expired. Um, while you were on during those two years, do you feel like your voice was heard during the committee meetings? Ms. Lassane, while you were a committee member, do you feel like your voice was heard on the M3RC? Definitely, it was. and. Um... I was thinking um, that the information that I gained from being a member of that committee has helped me to be able to improve the level of support that our doulas are providing. Um, as, we, as we're going through cases, we hear about gaps in services and care um, that so that when we receive doula referrals, you know, I can, I can know, for example, you know, I'll say a woman, a woman who is an immigrant who has recently arrived here is at greater risk. And so we, we pay special attention to cases like that. Um, women who are in shelters, you know, we, we try to give them additional support because we know they're at greater risk. Women who may not, women who may not speak English are at greater risk. And you learned all that by being a member of the M3. participation on that committee. Great, thank you. Thank you all so much. I, I could talk to you all day long. Um, there's another panel waiting and you have important work. So thank you so much for your time. It was really valuable for us to be able to push the ball forward. I just so appreciate everyone. Thank you. Uh, before we move forward, Chair Rivera, did you have any questions? I just want to thank you all so much. This is, I think, Ms. Bolt, you kind of laid it all out. This is, this is, we're built on an unstable foundation. So we are trying to essentially build something new and no one is giving us the tools. And it hurts, it, it, cuts, it cuts so deeply for me. It, it really does. It, it's something that I, it keeps me up at night. Um, it's, it's, I hear the terror, I, I see my, my, my peers working alongside of me so hard. I hear stories like Mr. McIntyre. It's, this, is, this is not what I anticipated when I stepped into this role of being a doula. I had, I had no idea the enormity. And like I said, it is because of the cell phone 
that we are able to stay connected and it has really opened up the enormity of this maternal crisis that we're in because the cell phone is able to connect millions of people at once and document something that has happened. If it didn't document, it didn't happen. And that, that's why we fell into this abyss for so long. But it, it is just, it is devastating for me. Thank you, thank you for all you do. Thank you, Chair. Thank you so much to our panelists and also to the chairs. Um, I don't see any other council member hands for this panel. We'll just do one check for council member questions using the raise hand function in Zoom. We don't see any hands, so we'll move to the next panel. This next panel will be our final panel. There'll be five panelists, so we will call the panel and then each individual by name, followed by a check after this panel for any panelists that we may have missed. So we know some people have logged out, may log back in, so we will do a check after this panel, but for right now, it's our final panel. Panel four will be Eugenia Montesinos, Nilu Shruti, Annette Peril, Patricia Lofman, and Trisha Shimamura. So again, um, we'll start with Miss uh, Eugenia Montesinos. You may begin when the sergeant calls the clock. Thank you. Starting time. Can I start now? Yes, please begin, thank you. Hi, uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Eugenia Montesinos. I am a midwife at Metropolitan Hospital. I've been working for 20 years here. And uh, this is a hospital that it serves um, a majority of brown and black um, mothers. And uh, so I just wanna talk about a little bit about what uh, is going on. I, I like plenty of the previous people and they were saying how much maternal maternal mortality is a pandemic that was happening way before COVID. And it's been happening way before. And I, I've been witnessing, I knew it was happening. And, um, but with COVID got increased and it, what they surfaced more, what is, what is really happening with all, uh, especially with our uh, black and brown mothers and uh, with uh, I just want to start how even got much uh, people notice it even more why maternal care was so important in the city and why you make more more news not because they were paying attention to our black and brown mothers the more keen was because our white mothers they got hit they never got hit in a way that you not, now your partner cannot go in with you. And that make it a big, big news. So it was not, if it wasn't that, I don't think they would pay attention to that. It, it's not that. And, and the news, the newspaper, the media, everybody was paying attention to now because of white mothers being hit for the first time with these big uh, disparities that is happening. So, and, and, and one of the things that it was very disheartening for me that what happened and they were able to look for options. They were able to look for having a home, I mean, a birth home, you know, they can have it at home. They can pay for that or they can pay to be going out of the city where COVID is not in there. So they can go to, uh, uh, to their country houses, which you're not getting infected. But our black and brown people, they have no options whatsoever. They have to be there. They, they lose jobs, their partner losing jobs. And there is no way to get communicated with us because we were not prepared. We have nothing implemented. We didn't have anything to, how are we gonna find out to them? Like, what is it? There is no phone. Uh, I'm excited. They, yeah, for them also, there was no way to be communicating to us because we, when you work, when you are in a hospital, you are not assigned to a specific provider. It's a group. 
and there is a number that our clinic closed and they were calling and there is no way to get in touch with us. So it was really um, more, um, and the whole problem got really very bad for us also and for the mothers and for every people who was taking care of them. Doulas could not longer come in. Our mothers can be having the babies alone. I mean, no one in there, no one, not even, we are so, when they were impacted, we couldn't even go to too much to the room because we don't want to be exposed because we have to take care of another mother. So it was very uh, sad and traumatic for everyone. It was not only traumatic for the mother, it was traumatic for us, traumatic for the partner. And it was really bad. And when you are a white person, you can scream, you can get, and sometimes you can get your way. But when you are a minority, when you're a black and brown, they're not gonna listen to you. Or you don't, you're not aware of your rights. That is one other thing. So um, doulas are not advocates and they are not there. We are advocates, we, are, we, we are, can't cover everything. So it was a big, big thing, Anna. Um, the maternal mortality and morbidity is way before, but with this one, we really, really see how much our black and brown women suffer. And there were the consequences for that. You know, they lost their jobs and, and the traumatic, it's just all alone. And some people, they, the, <clears throat> some of the mothers that domestic violence got higher. Yeah. And, and, and also they were not on others. They got pregnant while they're in, in quarantine and nobody can leave and they got pregnant. Unwanted pregnancies. They are not, they can't get in touch with us to have their um, contraception. Or if they become pregnant, they can't have an abortion. So it, it got a completely a chaos and everything. And we wanted to do our best too but there is no way how we can get in touch. As I said before, we lost a lot of mothers and they just saw them when they were coming to have a baby and we didn't see me for months. And they were talking to them, what happened? What is I said, well, I don't have a phone. I don't know how to get in touch with you. My husband died because he got infected. The whole family got infected and it's just very sad. Um, and so for me, and, and um, we need to implement. When, uh, as a midwife, we try to do a very a holistic care. And that is not what it is. And we have to change that. And if we want to decrease the maternal mortality, we have to get very serious about it and change how we approach women care, period. Not in a way how it is right now. Um, right now, all our mothers who suffer during the pandemic, who had a baby like that, including now, they are trauma. And it's gonna be a big trauma, not only the parents and also the child, because when you were born and you don't have a skin to skin, there is not such a connection. There's a separated. And it's gonna be a big trauma. We're gonna see that in 15, 18 years from now, it's gonna be a big mental pandemic. And it's gonna be, it's gonna hit us. We're not thinking about that. And, and, and for us, it's just, we wanna see the whole picture and we try to see the whole picture. And that is why it's so important to have that option for women, the midwifery option. If they wanna choose that, this option should exist for them, but we don't have that. Plenty hospitals don't have that. So we should implement it if the woman chooses, good. If she doesn't choose, good. For goes without me, but we have to offer options. And that is for me, one of the things that I, I think, when I think about mothers in general, maternal care have to be changing. Look at how we have in England, Netherlands, Denmark, they have a very good outcome. Because why? The first line are midwives, and when they have a problem, they go to a doctor. So they do have high risk, low risk. And that is what we have to do. United States 
pay billions and billions of money for prematurity. We spend so much money and it's just uh, enormous and that we can fix it. And just that alone, why we having premature babies? Premature babies, they have problems. They have delayed in learning. They have, it costs us amounts of money and there is no need to go through this. If we are serious to change our lives, that new generation life. And um, I think that's most I can say. There is times that I can keep talking, but I think I'm gonna give chance to the next ones. Thank you for listening. Thank you, and thank you for sharing what you witnessed. Yes. All these months. Thank you. Thank you so much, and thank you, Chair. Uh, we'll move to the next panelist, who will be Nilu Shruti. Starting time. Ms. Shruti, you uh, may begin your testimony. Um, you're still on mute. You probably have to accept um, a little box will pop up asking you to unmute. You need to be unmuted. There's a delay. We're working on a technical issue. One moment. There it is. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. We begin when the sergeant calls the clock. Thank you so much. Starting time. Hi, everyone. My name is Nilu Shruti. Um, I am a birth advocate here in New York City. Um, I am a student midwife. I run a support space for expecting and new parents. And I'm also part of a group opening a midwifery led birthing center in New York City. Um, I would like to start by pointing out and speaking to the specific bills and resolutions that we are talking about today. Um, in the context of reducing racial disparities in maternal mortality. In terms of the first one, which talks about, um, I believe it's number 2017 as it applies to visitation policy guidelines. In order for this bill to truly address racial disparities in maternal mor mortality, it needs to include that doulas are allowed to visit birthing clients in all hospitals without any certification barriers and for the doulas presence not to be counted as a visitor as they are essential workers. For pregnant and birthing people to have a companion at prenatal visits during birth, ensure no separation from baby unless medically necessary. And in case the, the patient is uh, readmitted for postpartum that the baby is not considered a visitor and allowed to room in. Um, for the second, um, which is uh, number 2042, which um, pertains to posting information about midwives online um, on the DOHMH website, in order for this bill to truly address racial disparities in maternal mortality, it would be necessary to include the benefits of using midwives, include nationally available data and statistics of C-section rates, maternal and infant disparities, um, in mortality, in choosing to use midwives, as well as links to resources to help pay for midwifery services. Um, for resolution number 1239, um, which relates to making doulas more accessible to individuals with Medicaid and those without health insurance. Um, yes, of course, doulas should be more accessible. However, in order for this uh, to this resolution to truly address the racial disparities in maternal mortality, this resolution must focus on midwives. Yes, access to doulas should be increased, but doulas do not solve the racial disparities in maternal mortality as they have no role in providing healthcare are not healthcare professionals. We should be relying on healthcare professionals that are trained um, and have proven time and time and again to have better outcomes for birthing people of color. Um, and finally, in terms of this resolution uh, 1408, uh, calling on the New York, New York State Legislature to pass a related to accreditation approval for midwifery led birth centers. Um, to clarify, all birth centers in New York, um, even if they are the two emergency birth centers, are all physician led. To this day, we have zero midwife led birth centers in New York. 
Um, there remain zero midwifery led birth centers in New York, despite the governor's executive order, despite the recommendations of the New York Maternity Task Force. There's a stark difference between the two. In addition to the language for this bill, for it to be truly effective, all midwife led birth centers must receive deemed status for the certificate of need process, which is onerous, expensive, and prohibitive, which is why we do not have a community birth center facility. I would also ask the council to support resolutions to pass an executive order for this deemed status to happen because it might take a while for this bill to get passed. Um, we also need a resolution to allow cert certified professional midwives to have permanent full scope of practice um, and immediately make funding accessible for any group that is trying to open a midwife-led birth center in New York City. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you. And thank you for your attention to the bills in particular and sharing those thoughts on the record. Um, really appreciate that. Is there anything else you wanted to add? I don't want you to feel, I mean, that was, you really just helped us. So if there's anything, one or two more sentences that you want to add, you're so knowledgeable about this. I really appreciate you. Um, this is the first time that I have been included in gatherings such as this, and so I appreciate that. I do think that voices such as mine for folks who are doing this actual work and have policy-related um, uh, issues and policy-related ideas need to be taken into consideration. I do think we need a midwifery school in New York City that is a direct entry program that is publicly funded to offer and expand midwifery services um, in the city. That, that would make a huge difference in the maternal mortality, uh, dispar the disparities in short. And there are a lot more ideas, but I wanted to focus on the specific things that we're talking about today and would love to continue this conversation as many times as you need, but hopefully not too many more. Right, I just, I just, I just want to ask. We're gonna continue, um, oh, I'm sorry, uh, council member. We're gonna continue with questions after uh, the whole panel is finished. I just wanted to jump in on that. Council member? I'm just wanted to yeah just jump in and say um i'm looking forward to working with you nilo i appreciate your edits and your expertise i really do thank you all right thank you so much chairs um we will move to the next panelist annette peril thank you you may begin um miss peril you may begin when the sergeant calls the clock starting time Hi all, can you hear me okay? My name is Myla Flores. I'm working with Annette Perel. I'm a community member of the birth doulas and birth workers out here. I um, have been a birth worker for 14 years. One of the things that I work with is with um, Uptown Village Cooperative, which is a multicultural group of perinatal professionals that are based in and serving Upper Manhattan and the Bronx. Um, I've worked with Nilu a ton recently and Bruce a ton recently on advocacy efforts towards our missions and the different levels of the different points that have been made. Thank you Nilu so much for all of that detail and your sharpness and dedication. And I just wanna also thank everyone here for your commitment our leaders, the birth workers who've been tirelessly dedicated to improving birth justice, and those who've been most deeply impacted by issues that we're all speaking of, and those have, who have been neglected, who have been left behind. Um, and we're here for all of them and for all birthing people. And so I just wanna appreciate that we're here in, in the effort to bring things forward and um, consider these wonderful creative ideas. Um, we all know and have a, a whole bunch of data, a whole bunch of solutions. We even have protocols, like lots of specifics. And I just wanna again, echo many of the recommendations that have already been made. And for now, I'm going to focus on um, the last point that Nilu just touched on. And it's really, really driving home this ask for Governor Cuomo to use his executive authority to allow midwife led birth centers deemed status so that we're granted certificate of need. Um, if we meet the rigorous um, 
uh, standards that um, CABC lays out in their freestanding birth center accreditation process, this should be sufficient to exist in New York and this should be sufficient for providers who are um, uh, working in this setting to have reimbursements and for the facilities to be reimbursed. This would be a tangible action towards the intent that the task force <laughs> made to create safe alternatives for out of hospital birthing sites. As she stated, there are none. We have zero midwifery led birth centers. And during this COVID-19 pandemic and the pandemic that existed prior with the maternal mortality, this is a crisis on top of a crisis and it is not being properly addressed. So birthing options remain unavailable to New Yorkers and this is a key birthing option. We should have access to birth centers. We should have access to midwife led birth centers. And we want creative approaches to collaborative care in a model cognizant of the complexities around what our communities face. A lot of these birth I'm workers inspired. have been test to the different um, stories that we've faced in supporting our birthing families. Um, my most recent, and I'm only going to name just the most recent things, my most recent lactation um, um, client, she 19 years old, birthing in a New York City hospital saying, wow, my doctor, did, I didn't even know he was my doctor. He just came in and would occasionally talk to the nurse and then leave. And afterwards I found out he was my doctor but exchanged zero words with me. I wish I had a, a one of my nurses was a person of color. I, you know, and she describes this experience that she had a healthy outcome but she's traumatized. And so, you know, that's a lactation client um, from like the birth perspective. I have two people back to back at a private hospital and. In, you know, the parts that I serve, Upper Manhattan and the Bronx, but the, the one was white, one was black, and the same circumstance happened, induction, and the way that the black person had to advocate for herself in order to still be provided substandard care and still have outcomes um, that were negative and pushed on her in comparison to what the white person had to do when she just said her mind and didn't make it an argument. And I was just like, wow, okay, she's just being listened off the bat. And this is all stuff we know of, you know, I don't have to name case after case of what we see all the time, but I just wanted to just go ahead and illustrate these are the common things. And as a birth doula in the birth field with a, with a, a whole group of 17, 18 mentees that are speaking to me about their issues on a regular, I'm noticing the same things. And I just want to speak also to the, um, um, the, the doula program, the pilot, you know, Uptown Village Cooperative had to secure funding from a private grant source in order to provide the care that we wanted to in the way that we wanted without the whole six prenatals and six postpartums. And so we were able to pay our doulas in, in that way. And that's a model that we wanted to continue to do, but we ran out of funding. We have community-based, community-led initiatives from organizations like Ashe Birthing Services, like Bronx Rebirth, that that are able to get communities to help fund them to support people in their in, in in their communities right so that we can reflect the care so that we can reflect culturally and energetically um, the type of people that we're serving and they've been successful at that and so there are um, community-led initiatives that i believe we should be aware of and in support of and oh my gosh, Deborah Lassane and all the work that you're doing with Healthy Women, Healthy Futures, just big enough like what you have to manage in order to keep that program floating and you know thriving. And you know, I'm in touch with the doulas, some of the many doulas who've passed through that program. And you know, we still remain appreciative in knowing, you know, what what's out there and the barriers that we're all facing in being um um, the prime, like pr some of the primary stakeholders in, in improving maternal health for our communities. And we all recognize how important it is, how time sensitive it is. And we don't want to be going through these slow boiling, slow grind of, you know, getting these bills passed, especially for something as simple as a public statement that has been we need midwifery led birth centers to exist. So now can we get those steps taken? And so I hope that anyone here and the, the circles of influence you have, influences that you have can really consider putting a press 
towards the governor Cuomo because those offices um, who we've also been in touch with Nilo and I with um, the Department of Health and uh, basically, you know, those are under the executive authority and therefore like if, if he were to go ahead and push forth this commitment, it can change. Um, the last thing I wanted to mention was just, you know, it's been known that we have resources here in this state. I know it's a complex year, but truly we need to put our money where our commitment is. There are other states, Eugenia had just mentioned countries that are doing things successfully. Right here in the United States, there are places, there are jurisdictions that are doing things gorgeously. I've been following, and I just wanted to mention a jurisdiction in Seattle that has the Office of Planning and Community Development. Development. They um, have an economic development initiative there. It's a fund created to respond to the needs of marginalized populations, reduce disparities, and support access to opportunity in healthy, vibrant communities. And it was championed by the community organizations concerned about the you know, pressures and the lack of investments in the communities of color. And so the mayor proposed a sustained funding source and awarded a bunch of organizations led by and serving people of color that would basically allow for capacity building, property acquisition, and capital expenses. And so, you know, we know, again, midwifery-led birth centers are necessary, among other things. I'm just driving that one home because I really want us to consider creative ways to use every resource available to us and every tool possible to help make change. And that's all I want to say for now. Thank you so much for your testimony. Um, we'll move to the next panelist and then we'll take questions at the end of the panel, if, there, if that's okay with the chairs. Okay, the next panelist is Patricia Lofman. Hi, good Hello, afternoon. Bob. Good afternoon and greetings. Uh, I'd like to thank you for this opportunity to provide testimony before the hospital's committee on maternal morbidity and mortality. But before I start, I'd like to, to comment that one of the limitations of committees such as yours is that you don't have the benefit of individuals like myself who've been doing this work for about 40 years and who, so you don't have the benefit of our historical memory and information. So for example, Nilu referenced the bill that would provide information on the number of midwives, et cetera. That already exists. This bill is redundant. There is a New York State maternity information law that dates back to the 1990s that provides information on childbirth uh, practices and policies, including whether a hospital has a midwife, the number of um, midwifery uh, births, the, the C-section rate, the, v the VBAC rate, vaginal birth after cesarean. This, this data, this information is uh, packed with a lot of information that families such as Mr. McIntyre's could have used in making an informed decision of where to go for maternity care. The problem is, is that because this emanated in the 90s, there, there, there are few people who, are, who remain who even know that this New York state law exists and consequently is not enforced. So you have a bill now that is recreating what already exists, but no one knows and it's not enforced. Why don't we, why don't we before we continue this bill, research the maternity information law and, and enforce it, make certain that it works. So that's number one. So I'm sorry, my name is Patricia Lofman. I'm a certified nurse midwife, fellow of the American College of Nurse Midwives and former hospital center midwifery services director from 1984 to 1999. I practiced full scope midwifery, caring for women for three decades. I retired from clinical midwifery in 2010, but clearly I'm still around, so I have not left the field. When I retired in 2010, I was attending the births of infants that I had brought into this world, which means I had taken care of over two generations of families. And what that attests to was the satisfaction of having someone cared for by someone who looked like you. The American Public Health Association identified racism as a public health issue and described how racism affected public health and health disparities. Racism is the power to control the distribution of money, power and resources, 
and the differential access to goods, services, and opportunities based on race at the global, national, and local level. So for example, when COVID occurred and I'm women inspired. were, thank you, and women were afraid to go into the hospital, a birth, a midwifery led birth center was actually opened in Manhattan, except the problem is, is that COVID rates in Manhattan were the lowest. Where that birth center should have opened would have been in the Bronx or Queens or Brooklyn, where the COVID rates were high. So the, the, the resource was placed in the, in, the, in the area that needed the resource the least, rather than the area that needed the resource the most. Structural racism is the foundation from which social determinants of health and health emanate and accounts for persistent health inequities. You know, we throw these terms around without really understanding what these terms mean. Social determinants of health are the condition in which people are born, grow, work, live, age, and the wider set of forces and systems shaping the conditions of their daily life, which means this happens from the time you are in utero in your mom's belly. Maternal mortality is a direct consequence of social determinants of health more than health behaviors and clinical care. So if a woman didn't go for prenatal care at all, it is, her con it is the condition in which she lives that would impact her outcome more than anything else. Historically, women at risk for a poor pregnancy outcome were characterized as those with no prenatal care, low income, low literacy, engaging in unhealthy behaviors such as tobacco, alcohol, and or illegal drug use, exposed to intimate partner violence, and having mental health challenges. However, as early as 1992, a sentinel a study published in the New England Journal of Medicine demonstrated that being a college-educated, middle-class African-American woman was not protective against poor birth outcomes. And this disparity was reaffirmed in, 19, in 2019. So we've known about this for a long term, for a long time. We just have not put a name to what was the condition that created this disparity for African-American women. And we now know that it is structural and institutional racism. What's important for the committee to understand is that maternal mortality is a process that begins long before a woman becomes pregnant. The vascular changes that contributes to maternal mortality begins in utero, traveling a life course that builds and accumulates with each experience of stress and daily living of being Black, Latinx, or Indigenous. The COVID pandemic only exacerbated these inequities. Strategies to address maternal mortality for Black and Indigenous women require a systems-wide approach to address factors related to access to care and the quality of that care. For example, evidence documents that Black and Latinx women in New York City experienced a higher risk for severe maternal morbidity compared with white women within the same hospital, even after controlling for patient insurance and hospital characteristics. So if I choose a hospital because I think there are more white women in that hospital, so I'll get better care, the answer is no. One strategy to promote access to care is supporting increased racial and ethnic diversity in the maternity health workforce. Delivering care encompasses two elements. I always uh, teach this, taught the students that when I precepted students. The first element centers on the relationship between the provider and the woman. The second element centers on the provider quality. Does the provider possess the most current medical information and technical skill to render high quality evidence-based healthcare? While both elements are critical, the more important of the two is the provider-woman relationship. Women must be motivated to enter and remain in the healthcare system to avail herself of the available medical. It makes absolutely no difference if you have all the technology in the building if the woman won't come in. 
makes no difference. She will not access those wonderful services that you think that she needs. Race concordant care has been associated with strengthened patient provider relationship. Further, a growing body of evidence suggests better outcomes for individuals cared for by race concordant providers. What is the value and significance of race concordant care? Race concordant providers usually reside in the community and possess shared experiences of daily life, language, values, customs, and cultural norms. Individuals report feeling more connected and comfortable, respected and trust, satisfaction and confidence with race concordant providers. As a result, individuals demonstrate increased adherence with appointments and treatment plans and increased retention in the healthcare system. Individuals report negative attitudes from providers from other racial and ethnic groups reflect internalization of broader issues around societal racism. Evidence-based outcome data is lacking about race concordant care provided by Black, Latinx, and Indigenous midwives to Black, Latinx, and Indigenous women. The sparse evidence that does exist, however, documented that 13% of Black women reported that they were treated poorly in hospitals during their last, last childbirth because of race, ethnicity, language, or cultural background. As a result, 23% of Black women reported that they would be willing to consider a home birth for their next pregnancy. That is uh, unbelievable. According to the American College of Nurse Midwives, there are approximately 12,907 certified nurse midwives and 117 certified midwives as of August 2020. Black, Latinx, and Indigenous midwives represent 13% of this number for a national total of 1,660 midwives. That means BIPOC midwives across the entire United States are less than 2,000. What this, and in New York City, in New York State, there are approximately 1,000 licensed midwives, the bulk of whom are in New York City but are not midwives of color. This statistics provide that most Black, Latinx, and Indigenous women, including pregnant and childbearing women, never be cared for by a race-concordant midwife. I was privileged during my 30 years practicing midwifery at Harlem, Harlem Hospital Center to participate in two clinical projects rendering women's health care. One was in Harlem, Hospital's, ha Harlem Hospital, focusing on pregnant drug using women. The second was located outside of Harlem Hospital in a community-based health center that focused on women's health care across the lifespan. However, the unique characteristic of both clinical sites was that they were completely staffed by Black and Latinx providers in all of the disciplines, internal medicine, OBGYN, and pediatrics, and the community was able to see the relationships that occurred between us. So what, what was reinforced was the importance of remaining in the, in, the, in, the, in the health system because that's where they would be cared for and have their health maximized. Both sites experienced high attendance rates with low no-show rates demonstrating high patient satisfaction as a recurring theme. In conclusion, the conventional strategy to address maternal mortality has been to focus on the maternity cycle from preconception care to one year postpartum. That's very short-sighted. The most effective strategy would be to focus on rendering preventive women's health care long before pregnancy. Ideally, women should help the maternity cycle healthy. This results from health promotion and, main and maintenance activities that begins in adolescence and continues throughout the reproductive years. Healthy women have healthy babies. Post-pregnancy women should return to their health promotion and health maintenance providers. Focusing solely on the maternity cycle provides, precludes the opportunity to stabilize and control chronic conditions that are associated with poor outcomes. In the end, however, 
only by intentionally addressing structural and institutional racism, which I said is the distribution of resources, can health equity be achieved and maternal mortality be eliminated. You know, I, I for Mr. McIntyre, as I listened to you, I said, oh my God, you know, Amber should not have died just because she wanted to experience motherhood. That is something that we all look forward to. And we should enjoy our pregnancies, not be fearful of becoming pregnant, which a lot of Black and Latinx women are now. They can't enjoy their pregnancy because they are now internalizing the data that if they're Black and Latinx, they're going to die. So their focus is now on, am I going to die before I can see my baby, before I can experience their first Thanksgiving or their first Christmas? And that should not happen. And I just want to go back to two questions that... Um, Council Member Rosenthal and Rivera asked about which are the institutions that no longer have midwifery services. The answer are, of course, Harlem Hospital. You might recall that earlier this year in January, I testified that Harlem Hospital was the second oldest midwifery service. So Harlem Hospital no longer has a midwifery service. Lincoln Hospital no longer has a midwifery service. There are midwives at Kings County Hospital and Coney Island, but we call them placeholders because if because you're asking the wrong question. If you ask which hospitals don't have midwives, that's the wrong question. Because in these hospitals, there are midwives, but they're not a midwifery service. They're not providing midwifery care. They're not practicing the midwifery model. And Council Member Rosenthal asked about the affiliation contracts and what could the private institutions what, you know, should they be shouldering more of the responsibility? Just to kind of bring you up to date, that affiliation contract ended in 2010. So there are no longer any affiliations between the privates and, and the public institutions. But what is important is that at the state level, the privates get considerable tax benefit without having to shoulder their burden of, of poor, you know, of financially challenged individuals. So on the one hand, they get significant tax breaks that the H&H that &H hospitals don't get, and H&H &H hospitals are then burdened with all the patients that the private don't have to take. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, chairs, I'm gonna go to the final panelists for this panel, and then we will move to questions. Um, the final panelist on this panel is Trisha Shimamura. And I've noticed that some people are raising their hands. So we will ask for anybody that we've missed after this panel. So if you raise your hands, um, we will be doing questions after this panel, but thank you. And I see you raising your hands um, for testimony after this panel. So sorry, the final witness again is Trisha Shimamura. Thank you. Starting time. Hi, everybody. Um, I just wanna say uh, to start, Bruce, um, thank you so much, my, my heart and my family's heart are with you. Um, and I, I just want to thank you so much for your bravery. It's really an honor to add my voice to the incredible chorus of advocates who have spoken today. And I agree so much with everything that has been said. Um, I'm going to be very, very brief. Again, my name is Trisha Shimamura, and I am a proud woman of color. I'm a social worker, a wife, and most importantly, today and every day, I'm a mom. Uh, just 18 months ago, uh, when my son entered the world, he uh, became my entire world. And my path to motherhood was any, anything uh, but easy. Midway through my pregnancy, I was diagnosed with gestational hypertension, which progressed to preeclampsia, a condition which we've spoken a lot about today, but that one that is characterized by high blood pressure and possible damage to one's liver, kidneys, or other organs. For months leading up to my delivery, I spent hours in waiting rooms and hospital beds being monitored for the health of my baby and myself. I was fortunate enough to have the work flexibility to attend these appointments and was supported when I was hospitalized on the three occasions uh, prior to my delivery. When my blood pressure finally uh, continued to rise, my doctors decided that the best course of action was to induce early. It was during my induction that an on-call attending performed an invasive and painful examination. He dismissed my pain and incorrectly diagnosed me. It was only because in that moment, my husband ran out into the hallway and found my actual doctor that my blood pressure was able to be lowered from the dangerously high levels that it was at. 
and I was spared from receiving the wrong drug and the wrong treatment for an incorrect diagnosis. Later, days after giving birth to my son and being sent home, my blood pressure again spiked, as is often the case with preeclampsia. A doctor friend of mine urged me to go to the ER, and when I arrived with systolic blood pressure readings of well over 190, I was told that I was mm -hmm. lucky that I didn't have a stroke while holding my newborn. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, was, I am one of the lucky ones. Uh, along my path towards motherhood, I experienced several lu luxuries that undoubtedly saved me and my child. I had access to a medical professional whom I trusted and who took my insurance. I lived near a hospital and I had a job that supported my health needs and all of the visits that were required. I had the, a support person in my husband who was able to go with me to all of my prenatal appointments and be with me in delivery and who knew when to get help. And finally, I had a friend with a medical background who saved my life after I left the hospital with my baby. There are far too many women that we've heard about today who are not as lucky as I was and the luxuries that I had should not be luxuries at all. They should be part of the basic level of care that we give all mothers and families. We know that increased access to midwives, doulas and support persons I'm increased expired. health outcomes for both mother and baby and studies show all the time that integrating midwives into our healthcare system could significantly reduce maternal and infant death uh, with some studies suggesting by 80% or more. Still more studies are showing that access to doula, doulas lowers rates of maternal and infant health complications, preterm birth, cesarean sections, and other medical interventions. Our mothers deserve better, and it, we need timely data from our hospitals, expanded communication between our hospitals, and universal access to doulas. We need to diversify our maternal health care workers, and we need to stop treating postpartum care as an optional re recovery period, and instead really mandate and expand the support for new mothers through 12 weeks after delivery. And one additional note, um, in my advocacy working with doulas, we've continued to hear heartbreaking stories, not just of doulas being denied access to patients during delivery, but in the prenatal screenings leading up to delivery. There have been too many instances of women who have been alone when they find terrible, heartbreaking news, uh, or when they're forced to make challenging decisions um, by themselves in, in a prenatal visit. So taking every safety precaution into, into consideration, I am particularly supportive of increasing access to doulas and support persons at every stage of pregnancy, uh, including the prenatal screenings. Uh, for the health and baby, uh, health of mother and baby. Uh, so I urge the city council to pass intro 217, intro to uh, 2042, reso 1239 and reso 1408. Uh, and I continue, I urge you also uh, to continue the fight for our mothers and families. Thank you so much. Ms. Mamara, thank you so much for your testimony uh, for the record. Uh, other people on this panel are applauding you. Um, uh, you have been a terrific advocate and, and since the birth of your son, you have mobilized and uh, created a community of activists around you, um, particularly as it comes, as it relates to the next city council. And I really appreciate you for that making sure that a year from now, those who walk in the door keep their eyes on the prize with this issue. It's incredibly important. And I wanna thank you for that. Thank you so much, Councilmember Rosenthal and Councilmember Rivera and Councilmember Levine for uh, holding today's panel. It's so incredibly important. And I, I swear to you that I'm going to ensure that whoever is in our next city council Prior prioritizes this issue. Thank you. Um, we don't have any council members with raised hands, but if there are questions for this panel, um, we'll go to the chairs first, Chair Rosenthal, Chair Rivera, and Chair Levine. Yeah, I just, I noticed a few people were raising their hands uh, during it and just, um, um, Eugenia, I, I saw you raise your hand a couple of times. So if you could start, and if there are other of these panelists that wanted to add something, please feel free to do so. 
Excellent. And Chair Rosenthal will also go um, after this. There, there will be additional panelists that we've missed or that have come back online. So we'll have additional witnesses after this panel. Okay. And I see Ms. Bolds putting up her hand. Yep. If we could please unmute Eugenia Mina uh, Sinosa. Excuse my pronunciation. Thank you. You are unmuted. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Thank you for um, allowing me to add a, a few things that I've been thinking about um, how to improve maternal care. Uh, one of the things is um, we are, I would love to be all the hospitals in the city offer um, midwifery care. And of course, we're not going to have enough midwives. What we should do is also we have to maybe, I don't know if you can help us how to um, push for more for midwifery school, that they can have more midwives, but we want midwives of color. And that is what we want. All this, the, the schools that we have in, especially those private schools, they are all white um, midwives. Columbia and NYU is practically white midwives. So we, we want to do increase the number of color midwives. Every kind of that reflects of community. We have a lot of, we have even in my hospital, I have a lot of Arabic patients and they should, we should have that too. We should have every kind and that of midwives that they will reflect the community that we serve. And that is one of the things I would like to add and if you can recommend us. And also one of the things that we have a problem is about a clinical sites. A clinical site means when you become a midwife, you need to go and learn, apprentice, hands-on. And we don't have that. Uh, the School of Medicine, they do have a residency program and they pay for that. And that is a midwifery should have. You have a, like a kind of a residency program for midwife training so they can go and they can get you know, the places where they go, they can be paid for that. And that will be an incentive for the hospitals who offer that to get that. So that is another thing. And another recommendation is that all the community, we should not only have birthing center, we should have community centers that it will reflect and work in that community. Not everybody is gonna be for a birthing center, but we would like to have a community center with midwives, with doulas, and they can choose where they're gonna go to have a baby, either the birth center, the hospital, but we should offer a better care outside the hospital. Another, another issue that I, I would like to address is that the postpartum care should be covered by a visit, by a midwife or the one who delivered. We, we should have that, a community midwife that once a mom had a baby should have a postpartum care in their home because being a mom is very hard. And if we can go like that, we can check in their place how they are doing, what is happening, we have a support or not. So that way we can help and that way. So I think we Hello, should do that. We submit Sorry, about that. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. So that it will be a, a, a one of the other good things that we should have. Another thing that I think we should, a lot of people are not aware about that. Even if we want to work on, as a midwife, I'm going to give you my point of view as a midwife. If I want to work in a community and I want to put my place as a midwife and I want to give the best care I can do to a community that I wanted, I can't do it because that malpractice insurance is super expensive and I cannot pay for that. So that also we have to be thinking about it, even though we want it, but the malpractice insurance is, is just uh, prohibited. I, we cannot do it. So that is why many midwives, they're not working in, in communities on their own, even if they want, because we can't afford that. So that, that is that, and, and um, another, another thing that is that we should get paid, equal pay for equal job, equity and pay. And that is one of the things that we have to have that. You know, we are women, we work and we care for women, and that is what we should do. 
And really, truly, frankly, people don't realize it how important it is when you are pregnant only. Before that, nobody knows that. Once you become pregnant, you are aware of all the things that you had no idea. I said to my clients, you, you, when you go to a restaurant, you look before and you check what is the rating. We don't have a ratings about that. We don't have any ratings about what is the obstetrical care you're gonna have. There is nothing of that. We should have a availability of that. If you, you go and choose a restaurant and say, okay, let me see the rating. And that's where you go. But when it's something super important, that is the life of your baby, you are lost. There is no rating, there is nothing where to go. So all no, those things no. we should teach, we should put in there, it should be transparent, it, it, the Department of Health should put that. And those are the things that I recommend. And if we can just come up with something, some kind of bills that we have to fix that. This is the care of you, our future of our women at a new generation. And we have to already be mindful about these things. But one other thing is, you know, as a midwife, we are really weird into the whole environmental and um, care. And we are actually, our care is towards environmental. We are less invasive. We use less things that will be against environment. So it's, it's just on and on, it's a win-win, and that is what we should be doing. We were, we're winning uh, as a woman, we're winning as a new generation, and uh, we're winning as a, you know, the environmental crisis is coming, and that it should be part of that. Thank I really you. wanna thank you for all these suggestions. You know, you reminded me, a friend had once suggested to me that we should put the, for each hospital, there should be a billboard up, uh, just a, giant billboard, those ones that you see when you're driving on the highway that, that reports for that hospital, what is the maternal mortality rate? Um, so thank you for that. And um, thank you. And Chair Rosenthal, I think Chair Rivera um, might have a statement. Chair Rivera? We, we might come back to her. Apologies for jumping in. No, that's fine. And I think uh, while we wait, um, Ms. Bolts, I think, wanted to make a comment. Can we go back to past panelists? Is that all right? Yeah, Thank I'd you so much, Chair Rosenthal. Um, I just want to say that we have to be very mindful of the environment that we're in. Here in New York City, uh, the hospitals and the medical physicians have really uh, have a very strong toehold when it comes to uh, midwifery. Um, it is almost a bad word to say. And 30 years ago, uh, I gave birth utilizing a, a midwife because my insurance was downgraded to PCAP. And as a, as a punishment from leaving private medical insurance, going to PCAP, they assigned me a midwife. Well, that was the best thing that they could have done. Uh, Paula Duran delivered my son up at the Allen Pavilion, and I had uh, the best traumatic birth experience that a Black woman could ever get, even though, you know, it was, it was harsh, but it was still something there. Um, I want to also address something really quickly with Nilu uh, Shiritu, Shiriti said. Nilu and I have worked on several committees, and then Nilu ghosted, and I was always wondering what happened. So it's always good to see you back here, Nilu. But I do want to talk about the fact that we cannot separate doulas from midwives. Um, doulas are there when sometimes a midwife can't be there. And for the number of times that I have gone to that prenatal visit, and that postpartum visit, and my intuition inv invoked a conversation to my client to say, something doesn't look right. I would like for you to call your clinical staff support person, and I'd like you to talk it out. It is because the doula was there that we were able to support the midwife or that OB. So we cannot say that doulas don't do this and doulas don't do that. Yes, we do have a scope of practice, we do have boundaries, yes, that we are to adhere to, but as a doula, I'm here to tell you, I am in 100% support of supporting midwives, and I will never try to exchange or replace one for the other. 
this community should not have to say either or when it comes to a doula or a midwife. They both work together and they work together well, and I'd like to see that continue to grow. So that is a very important factor that we have to keep in place. We're not here to play politics, we're not here to substitute, and we're not here to drink the westernized medicine of Kool-Aid, okay? I'm a black person, I'm a woman of color, and I am not going to embrace this system because this system is not working. And Nilu, I suggest you can reconsider your statements as well, but thank you. You know what's so interesting? I was looking um, during some of this, and you know, the United States ranks forty uh, sixth in the world, um, and the rate that's listed by the CDC, which is back to the data is from two thousand fifteen, um, uh, so rank of forty six, with the, our number being fourteen. Uh, deaths for every 100,000. But the same year for Black women, it was uh, 41 deaths per 100,000. So if you can imagine, the average was 14. Uh, and that ranks us, ranked us 46th. But for Black women, so many more preventable deaths. Um, and it speaks to the power of this hearing and, and all the testimony um, that's given today and how incredibly helpful it is. Um, yeah, I'm gonna, sorry, I just had to get that off my chest. Did someone else wanna, any of the panelists, feel free to speak? Um, the next, so Patricia Lofman um, had her hand up. If we Great. could, uh, and then we do have um, at least one other witness after this panel. Right, well. we should hear from Nelu, and I think Annette had her hand up as well. Okay. Ms. Lofman? Yeah, I just wanted to um, sp speak of two things on doulas. Um, I think for Nelu to recognize that. Years ago, at the turn of the century, when all women were giving birth at home, they were surrounded by all the women in their family, their moms, their aunties, their grandma, their sisters, friends. And the role they provided was the supportive one. Because as we know, labor and birth is a very, very process. And so to make certain that women were never left alone, we had all the women in the family surrounding them. Well, now the families are not together in terms of proximity, doulas have really taken that role, that role that their aunties and moms took in terms of providing physical and emotional support. So it's really important that we understand the role that doulas play now. They, are, they have replaced our moms and our aunties and our sisters and our grandmothers and our friends. And so they are just as important to the process in terms of advocacy as the midwife is in terms of rendering direct patient care. The other thing that I wanted to talk about is the role that the chairs of OBGYN departments play in terms of the ability of midwifery service, services to exist and thrive. Because the power for a midwifery service to thrive sits, rests with the individual who sits in, the, in that role, who is the chair of the department. When you look at the data where midwives are well integrated, those hospitals are the ones that have the best data in terms of outcomes. But those are also the services where the OBGYN chair truly believes in midwives and midwifery services and have embraced and allowed midwifery, midwives and services to not just survive, but to thrive as part of the department, as colleagues. And so where you don't have midwifery services or where you have midwives who are present but are not providing continuous care, who are not doing births, those will be the institutions where you will not see outcomes that are as good as they could be. I so appreciate you bringing that up um, because we're just repeating what we all said to the Greater New York Hospital Association. It can't just be an agenda item we want to see that your your heads of hospitals are 
you know, leading by example. So thank you for bringing that up again. I appreciate that. I mean, you were talking about heads of departments, but they report to but the president. You're asked. absolutely correct. It is also the, the institution, because I can remember, um, you know, Harlem Hospital was the first um, baby-friendly hospital in New York. But I, when I took that information to the executive director of the hospital, he, champ he embraced it, he championed it, and it became a pro it became it, it went into effect. So it's both the chair, but it is also the executive director of the hospital, whether they see midwifery services as valuable and an integral part of the institution. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> chair Rosenthal, is, um, should we move to the next panel and then come back to comments? Or um, the next panelist, or move to other questions. I think you're gently guiding me uh, to an answer there. There's one more panelist, and then we'll come back if anyone from this panel wants to chime in. Okay. That's Thank okay. So we'll that's later to the two people who have their hands raised. We see you. Apologies. Um, Thank you so much. Yeah. And so we, um, there are some people that have been here and come back that we've skipped over on panels um, that have logged out and logged back in due to conflicts um, and parents and things. So um, that's other council member offices have asked that we um, also make sure that they're heard today before they have to leave again. So we'll move to do a check for other um, panelists now and anybody that missed, we miss and then we can come back. Um, also, just as a reminder, the sergeant said it at the top of the hearing, but um, the deadline for written testimony, which can be as long as you would like, is 72 hours after the hearing. And so you can send that to us and we'll help make sure it's in the right place, but you should email it to testimony at council.nyc.gov. Again, written testimony, um, testimony for the record can be as long as you would like. You can also amend what you have if there's additional information you would like to add due to the hearing and it should be submitted to testimony at council.myc.gov. So we'll do a check now um, for the panelists and then uh, Nilu Shuti, I saw your hand raised. We'll come back after the next testimony. Um, there was another panelist that had her hand raised to go next after the, the request for that. Um, and please use the raise hand function in Zoom. So sorry, with this, uh, we will, we've heard from everyone that has signed up to testify that was on panels. So again, we'll come back for additional comments, but if we inadvertently missed anyone that would like to testify, please use the raise hand function in Zoom. Um, excellent. And I'll call on you in the order of hands raised. So Thamar Innocent, um, you will be next. We'll call on you next. Um, so as with previous panels, um, you may begin your testimony when the sergeant calls the clock. The next witness is Thamar Innocent. Thank you. Starting time. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I am a birth worker. I have been a birth worker for a couple of years now. Um, but I also want to speak in the capacity of, um, I used to work in a New York City hospital, so I got to see hands-on in, in an administrative capacity. So I got to see hands-on what was going on um, for, you know, potential clients that I would have had in the future. Um, so what I'm, what I'm noticing is that when I first started, when I became a doula and I trained as a doula and I trained with Ancient Song, there was this piece that I didn't know about. Um, that I had, I inadvertently became an advocate when I just wanted to, you know, care for families and love on families and be there for them. But inadvertently, I became this birth justice warrior. I became someone that was fighting, that was protecting women in hospitals. And although that is beautiful on itself, that is something that we're focusing on a lot more. I would love to focus on childbirth education, but my prenatal appointments have turned into, let me teach you how to navigate the healthcare system. Let me teach you the right words to say so that they don't try to take your baby away. Let me, you know, uh, fight for you. Um, instead of, let me hold your back. Let me help you with the baby. Let me help you breastfeed. A lot of these things have been pushed to the side for me or put on the back burner to be done at a later time because I'm so busy fighting for this woman's rights. 
in the hospitals, I believe there, there's a lack of cultural competency. There's a lack of bedside manner. There's, um, there's a need for healthcare uh, professionals and staff, the need to want to intervene when it's unnecessary medically. There's, um, they are continuously disrupting the pregnant person's um, ability to have a normal physiological birth. And they do that so much so that the pregnant person cannot, doesn't feel safe anymore. And it is my job on top of my doula job to help them to feel safe, to feel comfortable enough to wanna give birth. Um, so again, I feel there's a big lack of education in terms of the hospitals and the staff, but also the pregnant person. A lot of times there's no money put into education to help women with um, advocacy, co understanding com common hospital practices, understanding childbirth education and their bodies and women's health. Um, I would like to see money go towards helping women prenatally or way before they're even thinking about having a baby. And that takes me to family planning. Family planning for me when I gave birth 10 years ago was what contraception do you want? And that was it. There was nothing about understanding my body. There was nothing about advocacy. There was nothing else about Time anything. So I want us to focus more on educating um, people from way before they enter the hospital. Um, yes. That's all I have for today. Thank you so much. Are there any uh, Chair Rosenthal or chairs, are there any council member questions? I just want to say, Miss Innocent, when you said you inadvertently became a woman warrior, is that what you said? Yes. Yes. I will say, I understand the larger point you're making, which is so very powerful. But all I could think of when you said that is how um, at Ancient Song, a lot of the sessions begin by giving this deep throated scream and that's how sort of everyone in the room becomes a woman warrior right uh, boy absolutely. do i that. absolutely and i've been doing it ever since and it doesn't look like it's going to end so that's something that we have to do and be mindful of for a long time to come you're doing it all so thank you for that yeah i have no further questions um just thanking everyone. Okay, thank you so much. Um, if there are any other witnesses, if you can please use the raise hand function in Zoom. Okay, and Nilu Shruti also had her hand up. If we can return, Chair, is that okay to return to Ms. Shruti? Excellent. Hi, all. I just wanted to clarify because I think that maybe some of my comments were misunderstood. Um, I was not at all saying that doulas were not important. Um, I just wanted to point out that within these four resolutions that expanding access to midwives has not happened. So I would encourage for access to midwives to be as important and included as, uh, as doulas are. Um, so that would, that's my first point. Um, so I wanted to make sure that I am clear in, that I'm not put, pitting doulas and, and midwives against each other by any means. I think that they, it, they are both incredibly important solutions to this problem. Um, and we do need focus on both. Um, the second point that I wanted to talk about was regarding the bill and the data. I am aware, of course, of the uh, Information Act and that data is available. This bill specifically relates to incorporating information about midwives on the DOH um, MH uh, website, um, which is great because it includes like a lot of information about 311 and a lot of great. And so I think including those same statistics within the access to midwives is, imp is important so that people understand why midwives are being listed on this rather public website. So I just wanted to clarify those two points. Thank you. Thank you. And, um, you know, it's interesting. I appreciate your bringing that up, both points really, but on the first one, I, I, let me tell you why I'm just sensitive to it because after the hearing that I co-chaired in 2018, 
um, we passed two pieces of legislation regarding doulas, increasing access and talking about doulas and also the M3RC. And similarly, uh, quite a few midwives reached out to me and said, You're, you need to be talking more about midwives. So, you know, noting the, the powerfulness of both professions. Um, I really appreciate you for that. Thank you. And thanks for clarifying. Yeah, of course. I turn it back to the moderator. Thank you so much, Chair Rosenthal. Uh, Ms. Patricia Lofman also has her hand up. Um, and just a, just a comment, so we're unmuting now, um, but if you have other comments and testimony, uh, if you can please add it to your written testimony, and again, you can amend it and just submit it to, it'll be part of the record, but if you'd like to add it to your written testimony, you can send that to testimony at council.myc.gov um, up to 72 hours after the hearing. Thank you so much. I know that I mentioned the maternity information law that comes out of the state of New York, that really provides a wealth of information about what happens in an institution. So for example, let me just read a couple of the data that's included in this. The percentage of births that are C-sections, the per percentage of primary C-sections, the percentage of repeat C-sections, um, whether there's continuous monitoring in labor, um, how many, you know, whether there is rooming in, whether how, what is the percentage of infants that are breastfed, um, whether you get an episiotomy. In other words, this provides uh, uh, in information that families could use to determine where they would want to give birth so that they could get the best outcome. And this really is a report card on all of the hospitals in New York. And this is it. Now, where does this information come from? According to the state, the hospitals are supposed to provide this information to the state the state then generates this, it populates this information, and this information is then available to the public by hospitals. So again, this data, in, this information exists. I don't think it's been updated for years because nobody knows the follow-up and, in, and insists that hospitals provide this information to the state and that the state fulfills their obligation to populate and generate this information. This would be invaluable if it were released tomorrow. And this is something that we could certainly work on today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, if there are any other panelists or questions, or if chairs have any other questions, we'll do one last call. If we inadvertently missed anyone that would like to testify, please use the raise hand function in Zoom and we'll call on you. Okay. Chairs Rosenthal, Rivera, and Levine. If there are no other questions and we do not see any hands raised, this, oh, Nankululego uh, Tiehembe has her hand raised, not in the Zoom function, but she's waving if it's okay to unmute her. Absolutely. Thank you. And then that'll be, then we'll wrap it up from there. You okay, should be can I speak now? Yeah, you should be unmuted. We can hear you. Thank you so much. Oh, good. Okay. I just want to make a comment in reference to the uh, freestanding birth centers. Uh, back in the 19, maybe 1993, our organization uh, did a research analysis about how to start a birth center here in Harlem. Uh, we uh, um, researched and learned that the guidelines for birth centers are, is almost prohibited. The application process alone deemed that they had to have a cottage industry to help a uh, group even to start an organization. Besides the enormous amount of money that it took to get that started. So I'm hoping that at this point in time, almost what, uh, 30 years, almost 25 years later, that this would not be the case for any uh, midwifery-led birth centers. 
The other thing I do want to say, though, is I did a birth um, in April, a home birth in April with an insurance company, and I have yet not received mm. received uh, any reimbursement for that. It has, it's almost like it's a nightmare of codes and uncodes in network, out network. It, it's unbelievable in terms of of, of how women and how midwives are, are or not reimbursed. Uh, finally, they said to the family that they would, they would see me as an in-network provider, but I would be paid out-of-network services, which amounted to $2,400. Mm -hmm. uh, it's atrocious. So I hope that something, and I'm so glad to hear all the views that I, and I've learned, I've learned so much. So I thank all the birth workers and, and, and advocates and activists. And thank you so much to the chairs. This is such an important, important step forward. So I've been invigorated mm -hmm. and I, <laughs> thank you so much again. Good. What a great way to end it. It's true, it's a great group looking around this Zoom. Uh, pretty impressive group oh. of uh, people. Um, and I, you know, uh, actually I too was about uh, 20 years ago, part of a group of people trying to open a birth center. We had property given to us um, we had, uh, you know, everything lined up except for state approval. And so story after story after story, it's so disheartening. We have to change this now. I'll pass it back to the moderator, I think. Okay, thank you so much, Chair Rosenthal. Um, we're just doing uh, one more check for raised hands. Hi, I've been unmuted um, and it might have been from a hand raise 20 minutes ago, <laughs> but I just wanted to echo um, that nothing um, is separate from each other in the uplifting of um, midwifery and doulas, in the uplifting of um, hospital systems and um, midwifery led birth centers, physician led birth centers, home births, like we want access to all of these things. We want our birthing people to be cared for and we're all in different lanes. Some of our work overlaps with other people, organizations and, you know, just kind of coming from that place of um, unity and coming from that place of just that frame of mind of like, the inspiration that we get from one another who are doing this work. And when I also look around this room and I think of the interactions I've had with different individuals, as well as the people's names I've heard of, as well as the history lessons offered and just like, you know, wanting to, to really, um, um, challenge us to like um, put uh, down any uh, uh, of our own biases about you know how we can sometimes feel like there's some competition between like hospital and home and midwife led physician led all of those things need to get shut down because ultimately like we we want what's best for the birthing people of New York and so um, just thank you for the opportunity uh, to again chime in uh, that thought. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. Um, we are just dealing with a technical issue, um, but we will be ending the hearing. If there are no other witnesses, this would conclude public testimony. Um, I'm just checking one, one second, please. Please stand by. Okay, and then one other comment by Patricia Lofman, please. If we can unmute her, thank you. Thank you. Um, to chair, to Chairperson Rivera and Rosenthal, I don't know how to thank you for remaining constant on this call since 10 a.m. this morning. Um, you both sat there and listened to all of us. 
And I can't tell you how inspiring that is to know that our public servants listen to us. And regardless of how long this uh, meeting has taken place, you just have remained steadfast and listened to everyone. And that's important. And we just thank you. We are appreciate, we're appreciative and um, just thank you. Thank you. It's very kind. You have a lot to say. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Chair, and thank you to our panelists. So, Chairs Rosenthal, Rivera, and Levine, uh, this concludes public testimony for this hearing. We have no other witnesses that have raised their hands, so I will return to Chair Rosenthal for closing remarks. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Um, what have we heard today? Big picture. It's time to dismantle the current perinatal care system in New York City. Right now, COVID has made this glaringly clear and implement the model that we've really all been talking about. Um, and it's a model that other developed nations use. It's why their rates of maternal mortality are far lower than those in New York City. And it has I think four components. We have to in, integrate midwifery services. Every birth should be attended by a midwife and an OBGYN involved when needed. We have to increase access to out of hospital births. It is shameful that there are only two birthing centers in New York because it's estimated that at least 70% of births could occur outside of the hospital at birthing centers and home births. We have to third establish a pipeline for black um, and uh, others, people of color as midwives uh, to attend midwifery school. Um, and of course, there should be a similar pipeline uh, for doulas. There are excellent doula training centers and um, we need to increase access to those for people of color. And lastly, we have to make doulas available to all birthing people who want one. Um, we of course have to assure appropriate reimbursement, whether it be through Medicaid reimbursement rates, uh, which require advocacy at the state level or through uh, payment from a hospital that wants to ensure good birth outcomes for the patients that they see. So one more time, I really wanna thank all the advocates that have shared their lived experience today. Thank you for your expertise. As the chair of the Committee on Women and Gender Equity, I want to especially thank those of you that have articulated the connection to birth control, domestic violence, equal pay for equal jobs, and the reverberating impacts on mental health from things like lack of skin to skin contact immediately following birth. Thank you. Uh, I'll now turn it to uh, Chair Rivera. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, I've worked with many of you over the years um, but I continue to learn so much and I will continue to look to your guidance and, and your experiences. Um, as a chair of the Committee on Hospitals, I've really tried my best to use this committee to address the root causes of maternal mortality and morbidity in, in black and brown patients specifically. In three years, I've held several hearings on maternal mortality and prenatal care and implicit bias. We even held a hearing that would eventually overturn the arbitrary drug testing on pregnant mothers, disproportionately testing black and brown mothers, assuming drug use. All of that 
All of that to say, we have a very, very long way to go. And I thank you for staying in this movement and in this fight when it is so physically, mentally, spiritually draining. Um, thank you to all that have been with me since 9 a.m. this morning when we rallied almost 100 individuals. And of course, to uh, Chairwoman Rosenthal um, for being here and, and, and for being so engaged. So thank you all. I look forward to working with you. And um, I do hope that this was a productive space and we do expect solutions and answers and transparency, most of all. Thank you so much. Thank you. Chair Levine, would you like to give some closing remarks? I think he needs to be unmuted. Thank you so much, Chair Rosenthal and Chair Rivera for your outstanding leadership, years of leadership on this and for convening this hearing today, which has been simultaneously gut-wrenching, but also uplifting. Obviously wrenching to hear the firsthand accounts of loss. And um, I'm just so grateful to you, Mr. McIntyre, for the bravery to speak out on behalf of, of this cause. I know that's not easy, but it's impactful. But also just uplifting to hear from so many of you who have devoted your lives to this work. Uh, midwives, doulas, nurses, physicians. Um, and I feel that our role is to lift you up, to amplify your voices, to amplify the voices of black women in particular who are on the front lines of this fight. Uh, and as allies, uh, myself as chair of the health committee, um, I want you to know that I support you a thousand percent and that um, I will stand with you as we make something very clear. This problem is solvable. It's a question of resources. It's a question of transparency and reporting. Ultimately, this is a question of will. We can solve this if we have the will to do it. And the movement that is pushing to make this happen is absolutely inspiring. And I will stand with you and in support of you as long as it takes until we end these egregious disparities in New York City. Uh, and I thank you all for your leadership. And again, I thank Chairs Rosenthal and Rivera for incredible work today and beyond. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Chair Levine. This hearing is now closed. Thanks everyone.